This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Legends of the Old Plantation Chapter 1 Uncle Remus Initiates the Little Boy One evening recently, the lady whom Uncle Remus calls Miss Sally, Mr. Little Seven-Year-Old, making search for him through the house and through the yard, she heard the sound of voices in the old man's cabin, and, looking through the window, saw the child sitting by Uncle Remus. His head rested against the old man's arm, and he was gazing with an expression of the most intense interest into the rough, weather-beaten face that beamed so kindly upon him. This is what Miss Sally heard. By and by, one day, after Br'er Fox been doin' all that he could for to catch Br'er Rabbit, and Br'er Rabbit bein' doin' all he could for to keep him from it, Br'er Fox say to himself dat he'd put up a game on Br'er Rabbit, and he ain't more'n got the words out of his mouth to Br'er Rabbit come a-lopin' up the big road, lookin' just as plump and as fat and as sassy as a moggin hoss in a barley patch. "'Hold on dar, Br'er Rabbit,' says Br'er Fox, says he. "'Hi ain't got time, Br'er Fox,' says Br'er Rabbit, says he, sort of mendin' his licks. "'I want to have some confab with you, Br'er Rabbit,' says Br'er Fox, says he. "'All right, Br'er Fox, but you better holler from where you stand. I'm monstrous full of fleas dis morning,' says Br'er Rabbit, says he. "'I seed Br'er Bar yesterday,' said Br'er Fox, says he, "'and he sort of rake me over de coals, "'cause you and me ain't make friends and live neighborly, "'and I told him that I'd see you.' "'Den Br'er Rabbit, scratch one year with off hind foot, sort of jubously. "'And then he ups and says, says he, "'All a settin', Br'er Fox,' Supposin' you drop round tomorrow and take dinner with me. We ain't got no great doin's at our house, but I spec the old woman and de chillins can sort of scramble round and get up something for to stay your stomach. I'm agreeable, Br'er Rabbit, says Br'er Fox, says he. Then I'll depend on you, says Br'er Rabbit, says he. Next day, Mr. Rabbit and Miss Rabbit got up soon for the day and raided on a garden like Miss Sally's out dar, and got some cabbages and some roastin' ears and some sparer grass, and they fix up a smashin' dinner. By and by, one of the little rabbits, playin' out in de backyard, come runnin' and hollerin', Oh, ma! Oh, ma! I seed Mr. Fox a-comin'! And then Br'er Rabbit, he took the chillin's by the ears and made em set down. And did him and Miss Rabbit sort of dally round waitin' for Br'er Fox, and to keep on waitin' for Br'er Fox, and to keep on waitin', but no Br'er Fox ain't come. After a while, Br'er Rabbit goes to the door easy like and peep out, and dar, stickin' from behind the corner, was the tippin' Br'er Fox's tail. Then. Br'er Rabbit shot the door and sot down and put his paws behind his ears and begin fur to sing. The place whereabouts you spill the grease, right there you're bound to slide, and where you find a bunch of hair, you surely find to hide. <laughs> Next day, Br'er Fox set word by Mr. Mink and skews himself cause he was too sick fur to come and he axed brer rabbit fur to come and take dinner with him and brer rabbit says he was greeable by and by when de shadders was at the shortest brer rabbit he sort of brush up and saunter down to brer fox's house and when he got dar he hears somebody groanin 
and he look in de door, and dar he see Brer Fox sittin' up in a rockin' cheer, all wrop up wid flannel, and he look mighty weak. Brer Rabbit look all round, he did, but he ain't seen no dinner. De dishpan was sittin' on de table, and close by was a carvin' knife. "'Look like you gwine to have chicken for dinner, Brer Fox,' says Brer Rabbit, says he. "'Oh, yes, Brer Rabbit, they are nice, and fresh, and tender,' says Brer Fox, says he. Then Brer Rabbit sort of pull his mustache, and he says, "'You ain't got no calamus root, is you, Brer Fox? I done got so now that I can't eat no chicken sap, and she's seasoned up with calamus root.' And wid dat, Brer Rabbit lipped out de door and dodged mong de bushes, and sot dar watchin' for Brer Fox. And he ain't watched long neither, cause Brer Fox flung off the flannel and crope out at the house and got where he could close in on Brer Rabbit. And by and by, Brer Rabbit holler out, "Oh, Brer Fox, I just put your calamus root out here on the dish your stump." Better come get it while it's fresh. And with that, Brer Rabbit gallop off home. And Brer Fox ain't never caught him yet. And what's more, honey, he ain't gwanter. End of chapter one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Chapter 2 The Wonderful Tar Baby Story. Didn't the fox never catch the rabbit, Uncle Remus? asked the little boy the next evening. He come mighty nigh it, honey. Shows you born. Brer Fox did. One day, out of Brer Rabbit fooled him with that calamus root, Brer Fox went to work and got him some tar, and mix it with some turkentime. He fix up a contraption what he call a tar baby, and he took this year tar baby, and he sought her in the big road. And then he lay off in the bushes for to see what the news was going to be. And he didn't have to wait long, neither. Cause by and by, here comes Brer Rabbit basin down the road. Lippity clippity, clippity lippity. Just as sassy as a jaybird. Brer Fox, he lay low. Brer Rabbit come prancing long twill he spied a tar baby. And then he fotch up on his behind legs like he was astonished. The tar baby, she sought dar, she did. And Brer Fox, he lay low. Mornin', says Brer Rabbit, says he. Nice weather dis mornin', says he. Tar baby, she ain't saying nothin'. Brer Fox, he lay low. How does your symptoms seem to segishwate, says Brer Rabbit, says he. Brer Fox, he wink his eyes slow and lay low, and the tar baby, she ain't saying nothing. How you come on, then? Is you deaf? says Brer Rabbit, says he. Cause if you is, I can holler louder, says he. Tar baby, stay still, and Brer Fox, he lay low. You're stuck up, that's what you is says Brer Rabbit, says he. And I'm going to cure you, that's what I'm going to do, says he. Brer Fox, he sort of chuckle in his stomach, he did. But Tar Baby ain't saying nothing. I'm going to learn you to talk to spectable folks if it's the last act, says Brer Rabbit, says he. If you don't take off that hat and tell me howdy, I'm going to bust you wide open, says he. Tar Baby stay still, and Brer Fox, he lay low. Brer Rabbit kept on axing him, and the Tar Baby, 
she keep on saying nothing. Twill presently, Brer Rabbit draw back with his fists, he did, and blip, he took her side of the head. Right there's where he broke his molasses jug. His fist stuck, and he can't pull loose. De tar hilt him, but tar baby, she stay still, and Brer Fox, he lay low. If and you don't let me loose, I'll knock you again, says Brer Rabbit, says he. And with dat, he fotch her a wipe with the other hand, and dat one stuck. Tar baby, she still ain't saying nothing. And Brer Fox, he lay low. Turn me loose, for I kick the natural stuffin' out of you, says Brer Rabbit, says he. But the tar baby, she ain't saying nothing. She just hilled on, and de Brer Rabbit lose the use of his feet in de same way. Brer Fox, he lay low. Then Brer Rabbit squall out dat if de tar baby don't turn him loose, he'd butt her crank-sided. And then he butted, and his head got stuck. Then Brer Fox, he sauntered forth. Looking just as innocent as one of your mammy's mockingbirds. Howdy, Brer Rabbit, says Brer Fox, says he. You look sort of stuck up this morning, <laughs> says he. And then he rolled on the ground and laughed and laughed till he couldn't laugh no more. I spect you'll take dinner with me this time, Brer Rabbit. I done laid in some calamus root, and I ain't gwine to take no excuse, says Brer Fox, says he. Here Uncle Remus paused, and drew a two-pound yam out of the ashes. Did the fox eat the rabbit? asked the little boy to whom the story had been told. Oh, that's all the fur the tale goes replied the old man. He might, and then he mightn't. Some say Judge Barr come long and loosed em. Some say he didn't. I hear Miss Sally callin'. You better run long. End of chapter. This year's a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Chapter 3 Why Mr. Possum Loves Peace One night, said Uncle Remus, taking Miss Sally's little boy on his knee, and stroking the child's hair thoughtfully and caressingly. One night, Br'er Possum called by for Br'er Coon, cordin' to her agreement, and after gobbling up a dish of fried greens and smoking a cigar, they rambled forth for to see how the balance of the settlement was getting long. Br'er Coon, he was one of these natural pacers, and he racked long same as Mars John's bay pony, and Br'er Possum, he went in a hand gallop, and they got over a heap of ground. Br'er Possum, he got his belly full of persimmons, and Br'er Coon, he scoop up a abundance of frogs and tadpoles. They amble long, they did, des as sociable as a basket or kittens. Twill by and by. To hear Mr. Dog talking to himself way off in the woods. "'Sposin' he runs up on us, Br'er Possum, what are you gwine do?' says Br'er Coon, says he. Br'er Possum sort of laugh round the corners of his mouth. "'Oh, if he come, Br'er Coon, I'm a-goin' to stand by you,' says Br'er Possum. "'What are you gwine to do?' says he. "'Who, me?' says Br'er Coon. "'If he run under me, I'll lay a, I'll go give him one twist, says he. Did the dog come? asked the little boy. Go away, honey, responded the old man in an impressive tone. Go away. Mr. Dog, he come and he come a zoomin', and he ain't wait for to say howdy, neither. 
he just sail into de two of em. The very first pass he make, Brer Possum fetch a grin from year to year, and keel over like he was dead. Den Mr. Dog, he sail into Brer Coon, and right dar's where he drop his money purse, cause Brer Coon was cut out for dat kind of business, and he fairly wipe up the face of the earth with him. You better believe that when Mr. Dog got a chance to make himself scarce, he took it, and what there was left of him went skedaddling through these woods like it was shot out of a musket. And Brer Coon, he sort of lick his clothes into shape and wipe off, and Brer Possum, he lay dar like he was dead, twill by and by he raise up sort of keerful like and when he find the coast clear, he scramble up and scamper off like something was after him. Here Uncle Remus paused long enough to pick up a live coal of fire in his fingers, transfer it to the palm of his hand, and thence to his clay pipe, which he had been filling, a proceeding that was viewed by the little boy with undisguised admiration. The old man then proceeded. Next time Brer Possum met Brer Coon, Brer Coon fused to spawn after his howdy, and this make Brer Possum feel mighty bad, seeing as how they used to make so many excursions together. "'What make you hold your head so high, Brer Coon?' says Brer Possum, says he. "'I ain't running with cowards these days,' says Brer Coon. "'When I wants you, I'll send for you,' says he. "'Then Brer Possum get mighty mad. "'Who's any coward?' says he. "'You is,' says Brer Coon. "'That's who. "'I ain't sociatin' with dem what's lays down on the ground "'and plays dead when there's a free fight goin' on,' says he. "'Then Brer Possum grin and laugh fit to kill hisself. "'Lord, Brer Coon!' "'You don't speck I done that cause I was feared, does you?' says he. "'Why, I want no more feared than you is this minute. "'What was they for to be scared on?' says he. "'I knowed you'd get away with Mr. Dog if an I didn't, "'and I'd just lay there watching you shake him, "'waitin' fur to put in when the time come,' says he. "'Brer Coon turn up his nose.' "'That's a mighty fine tale,' says he, "'when Mr. Dog ain't moan tetch you for you keel over and lay there stiff,' says he. "'That's just what I was gwine to tell you about,' says Brer Possum, says he. "'I want no more scared than you is right now, "'and I was fixin' fur to give Mr. Dog a sample er my jaw,' says he. "'But I'm de most ticklish chap what you ever laid eyes on, "'and no sooner did Mr. Dog put his nose down here among my ribs "'that I got ter laughin', and I laughed till I, I ain't had no use of my limbs,' says he. "'And it's a mussy unto Mr. Dog that I was ticklish, "'cause a little more, and I'd ate him up,' says he. "'I don't mind fightin', Brer Coon, and no more than you does,' says he. "'But I declare to gracious, if an I can stand ticklin', "'get me in a row where there ain't no ticklin' loud, "'and I'm your man,' says he. "'And down ter dis day,' continued Uncle Remus, "'watching the smoke from his pipe curl upward over the little boy's head, "'down ter dis day, Brer Possum's bound to surrender "'when you tetch him one in the short ribs, "'and he'll laugh if he knows he's going to be smashed for it.' End of chapter 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Chapter 4 how Mr. Rabbit was too sharp for Mr. Fox. "'Uncle Remus,' said the little boy one evening, when he had found the old man with little or nothing to do, 
Did the fox kill and eat the rabbit when he caught him with the tar baby? Lo, honey, ain't I tell you about that? replied the old darkey, chuckling slyly. I clare to gracious, I oughta told you that. But old man Nod was riding on my eyelids twill a little more than I disremember my own name. And then on to dat, here come your mammy hollering after you. Why, what I tell you when I first begun? I told you Br'er Rabbit was a monster soon creature. Leastways, that's what I laid out for to tell you. Well, then, honey, don't you go and make no other calculations, cause in dem days Br'er Rabbit and his family was at the head of the gang when any racket was on hand, and there they stayed. Fo you begins for to wipe your eyes about Br'er Rabbit, you wait and see whereabouts Br'er Rabbit gwine to fetch up at. But that's neither here nor there. When Br'er Fox find Br'er Rabbit mixed up with the tar baby, he feel mighty good, and he roll on the ground and laugh. By and by, he up and say, says he, Well, I speck I got you this time, Br'er Rabbit, says he. Maybe I ain't, but I speck I is. You've been running round here sassin' after me a mighty long time. But I speck you done come to the end of the row. You been cutting up your capers and bouncin' round in dis neighborhood until you come to believe yourself the boss of the whole gang. And then you are allus somewheres where you ain't got no business, says Br'er Fox, says he. Who axed you fur to come and strike up an acquaintance with dis yer tar baby? And who stuck you up dar where you is? Nobody in de round world. You just tuck and jam yourself on dat tar baby without waitin' for any invite, says Br'er Fox, says he. And dare you is, and dare you goin' stay twill I fixes up a bresh pile and fires her up, cause I'm goin' to barbecue you dis day, sure, says Br'er Fox, says he. Then Br'er Rabbit talk mighty humble. I don't care what you do with me, Br'er Fox, says he, just so you don't fling me in dat briar patch. Roast me, Br'er Fox, says he, but don't fling me in dat briar patch, says he. It's so much trouble for to kindle a fire, says Br'er Fox, says he, I expect I'll had her hang you, says he. Hang me just as high as you please, Br'er Fox, says Br'er Rabbit, says he. But do for the Lord's sake, don't fling me in that briar patch, says he. Hmm, I ain't got no string, said Br'er Fox, says he. And now I expect I'll had her drown you, says he. Drown me just as deep as you please, Br'er Fox, says Br'er Rabbit, says he. But do, don't fling me in that briar patch, says he. They ain't no water nigh, says Br'er Fox, says he. Now I spect I'll have to skin you, says he. Skin me, Br'er Fox, says Br'er Rabbit, says he. Snatch out my eyeballs, tear out my ears by the roots, and cut off my legs, says he. But do please, Br'er Fox, don't fling me in that briar patch, says he. Course, Br'er Fox want to hurt Br'er Rabbit bad as he kin. So he caught him in by the behind legs and slung him right in the middle of the briar patch. There was a considerable flutter where Br'er Rabbit struck the bushes, and Br'er Fox sort of hang round for to see what was going to happen. By and by, he hears somebody call him, and way up the hill he see Br'er Rabbit sitting cross-legged on a chinkapin log, combing the pitch out of his hair with a chip. Then Br'er Fox knowed that he'd been swap off mighty bad. Br'er Rabbit was bleedsed for to fling back some of his sass, and he holler out, Bread and bone in a briar patch, Br'er Fox, bread and bone in a briar patch. And with that, he skip out just as lively as a cricket in the embers. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Chapter 5 The Story of the Deluge and How It Came About One time, said Uncle Remus, adjusting his spectacles so as to be able to see how to thread a large darning needle with which he was patching his coat. One time, way back yonder, fo' you was born, honey, and fo' Mars John or Miss Sally was born, way back yonder, fo' any of us was born, de animals and de creatures sort of lectioneer round among themselves, twill at last they agreed for to have an assembly. In dem days, continued the old man, observing a look of incredulity on the little boy's face. In dem days, creatures had lots more sense than they got now. Let alone dat, they had sense same like folks. It was tetch and go with em too, man, and when they make up their minds what had to be done, twent mold mention for it was done. Well, they elected dat day had to hold her assembly for to sort of straighten out martyrs and hear the complaints, and when did they come they was on ham. The lion, he was dar, cause he was the king, and he had her be there. The rhinoceros, he was dar, and the elephant, he was dar, and the camels, and the cows, and plumb down to the crawfishes, they was dar. They was all dar. And when de lion shook his mane and took his seat in de big cheer, then the session begun for to commence. What did they do, Uncle Remus? asked the little boy. I can't scarcely call to mind exactly what they did do, but they spoke speeches and hollered and cussed and flung their language round just like when your daddy was gwine to run for the legislator and got left. Howsomever, they ranged their affairs, and explained their business. By and by, while they was disputing longer one or another, the elephant trampled on one of the crawfishes. Course, when that creature put his foot down, what somevers under there was bound for to be squished, and there wasn't enough of that crawfish left fur to tell that he'd been dar. This make the other crawfishes mighty mad, and they sort of swarmed to get her, and drawed up a kinder preamble with some wherefores in it, and read her out in that there assembly. But, bless gracious, such a racket was a-going on that nobody ain't hear it, cept maybe the mud turkle and the spring lizard and their influence was powerful lacking. By and by, whilst the unicorn was sputin' with the lion, and while the hyena was a laughin' to hisself, the elephant squished another one of the crawfishes, and little moan he'd a root the mud turkle. Then the crawfishes, what they was left of em, swarmed together and drawed up another pur-ramble with some more wafoles but they might as well have sung old Dan Tucker into a hurricane. The other creatures was too busy wid the fussin' fur to spawn under the crawfishes. So there they was, the crawfishes, and they didn't know what minute was going to be the next, and they kept on getting madder and madder and skeerder and skeerder till by and by. They gun to wink ter the mud turkle and the spring lizard, and then they bowed little holes in the ground and went down out her sight. Who did, Uncle Remus? asked the little boy. De crawfishes, honey. They bowed into the ground and kept on bowing till they unloosed the fountains of the youth, and the water squirt out and rose higher and higher till the hills was covered and the creatures was all drownded, and all because they let all among themselves that they was bigger than the crawfishes. Then the old man blew the ashes from a smoking yam, and proceeded to remove the peeling. 
"'Where was the ark, Uncle Remus?' the little boy inquired presently. "'Which ark's dad?' asked the old man, in a tone of well-feigned curiosity. "'Noah's ark,' replied the child. "'Don't you pester with old man Noah, honey. I bound he took care of dat ark. Dat's what he was dar for, and dat's what he done. Leastways, dat's what they tells me. But don't you bother longer dat ark, ceppin' your mammy fetches it up. There might have been two deluges, and then again, there mightn't. If there was any ark in dish year what the crawfish is brung on, I ain't heerd tellin' it. And when they ain't no ox round, I ain't got no time for to make em put one in dar. Heh, <laughs> it's gettin' on your bedtime, honey. End of chapter. This here's a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Chapter 6 Mr. Rabbit Grossly Deceives Mr. Fox One evening when the little boy, whose nights with Uncle Remus were as entertaining as those Arabian ones of blessed memory, had finished supper and hurried out to sit with his venerable patron, he found the old man in great glee. Indeed, Uncle Remus was talking and laughing to himself at such a rate that the little boy was afraid he had company. The truth is, Uncle Remus had heard the child coming, and, when the rosy-cheeked chap put his head in at the door, was engaged in a monologue, the burden of which seemed to be, "'Oh, Molly Har, what you doin' dar?' Sittin' in de corner, smokin' your cigar. As a matter of course, this vague allusion reminded the little boy of the fact that the wicked fox was still in pursuit of the rabbit, and he immediately put his curiosity in the shape of a question. Uncle Remus, did the rabbit have to go clean away when he got loose from the tar baby? Bless gracious, honey, Daddy didn't. Who? Him? <laughs> You don't know nothing at all about Brer Rabbit if dat's the way you puttin' him down. What he gwine way for? He might er stayed sort of close till the pitch rub off in his hair, but twa'n't many days for he was lopin' up and down the neighborhood just the same as ever, and I dunno if he weren't more sassier than before. Seem like dat the tale about how he got mixed up wid the tar baby got round amongst the neighbors. Miss Meadows and de gals got wind of it, and the next time Brer Rabbit paid him a visit, Miss Meadows tackled him bout it, and de gals sot up a monstrous gigglement. Brer Rabbit he sot up just as cool as a cucumber, he did, and let him run on. Who was Miss Meadows, Uncle Remus? inquired the little boy. Don't ask me, honey. She was in the tail, Miss Meadows and the gals was, and the tale I give you is like the one it was given to me. Brer Rabbit, he sot dar, he did, sort of lame-like, and then by and by he cross his legs, he did, and wink his eyes slow, and up and say, says he, Ladies, Brer Fox was my daddy's riding hoss for thirty year, maybe more, but thirty year did I knows on, says he, and then he paid him his respects, and tip his beaver, and march off he did, just as stiff and as stuck up as a fire stick. Next day, Brer Fox come a callin', and when he gun fur to laugh about Brer Rabbit, Miss Meadows and de gals, Day ups and tells him bout what Brer Rabbit said. Den Brer Fox grit his tooths, sho sure nuff he did, and he looked mighty dumpy. But when he riz for to go, he up and say, says he, Ladies, I ain't disputin' what you have to say, but I'll make Brer Rabbit chaw up his words and spit em out right ere where you can see em, says he, and with dat off Brer Fox put. And when he got into big road, 
he shook the dew off in his tail and made a straight shoot for Br'er Rabbit's house. When he got dar, Br'er Rabbit was spectin' on him, and the dough was shut fast. Br'er Fox knock. Nobody ain't answer. Br'er Fox knock. Nobody answer. Den he knock again. Blam! Blam! Then Br'er Rabbit holler out, mighty weak. Is that you, Br'er Fox? I want you to run and fetch the doctor. Dat bait or parsley what I et this morning is getting away wid me. Do please, Br'er Fox, run quick, says Br'er Rabbit, says he. I come after you, Br'er Rabbit, says Br'er Fox, says he. There's gwine be a party up at Miss Meadows, says he. All the gals'll be there, and I promised that I'd fetch you. The gals, they loud that it wouldn't be no party cept I fotch you, says Br'er Fox, says he. Then Br'er Rabbit say he was too sick, and Br'er Fox say he wasn't, and there they had it up and down. Sputin' and contendin'. Br'er Rabbit say he can't walk. Br'er Fox say he told him. Br'er Rabbit say, How? Br'er Fox say, In his arms. Br'er Rabbit say he'd drap him. Br'er Fox allow how he wouldn't. By and by, Br'er Rabbit say he'd go if Br'er Fox can tote him on his back. Br'er Fox said he would. Br'er Rabbit say he can't ride without a saddle. Br'er Fox say he get a saddle. Br'er Rabbit say he can't sit in a saddle lest he have a bridle for to hold on by. Br'er Fox say he get the bridle. Br'er Rabbit say he can't ride without a blind bridle, cause Br'er Fox be shying at stumps long the road and fling him off. Br'er Fox say he gonna get a blind bridle. Then Br'er Rabbit say he'll go. Then Br'er Fox say he ride Br'er Rabbit most up to Miss Meadows's, and then he could get down and walk to balance of the way. Br'er Rabbit agreed, and then Br'er Fox lipped out at her the saddle and the bridle. Cause Br'er Rabbit knowed the game that Br'er Fox was fixin' for to play and he determinin' fur to outdo him, and by the time he comb his hair and twist his mustache and sort of rig up, here comes Br'er Fox saddle and bridle on, and lookin' as pretty as a circus pony. He trot up to the door and stand there pawin' the ground and chompin' the bit, same like a show enough hoss, and Br'er Rabbit, he mount, he did, and they amble off. Br'er Fox can't see behind with the blind bridle on, but by and by he feel Br'er Rabbit raise one of his foots. "'What you doin' now, Br'er Rabbit?' says he. "'Shortenin' the left stirrup, Br'er Fox,' says he. By and by, Br'er Rabbit raised up the other foot. "'What are you doin' now, Br'er Rabbit?' says he. "'Pullin' down my pants, Br'er Fox,' says he. All the time, bless gracious honey, Br'er Rabbit were putting on his spurs, and when they got close to Miss Meadows, where Br'er Rabbit was to get off, and Br'er Fox made a motion fur to stand still, Br'er Rabbit slapped those spurs into Br'er Fox's flanks, and you better believe he got over ground. <laughs> When they got to the house, Miss Meadows and all the gals was sittin' on the piazza, and stidder stoppin' at the gate. Br'er Rabbit rid on by, he did, and then come gallopin' down the road, and up to the hoss rack, which he hitched Br'er Fox at, and then he saunter into the house, he did, and shake hands with the gals, and set dar smokin' his cigar, same as a town man. By and by he draw in a long puff, and then he let it out in a cloud, and square hisself back and holler out, he did. Ladies, ain't I done tell you Br'er Fox was de riding hoss for our family? He's sort of losing his gait now, but I speck I can fetch him all right in a month or two, says he. And then Br'er Rabbit sort of grin, he did, and the gals giggle. 
and Miss Meadows, she prays up de pony, and dar was Brer Fox hitched fast to de rack, and couldn't help hisself. "'Is that all, Uncle Remus?' asked the little boy as the old man paused. "'Dat ain't all, honey, but twon't do for to give out too much cloth for to cut out one pair of pants,' replied the old man sententiously. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Chapter 7 Mr. Fox is again victimized. When Miss Sally's little boy went to Uncle Remus the next night to hear the conclusion of the adventure in which the rabbit made a riding horse of the fox, to the great enjoyment and gratification of Miss Meadows and the girls, he found the old man in a bad humor. "'I ain't tellin' no tales to bad chillins,' says Uncle Remus curtly. "'But, Uncle Remus, I ain't bad,' said the little boy plaintively. Who dat chunkin' dem chickens dis mornin'? Who dat knockin' out folks' eyes wid dat yeller bammer sling jist for dinner? Who dat sickin' dat pinter puppy atter my pig? Who dat scatterin' my ingon sets? And who dat flingin' rocks on top of my house, which a little mowin one of em could a drop spang on my head? "'Well, now, uh, Uncle Remus, I didn't go to do it. I won't do so any more. Please, Uncle Remus, if you will tell me, I'll, I'll run to the house and bring you some tea-cakes.' "'Seen em's better than hearin tell of em replied the old man, the severity of his countenance relaxing somewhat. But the little boy darted out, and in a few minutes came running back with his pockets full and his hands full. I lay yo mammy ol spishin dat de rat's stomachs is widenin dis neighborhood when she come for to count up her cakes, said Uncle Remus with a chuckle. These, he continued, dividing the cakes into two equal parts, these I'll tackle now, and these I'll lay by for Sunday. Let me see. I most dismember whereabouts Brer Fox and Brer Rabbit was. The rabbit rode the fox to Miss Meadows's and hitched him to the horse rack, said the little boy. Why, course he did, said Uncle Remus. Course he did. Well, Brer Rabbit rid Brer Fox up, he did, and tied him to the rack, and then sought out in der piazza with the gals a smokin' or a cigar with more proudness than what you most ever see. They talk, and they sing, and they play on de pianer, de gals did. Twill by and by, it come time for Brer Rabbit fur to be gwine, and he'd tell em all good-bye, and strut out to de hoss-rack, same as if he was the king of de patrollers, and den he mount Brer Fox and ride off. Brer Fox ain't sayin' nothin' at all. He just rack off, he did and keep his mouth shut. And Brer Rabbit knowed there was business cookin' up for him, and he feel monster skittish. Brer Fox amble on twill he get in de long lane outer sight of Miss Meadows' house, and den he turn loose, he did. He rip and he roar, and he cuss and he swore, he snort and he cavort. What was he doin' that for, Uncle Remus? the little boy inquired. He was trying for to fling Brer Rabbit off on his back, bless your soul. But he just might as well as wrestle with his own shatter. Every time he hump hisself, Brer Rabbit slapped the spurs in him, and dar they had it up and down. Brer Fox fairly toe up at the ground, he did. And he jumped so high, and he jumped so quick, that he mighty nigh snatch his own tail off. They keep on gwine on this way twill by and by. Brer Fox lay down and roll over, he did, and dis sort of unsettled Brer Rabbit. But by the time Brer Fox got back on his footses again, 
Brer Rabbit was gwine through the underbrush, mo' sammer than a racehorse. Brer Fox, he lit out after him, he did, and he pushed Brer Rabbit so close that it was about all he could do for to get in a holler tree. Holes too little for Brer Fox for to get in, and he had her lay down and rest and get her his mind to get her. While he was lying there, Mr. Buzzard came flopping long, and seeing Brer Fox stretch out on the ground, he lit and viewed the premises. Then Mr. Buzzard sort of shake his wing, put his head on one side, and say to himself like, says he, "'Brer Fox is dead, and I so sorry,' says he. "'No, I ain't dead, neither,' said Brer Fox, says he. "'I got old man Rabbit pent up in here,' says he. "'And I'm a-gwine ter get him this time if it takes twelve Christmases,' says he. Then, after some more palaver, Brer Fox make a bargain that Mr. Buzzard was to watch the hole and keep Brer Rabbit dar whilst Brer Fox went after his axe. Then Brer Fox, he lope off, he did, and Mr. Buzzard, he tuck up his stand at the hole. By and by, when all get still, Brer Rabbit sort of Scramble down close to the hole, he did, and holler out, Brer Fox! Oh, Brer Fox! Brer Fox done gone, and nobody say nothing. Then Brer Rabbit squall out like he was mad, says he. You needn't talk lest you water, says he. I knows you're dar, and I ain't keerin, says he. I just want her tell you that I wish mighty bad Brer Turkey Buzzard was here, says he. Then Mr. Buzzard try to talk like Brer Fox. What you want with Mr. Buzzard, says he. Oh, nothing in tickler, except there's the fattest gray squirrel in here that I ever see, says he. And if Brer Turkey Buzzard was round, he'd be mighty glad for to get him, says he. How's Mr. Buzzard going to get him? says the buzzard, says he. Well, there's a little hole round on the other side of this tree, says Br'er Rabbit, says he. And if Br'er Tucky Buzzard was here, so we could take up a stand dar, says he, I'd drive that squirrel out, says he. Drive him out, then, says Mr. Buzzard, says he. And I'll see that Br'er Tucky Buzzard gets him, says he. <laughs> then Br'er Rabbit, he kick up a racket, like he was driving something out, and Mr. Buzzard he rush round fur to catch the squirrel, and Br'er Rabbit he dash out he did, and then he just fly for home. <laughs> At this point, Uncle Remus took one of the tea cakes, held his head back, opened his mouth, dropped the cake in with a sudden motion, looked at the little boy with an expression of astonishment, and then closed his eyes and began to chew mumbling as an accompaniment the plaintive tune of don't you grieve after me the seance was over but before the little boy went into the big house uncle remus laid his rough hand tenderly on the child's shoulder and remarked in a confidential tone honey you must get up soon christmas morning and open the door cause i want her bounce in on marse john and miss sally and holler christmas gift just like I used to during the farmin' days for the war, when old Miss was alive. I bound they don't forget this old nigger, neither. When you hear me callin' de pigs, honey, you just hop up and unfasten the door. I lay I'll give Marse John one of these year's surprise parties. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Chapter 8 Mr. Fox is Outdone by Mr. Buzzard. If and I don't run into no mistakes, remarked Uncle Remus, as the little boy came tripping in to see him after supper. 
Mr. Turkey Buzzard was guarding the holler where Brer Rabbit went in at, in which he come out and. The silence of the little boy verified the old man's recollection. Well, Mr. Buzzard, he feel mighty lonesome, he did, but he done promised Brer Fox that he'd stay, and he determined for to sort of hang round and join in the joke. And he ain't had a wait long, neither, cause by and by here come Brer Fox gallopin' through the woods with an axe on his shoulder. "'How you speck Brer Rabbit gettin' on, Brer Buzzard?' says Brer Fox, says he. "'Oh, he in there,' says Brer Buzzard, says he. "'He mighty still, though. I speck he takin' a nap,' says he. "'Then I'm just in time for to wake him up,' says Brer Fox, says he. And with that he fling off his coat, and spit in his hands, and grab the axe. Then he draw back, and come down on the tree. Pow! And every time he come down with the axe, pow! Mr. Buzzard, he step high, he did, and holler out, Oh, he in there, Brer Fox, he in there, sure! And every time a chip would fly off, Mr. Buzzard, he'd jump and dodge and hold his head sideways, he would, and holler, He in there, Brer Fox, I done heard him, he in there, sure! And Brer Fox, he lammed away at that holler tree, he did, like a man maulin' rails, twill by and by, atter he done got the tree most cut through. He stopped for to catch his breath, and he seed Mr. Buzzard laughing behind his back, he did, and right then and dar, without going any footer, Brer Fox, he smelled a rat. But Mr. Buzzard, he keep on hollering, he in there, Brer Fox, he in there, sure, I done seed him. Then Brer Fox, he make like he peepin' up to holler, and he say, says he, Run yer, Brer Buzzard, and look if this ain't Brer Rabbit's foot hangin' down yer. And Mr. Buzzard, he come steppin' up, he did, same as if he were treadin' on kirkle burrs, and he stick his head in the hole, and no sooner did he done dat than Brer Fox grab him. Mr. Buzzard flap his wings and scramble round right smartly, he did, but <laughs> twarn't no use. Brer Fox had to vantage her to grip, he did, and he hilt him right down to the ground. Then Mr. Buzzard squall out, says he. Let me alone, Brer Fox. Turn me loose, says he. Brer Rabbit'll get out. You're getting close at him, says he. And eleven more licks'll fetch him, says he. I nigher to you, Brer Buzzard, said Brer Fox, says he. Then I'll be to Brer Rabbit this day, says he. What you fooling me for, says he. Let me alone, Brer Fox, says Mr. Buzzard, says he. My old woman waitin' for me. Brer Rabbit in there, says he. There's a bunch of his fur in that blackberry bush, says Brer Fox, says he. And dat ain't the way he come, says he. Then Mr. Buzzard up and tell Brer Fox how twas, and he loud, Mr. Buzzard did, that Brer Rabbit was the low downest what's his name what he ever run up with. Then Brer Fox says, says he, That's neither here nor there, Brer Buzzard, says he. I left you here for to watch this year old, and I left Brer Rabbit in dar. I comes back and I finds you at the ole, and Brer Rabbit ain't in dar, says he. I'm going to make you pay for it. I done been tampered with twill plumb down to the sap suckerl set on a log and sassy me. I'm going to fling you in a brush heap and burn you up, says he. If you fling me on the fire, Brer Fox, I'll fly away, says Mr. Buzzard, says he. I'll set a yo hash right now, says Brer Fox, says he. And with that he grabbed Mr. Buzzard by the tail, he did, and make for the dash him in the ground. But just about that time the tail fetters come out and Mr. Buzzard sail off like one of these here balloons, and as he riz he holler back, "'You give me good start, Brer Fox,' says he, and Brer Fox sot dar and watch him fly outer sight. 
"'But what became of the rabbit, Uncle Remus?' asked the little boy. "'Don't you pester longer, Brer Rabbit, honey, and don't you fret about him. "'You'll hear where he went and how he come out. "'Dish yer coal snap rustles with my bones now,' continued the old man, "'putting on his hat and picking up his walking-stick. "'It rustles with me monstrous, and I got a rack round and see if I can run up against some Christmas leavings.' End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Chapter 9 Miss Cow Falls a Victim to Mr. Rabbit. "'Uncle Remus,' said the little boy, "'what became of the rabbit after he fooled the buzzard "'and got out of the hollow tree?' "'Who, Brer Rabbit? "'Bless your soul, honey, Brer Rabbit went skipping long home, he did, "'just as sassy as a jaybird at a sparrow's nest. "'He went galloping long, he did, "'but he feel mighty fired out and stiff in the joints. "'He was mighty nigh dead for something for to drink. And "'By and by, when he got most the home, he spied old Miss Cow feeding round in the field, he did, and he determined fur to try his hand with her. Brer Rabbit know mighty well that Miss Cow won't give him no milk, cause she done refuse him in more than once, and when his old woman was sick at that. But never mind that. Brer Rabbit sort of dance up the long side of defense, he did, and holler out, how does this cow says brer rabbit says he why howdy brer rabbit says miss cow says she how you find yourself these days sis cow says brer rabbit says he i'm sort of tolerable brer rabbit how you come on says miss cow says she oh i'm just tolerable myself, says Cow, sort of lingering twixt a balk and a breakdown, says Brer Rabbit, says he. How your folks, Brer Rabbit, says Miss Cow, says she. They just middlin', says Cow. How Brer Bull gettin' on, says Brer Rabbit, says he. Oh, sort of so-so, says Miss Cow, says she. "'There's some mighty nice persimmons up this tree, sis cow, says Brer Rabbit, says he. "'And I'd like mighty well for to have some of em, says he. "'How you going to get em, Brer Rabbit?' says she. "'I loud maybe that I might ax you for to butt against the tree and shake some down, sis cow, says Brer Rabbit, says he. "'Course, Miss Cow don't want her discommodate, Brer Rabbit.' And she marched up to the persimmon tree, she did, and hit it a rap with her horns. Blam! Now then, continued Uncle Remus, tearing off a corner of a plug of tobacco and cramming it into his mouth. Now then, uh, them persimmons was green as grass, and there one never drap. Then Miss Cow butt the tree. Blim! Never a persimmon drap. Dem Miss Cow sort of back off a little and run again the tree. Blip! No persimmons never drap. Dem Miss Cow back off a little fudder, she did, and heist her tail on her back and come again the tree. Kerblam! <laughs> she come so fast and she come so hard till one of her horns went spang through the tree, and dar she was. She can't go forwards, she can't go backwards. This is exactly what Brer Rabbit was waiting for, and he no sooner seed old Miss Cow all fastened up than he jump up, he did, and cut the pigeon wing. Come help me out, Brer Rabbit, says Miss Cow, says she. I can't climb, says Cow, says Brer Rabbit, says he. But I'll run and tell Brer Bull, says he. And with that, Brer Rabbit put out for home. And twan't long fo here he come with his old woman and all his chillins, and even the last one of the family was toting a pail. 
de big uns had big pails, and de little uns had little pails, and dey all surrounded old Miss Cow, dey did, and you hear me, honey, dey milked her dry. <laughs> de old uns milked and de young uns milked, and den when dey done got enough, Brer Rabbit, he up and say, says he, I wish you mighty well, Sis Cow. I loud, being as how that you'd had her sort of camp out all night, that I better come and swage your bag, says he. Do which, Uncle Remus? asked the little boy. Go long, honey. Swage your bag. When cows don't get milked, the bag swells, and you can hear em a moanin and a bellerin, just like they was getting herded. That's what Brer Rabbit done. He assembled his family, he did, and he swaged old Miss Cow's bag. Miss Cow, she stood dar, she did, and she study and study and strive fer to break loose, but the horn done been jammed in the tree so tight that twas way for the day in the morning fore she loose it. Anyhow, it was during the night and atter she get loose she sort of graze round, she did, fur to justify her stomach, she loud, old Miss Cow did, that Brer Rabbit be hoppin' long dat way fur to see how she gettin' on, and she took and lay her trap for him, and just about sunrise, what did old Miss Cow do but march up to the persimmon tree and stick her horn back in the hole? <laughs> but bless your soul, honey, while she was cropping the grass, she took one mouthful too many, cause when she hitch on to the persimmon tree again, Brer Rabbit was settin' in the fence corner a watchin' her. Then Brer Rabbit he say to herself, "Hey yo," says he, "what this year gwine on now?" Hold your horses, sis cow, twill you hear me comin', says he. And then he crope off down the fence, Brer Rabbit did, and by and by, here he come, lippity clippity, clippity lippity, just a sailin' down the big road. Mornin', sis cow, says Brer Rabbit, says he. How'd you come on this mornin', says he. Poly, Brer Rabbit, poly, says Miss Cow, says she. I ain't had no rest all night, says she. I can't pull loose, says she. But if you'll come and catch hold of my tail, Brer Rabbit, says she, I reckon maybe I can fetch my horn out, says she. Then Brer Rabbit, he come up a little closer, but he ain't getting too close. I speck I'm nigh enough, says Cow, says Brer Rabbit, says he. I'm a mighty puny man, and I might get trampled, says he. You do de pullin', sis cow, says he, and I'll do de gruntin', says he. <laughs> Dem Miss Cow. She pull out her horn, she did, and took after Brer Rabbit, and down de big road they had it. Brer Rabbit with his ears laid back, and Miss Cow with her head down, and her tail curl. Brer Rabbit kept on gaining. And by and by he dart in a briar patch, and by the time Miss Cow come long he had his head sticking out, and his eyes looked big as Miss Sally's china sauces. Hey yo, Mrs. Cow, where you gwine? says Brer Rabbit, says he. Howdy, Brer Big Eyes, says Miss Cow, says she. Is you see Brer Rabbit go by? He just this minute pass, says Brer Rabbit, says he. And he looked mighty sick, says he. And with that, Miss Cow took down the road like the dogs was out of her. And Brer Rabbit, he just lay down dar in the briar patch and roll and laughed till his sides hurted him. He bleeds it to laugh. Fox at her him, buzzard at her him, and a cow at her him, and he ain't caught him yet. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. 
Chapter Ten. Mister Terrapin appears upon the scene. Miss Sally's little boy again occupying the anxious position of auditor. Uncle Remus took the shovel and put the noses of the chunks together, as he expressed it, and then began. One day, atter sis cow done run past her own shadder tryin fer to ketch him, Brer Rabbit took and lowed dat he was gwine to drap in and see Miss Meadows and de gals, and he got out his piece er lookin glass and primp up he did, and sought out. Gwine canterin long de road, who should Brer Rabbit run up with but old Brer Derrypin, the same old one and sixpence? Brer Rabbit stop, he did, and rap on the roof of Brer Terrapin's house. On the roof of his house, Uncle Remus? interrupted the little boy. Course, honey, Brer Terrapin carry his house with him. Rain or shine, hot or cold, strike up with old Brer Terrapin when you will, and whilst you may, and where you find him. Dare you'll find his shanty. It's just like I tell you. So then, Brer Rabbit, he rap on the roof of Brer Terrapin's house, he did, and axed was he in. And Brer Terrapin loud that he was. And then Brer Rabbit, he asked him, Howdy. And then Brer Terrapin, he likewise respond, Howdy. And then Brer Rabbit, he say, Where was Brer Terrapin going? And Brer Terrapin, he say which he weren't gwine nowhere scarcely. Then Brer Rabbit low he was on his way fur to see Miss Meadows and the gals, and he ax Brer Terrapin if he won't join in and go long. Brer Terrapin spawny he don't care if he do, and then they sought out. They had plenty of time for confabbing along the way, but by and by they got dar, and Miss Meadows and the gals they come to the door they did and ax em in, and in they went. When they got in, Brer Terrapin was so flat-footed that he was too low on the floor, and he went high enough in a cheer, and while they was all scrambling round trying fer to get Brer Terrapin a cheer, Brer Rabbit, he pick him up and put him on the shelf where the water bucket sopped, and old Brer Terrapin, he lay back up dar, he did, and just as proud as a nigger with a cook possum. Course the talk fall on Brer Fox, and Miss Meadows and the gals make a great admiration about what a gaily riding hoss Brer Fox was, and they make lots of fun. And laugh and giggle same like gals does these days. Brer Rabbit, he sot dar in the cheer smoking his cigar, and he sort of clear up his throat and say, says he, I'd a rid him over this morning, ladies, says he, but I rid him so hard yesterday that he went lame in the off foe leg, and I speck I had to swap him off yet, says he. Then Brer Terrapin, he up and say, says he, Well, if you go under sell him, Brer Rabbit, says he, sell him somewheres outer dis neighborhood, cause he done been here too long now, says he. No longer than day four yesterday, says he, Brer Fox passed me on the road, and what do you reckon he say, says he. Law, Brer Terrapin, said Miss Meadows, says she. You don't mean to say he cussed, says she, and then the gals hilt the fans up for the faces. Oh, no, ma'am, says Brer Terrapin, says he. He didn't cuss, but he holler out. Hey, yo, stinkin' Jim, says he. Oh, my, you hear that, gals, says Miss Meadows, says she. Brer Fox called Brer Terrapin Stinking Jim, says she, and dem Miss Meadows and the gals make great wonderment how Brer Fox can talk dat away about nice men like Brer Terrapin. But bless gracious, honey, whilst all this was going on, Brer Fox was standing at the back door with one ear at the cat hole listening. Eavesdrappers don't hear no good about themselves and the way Brer Fox was abused that day was a caution. By and by, Brer Fox stick his head in the door and holler out, 
"'Good evening, folks. I wish you mighty well,' says he, and with that he make a dash for Brer Rabbit. But Miss Meadows and the gals, they holler and squall, they did, and Brer Terrapin he got to scrambling round up dar on the shelf, and off he come, and blip, he took Brer Fox on the back of the head. This sort of stunted Brer Fox, and when he get her his remembrance, the most he seed was a pot of greens turned over in the fireplace, and a broke cheer. Brer Rabbit was gone, and Brer Terrapin was gone, and Miss Meadows and the gals was gone. Where did the rabbit go, Uncle Remus? the little boy asked, after a pause. Bless your soul, honey. Brer Rabbit, he skint up the chibley. That's what turned the pot of greens over. Brer Terrapin, he crope under the bed, he did, and got behind the clothes chist. And Miss Meadows and the gals, they run out in the yard. Brer Fox, he sort of look round and feel at the back of his head. But Brer Terrapin lit, but he don't see no sign or Brer Rabbit. But the smoke and ashes gwine up the chimbley got the best of Brer Rabbit, and by and by... He sneeze, hook a chow. Aha, uh -huh, says Brer Fox, says he. You're dar, is ye? says he. Well, I'm going to smoke you out, if it takes a month. You're mine this time, says he. Brer Rabbit, you ain't saying nothing. Ain't you coming down, says Brer Fox, says he. Brer Rabbit ain't saying nothing. Then Brer Fox, he went out outer some wood, he did, and when he come back, he hear Brer Rabbit laughing. "'What are you laughing at, Brer Rabbit?' says Brer Fox, says he. "'Can't tell you, Brer Fox,' says Brer Rabbit, says he. "'Better tell, Brer Rabbit,' says Brer Fox, says he. "'Tain't nothing but a box of money somebody done left up in here in the chink of the chimbley,' says Brer Rabbit, says he. I don't believe ye, says Brer Fox, says he. Look up and see, says Brer Rabbit, says he. And when Brer Fox look up, Brer Rabbit spit his eyes fuller tobacco juice, he did. And Brer Fox, he make a break for the branch, and Brer Rabbit, he come down and told the ladies good-bye. How do you get him off, Brer Rabbit? said Miss Meadows, says she. Who, me? says Brer Rabbit, says he. Why, I just took and told him that if he don't go long home and stop playing his pranks on spectable folks, that I'd take him out and thrash him, says he. And what became of the terrapin? asked the little boy. Oh, well, then, exclaimed the old man. Chillins can't spect know all about everything fold they get some rest. Dem eyelids a yon want to be propped up with straws this minute. End of the tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Chapter 11 Mr. Wolf Makes a Failure. I lay your ma got company said Uncle Remus, as the little boy entered the old man's door with a huge piece of mince pie in his hand. And if she ain't got company, then she done gone and dropped the cupboard key somewheres where you done run up with it. Well, I saw the pie lying there, Uncle Remus, and I just thought I'd fetch it out to you. To be sure, honey, replied the old man, regarding the child with admiration. To be sure, honey, that changes matters. Christmas doings is outer date, and they ain't got no business layin' round loose. Dish year pie, Uncle Remus continued, holding it up and measuring it with an experienced eye, will give me strength fer to pursue on at her Brer Fox and Brer Rabbit and the other creatures what they roped in along wid em. Here the old man paused, and proceeded to demolish the pie, a feat accomplished in a very short time. Then he wiped the crumbs from his beard and began. 
Brer Fox feel so bad, en he git so mad 'bout Brer Rabbit, dat he dunner know w'at ter do, en he look mighty down hearted. Bimeby, one day, w'iles he wuz gwine long de road, ole Brer Wolf come up wid 'im. When dey done howdyin' en axin' atter one anudder's fambly connection, Brer Wolf, he low he did, dat der wuz sump'n wrong wid Brer Fox, en Brer Fox, he lowed der weren't, en he went on en laugh en make great ter do, kaze Brer Wolf look like he spishin' sump'n. But Brer Wolf, he got mighty long head, en he sort of broach round Brer Rabbit's carryings on. Cause the way that Brer Rabbit see Brer Fox done got ter be the talk of the neighborhood. Then Brer Fox and Brer Wolf, they sort of palavered on, they did. Twill by and by, Brer Wolf he up and say that he done got plan fixed for to trap Brer Rabbit. And Brer Fox say how? Then Brer Wolf up and tell him that the way fur to get the trap on old Brer Rabbit was to get him in Brer Fox's house. Brer Fox done know Brer Rabbit of old, and he know that sort of game done Wolf to a frazzle. But Brer Wolf, he talk mighty persuadin. How you gwine to get him dar? said Brer Fox, says he. Fool him dar, says Brer Wolf, says he. Who gwine to do the foolin? says Brer Fox, says he. I'll do the foolin, says Brer Wolf, says he. If you'll do the gamin, says he. How you gwine to do it? says Brer Fox, says he. You run long home and get on the bed and make like you dead. And don't you say nothing twill Bear Rabbit come and put his hands on to you, says Brer Wolf, says he. And if we don't get him for supper, Joe's dead and Sal's a widder, says he. This look like mighty nice game, and Brer Fox greed. So then he amble off home, and Brer Wolf he march off to Brer Rabbit's house. When he got dar, it looked like nobody at home, but Brer Wolf he walk up and knock on the door. Blam, blam, nobody come. Then he lam a loose and knock again. Blim, blim. Who dar? says Brer Rabbit, says he. Friend, says Brer Wolf. Too many friends spoils the dinner, says Brer Rabbit, says he. Which one's this? says he. I fetch bad news, Brer Rabbit, says Brer Wolf, says he. Bad news is soon told, says Brer Rabbit, says he. By this time, Brer Rabbit done come to the door with his head tied up in a red hanker. Brer Fox died this morning said Brer Wolf, says he. Well, your moaning gown, Brer Wolf, says Brer Rabbit, says he. Gwine after it now, says Brer Wolf, says he. I just called by fur to bring the news. I went down Brer Fox's house little bit ago, and there I found him stiff, says he. Then Brer Wolf lope off. Brer Rabbit sought down and scratch his head, he did. And by and by, he say to himself that he believe he sort of drap round by Brer Fox's house fur to see how the land lay. No sooner said and done, up he jump, and out he went. When Brer Rabbit got close to Brer Fox's house, all looked lonesome. Then he went up nigher, nobody stirring. Then he look in. And dar lay Brer Fox stretch out on the bed just as big as life. Then Brer Rabbit make like he talkin' to hisself. Nobody round fur to look at a Brer Fox. Not even Brer Tucky Buzzard ain't come fur the funeral, says he. I hope Brer Fox ain't dead. Oh, but I speck he is, says he. Even down to Brer Wolf done gone and left him. 
It's the busy season with me, but I'll sit up with him. He seem like he dead. Yet yeah, he mayn't be, says Brer Rabbit, says he. When a man go to see the dead folks, dead folks allus raise up the behind legs and hollers, Wahoo! says he. Brer Fox, he lay still. Then Brer Rabbit, he talk a little louder. Mighty funny. Brer Fox look like he dead, yet he don't do like he dead. Dead folks heist the behind leg and hollers, Wahoo! When a man come to see him, says Brer Rabbit, says he. Show sure enough, Brer Fox lift up the foot and holler, Wahoo! And Brer Rabbit, he tear out of the house like the dogs was after him. Brer Wolf mighty smart, but next time you hear from him, honey, he'll be in trouble. You just hold your breath and wait. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Tale number 12. Mr. Fox Tackles Old Man Terrypin One day, said Uncle Remus, sharpening his knife on the palm of his hand, one day Brer Fox strike up with Brer Terrypin right in the middle of the big road. Brer Terrypin done heerd him comin', and he lowed to himself that he'd sort of keep one eye open. But Brer Fox was monstrous polite, and he opened up the confab, he did, like he ain't see Brer Terrypin since the last freshet. Hey yo, Brer Terrypin, where you been this long come short? says Brer Fox, says he. Loungin' round, Brer Fox, loungin' round, says Brer Terrypin. You don't look sprucey like you did, Brer Terrypin, said Brer Fox, says he. Loungin' round and sufferin', says Brer Terrypin, says he. Then they talk sort of run on like this. What ail ye, Brer Terrypin? Yo eye look mighty red said Brer Fox, says he. Lord, Brer Fox, you dunna what trouble is. You ain't been loungin' round and sufferin', says Brer Terrapin, says he. Both eyes red, and you look like you mighty weak, Brer Terrapin, says Brer Fox, says he. Lord, Brer Fox, you dunna know what trouble is, says Brer Terrapin, says he. "'What ail you now, Brer Terrypin?' says Brer Fox, says he. "'Took a walk the other day, and a man come long and sot the field of fire. "'Lor, Brer Fox, you dunna know what trouble is,' says Brer Terrypin, says he. "'How you get out of the fire, Brer Terrypin?' says Brer Fox, says he. "'Sot and took it, Brer Fox.' says Brer Terrapin, says he. Sot and took it, and the smoke sif in my eye, and the fire scorch my back, says Brer Terrapin, says he. Likewise sit bun your tail off, said Brer Fox, says he. Oh, no, there's the tail, Brer Fox, says Brer Terrapin, says he, and with that he uncurl his tail from under the shell, and no sooner did he do dat then Brer Fox grab it and holler out, Oh, yes, Brer Terrypin, oh, yes, and so you are the man what lamm me on the head at Miss Meadows, is ye? You are in with Brer Rabbit, is ye? Well, I'm gwatter out you. Brer Terrypin beg and beg, but twan't no use. Brer Fox done been fooled so much that he looked like he'd determined fur to have Brer Terrypin Hazlitt. Then Brer Terrapin begged Brer Fox not for to drown him, but Brer Fox ain't making no promise. And then he begged Brer Fox for to bun him, cause he done used to fire. But Brer Fox don't say nothing. By and by, Brer Fox dragged Brer Terrapin off a little ways below the spring house, 
and souse him under de water. Den Brer Terrapin begin fer to holler. Turn loose dat stump root and catch holder me. Turn loose dat stump root and catch holder me. Brer Fox, he holler back. I ain't got holt no stump root, and I is got hold of you. Brer Terrapin, he keep on hollering. Kitch, hold of me. I'm a drowning. I'm a drowning. Turn loose the stump root and catch hold of me. Show sure enough, Brer Fox turn loose the tail, and Brer Terrapin, he went down to the bottom. Kablunka de blink. No typographical combination or description could do justice to the guttural sonorousness, the peculiar intonation which Uncle Remus imparted to this combination. It was so peculiar, indeed, that the little boy asked, How did he go to the bottom, Uncle Remus? Kerblunka de blink! Was he drowned, Uncle Remus? Who? Old man Terrypin? <laughs> Is you drowned when your ma tucks you into bed? Well, no, replied the little boy dubiously. Old man Terrypin was at home, I tell you, honey. Kerblinkity blonk. End of the tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Chapter 13 The Awful Fate of Mr. Wolf Uncle Remus was half-soling one of his shoes, and his Miss Sally's little boy had been handling his awls, his hammers, and his knives to such an extent that the old man was compelled to assume a threatening attitude. But peace reigned again, and the little boy perched himself on a chair, watching Uncle Remus driving in pegs. "'Folks what's allers pesterin' people, and bodderin' longer dat what ain't dern, don't never come to no good end. Dar was Brer Wolf, stitter mindin' his own business. He had her taken go in partnerships with Brer Fox and dey want scarcely a minute in the day that they want after Br'er Rabbit, and he kept on, he kept on, twill first news you knowed, he got caught up with, and he got caught up with monstrous bad. Goodness, Uncle Remus, I thought the wolf let the rabbit alone after he tried to fool him about the fox being dead. Better let me tell you this year my way. By and by it'll be your bedtime, and Miss Sally bein' hollerin' after you, and you be a wimplin' round, and then Mars John'll fetch up with the rear with that er strop what I made for him. The child laughed, and playfully shook his fist in the simple, serious face of the venerable old darky, but said no more. Uncle Remus waited a while to be sure there was to be no other demonstration, and then proceeded. Brer Rabbit ain't see no peace whatsomever. He can't leave home except Brer Wolf would make a raid and tote off some of his family. Brer Rabbit built him a straw house, and it was torn down. Then he made a house out of pine tops, and that went the same way. Then he made him a bark house, and that was raided on, and every time he lost a house, he lost one of his chillins. Last, Brer Rabbit got mad, he did, and cussed, and then he went off, he did, and got some carpenters, and they built him a plank house with rock foundations. After that, he could have some peace and quietness. He could go out and pass the time or day with his neighbors, and come back and set by the fire, and smoke his pipe, and read the newspaper same like any man what got a family. He made a hole, he did, in the cellar where the little rabbits could hide out when there was much of a racket in the neighborhood, and the latch of the front door caught on the inside. Brer Wolf, he see how the land lay, he did, and he lay low. The little rabbits was mighty skittish, but it got so that 
col' chills ain't run up Brer Rabbit's back no mo' w'en he heard Brer Wolf go gallopin' by. Bimeby, one day when Brer Rabbit was fixin' fer to call on Miss Coon, he heard a monstrous fuss and clatter up the big road, and most fore he could fix his ears for to listen, Brer Wolf run in de door. The little rabbits, they went into de hole in de cellar, they did, like blowing out a candle. Brer Wolf was farly kivered with mud, and mighty nigh out of wind. Oh, do pray save me, Brer Rabbit, says Brer Wolf, says he. Do please, Brer Rabbit, de dogs is after me, and dare tire me up. Don't you hear em coming? Oh, do please save me, Brer Rabbit. Hide me somewheres where the dogs won't get me. No quicker said than done. Jump at that big chist there, Brer Wolf, said Brer Rabbit, says he. Jump in dar and make yourself at home. In jumped Brer Wolf, down come de lid, and entered de house went de hook, and dare Mr. Wolf was. Then Brer Rabbit went to de looking glass he did and wink at hisself, and den he drawed de rockin' cheer in front of de fire he did, and took a big char tobacco. Tobacco, Uncle Remus? asked the little boy incredulously. Rabbit tobacco, honey. You know dis year life everlastin what Miss Sally puts mong de clothes in de trunk. Well, dat's rabbit tobacco. Den Brer Rabbit sot dar a long time, he did, turnin his mind over and workin his thinkin machine. By and by he got up and sort of stir round. Den Brer Wolf open up. Is de dogs all gone, Brer Rabbit? Seem like I hear one of em smellin round de chimbley corner just now. Den Brer Rabbit get de kittle and fill it full of water, and put it on de fire. What are you doin now, Brer Rabbit? I'm fixin fer to make you a nice cup of tea, Brer Wolf. Den Brer Rabbit went to de cupboard and get de gimlet, and commence fer to bore little holes in de chist lid. What you doin now, Brer Rabbit? I'm bowin little holes so you can get breath, Brer Wolf. Then Brer Rabbit went out and get some mo wood and fling it on the fire. What are you doin now, Brer Rabbit? I'm a chunkin up the fire so you won't get cold, Brer Wolf. Then Brer Rabbit went down into the cellar and fotch out all his chillins. What you doin now, Brer Rabbit? I'm a tellin' my chillins what a nice man you is, Brer Wolf. And the chillins, they had to put the hands on the mouse fer to keep from laughin. <laughs> then Brer Rabbit, he got the kittle and commenced fer to pour the hot water on the chist lid. What dat I hear, Brer Rabbit? You hear the wind a-blowin', Brer Wolf. Then the water began fer to sift through. What dat I feel, Brer Rabbit? You feels de fleas a bitin, Brer Wolf. They're bitin mighty hard, Brer Rabbit. Turn over on de other side, Brer Wolf. What dat I feel now, Brer Rabbit? Still you feels de fleas, Brer Wolf. They're eatin me up, Brer Rabbit. And dem was de last words of Brer Wolf, cause the scaldin water done de business. Then Brer Rabbit called in his neighbors, he did and they hilt a regular jubilee. And if you go to Brer Rabbit's house right now, I dunno but what you'll find Brer Wolf's hide hanging in de back porch, and all because he was so busy wid other folks's doings. End of chapter This year's a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Chapter 14 Mr. Fox and the Deceitful Frogs. When the little boy ran in to see Uncle Remus the night after he'd been told of the awful fate of Brer Wolf, the only response to his greeting was, "'I do murker come murker.' 
no explanation could convey an adequate idea of the intonation and pronunciation which uncle remus brought to bear upon this wonderful word those who can recall to mind the peculiar gurgling jerking liquid sound made by pouring water from a large jug or the sound produced by throwing several stones in rapid succession into a pond of deep water may be able to form a very faint idea of the sound but it cannot be reproduced in print the little boy was astonished what did you say uncle remus i do murker come murker i do murker come murker what's that that's terrypin talk dat is bless your soul honey continued the old man brightening up when you get old as me when you see what i sees and year what i hears the creatures that you can't talk with'll be mighty scarce they will dat why there's the old gray rat what uses boucher and time after time he come out when you all done gone to bed and sets up dar in the corner and dozes and me and him talks by the hour and what dat old rat dun know ain't down in de spelling book just now when you run in and broke me up i was fetchin into my mind what brer terrapin say to brer fox when he turn him loose in de branch what did he say uncle remus dat what he said i do murker come murker brer terrapin was at de bottom of de pond and he talked back he did in bubbles i do murker come murker brer fox he ain't saying nothing but brer bullfrog sitting on de bank he hear brer terrapin he did and he holler back jug a rum come dum jug a rum come dum den brer frog holler out needy needy den old brer bullfrog he holler back don't you believe him don't you believe him den de bubbles come up from brer terrypin i do murker come murker then brer frog sing out wait in wait in then old brer bullfrog talk through his hoarseness dar you'll find your brother dar you'll find your brother sho sure nuff brer fox look over de bank he did and dere was another fox looking at him out of the water den he retch out for to shake hands and in he went heels over head and brer terrapin bubble out i do murker come murker was the fox drowned uncle remus asked the little boy he warn't exactly drowned honey replied the old man with an air of cautious reserve he did manage fur to scramble out but a little more and a mud turkle would have got him and den he'd er been made hash a world without end end of chapter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this recording is by mark smith of simpsonville south carolina uncle remus by joel chandler harris chapter fifteen mr fox goes a-hunting but mr rabbit backs the game atter brer fox hear bout how brer rabbit done brer wolf said uncle remus scratching his head with the point of his awl he low he did dat he better not be so brash and he sort of let brer rabbit alone they was old times seeing one another in abundance of times brer fox could er nab brer rabbit but every time he got the chance his mind had sort of resume about brer wolf and he let brer rabbit alone by and by they gun to get kinder familiar with one another like the euster and it got so brer fox had call on brer rabbit and they'd set up and smoke their pipes they would like no hosh feelings ever rested twixt em last one day brer fox come long all rig out and axed brer rabbit fer to go huntin with him but brer rabbit 
He sorter feel lazy, en he tell Brer Fox dat he got some udder fish fer ter fry. Brer Fox feel mighty sorry, he did, but he say he believe he'd try his hand anyhow, and off he put. He was gone all day, and he had a monstrous streak of luck, Brer Fox did, and he bagged a sight of game. By and by, towards the shank of the evening, Bear Rabbit sort of stretch himself, he did, and allow it's most time for Bear Fox for to get long home. Then Bear Rabbit, he went and mounted a stump for to see if he could hear Bear Fox coming. He ain't been there long, for sure enough, here come Bear Fox through the woods, singing like a nigger at a frolic. Bear Rabbit, he lipped down off'n the stump, he did, and lay down in the road and make like he dead. Brer Fox, he come along, he did, and see Brer Rabbit lying there. He turn him over, he did, and examine him, and say, says he, Dish year Rabbit's dead. He look like he'd been dead long time. He dead, but he mighty fat. He the fattest rabbit what I ever see. But he been dead too long, I feared to take him home, says he. Brer Rabbit ain't saying nothing. Brer Fox, he sort of lick his chops. But he went on, and left Brer Rabbit laying in the road. Directly he was out of sight, Brer Rabbit, he jump up, he did, and run round through the woods, and get before Brer Fox again. Brer Fox, he come up, and dar lay Brer Rabbit, apparently cold and stiff. Brer Fox, he look at Brer Rabbit, and he sort of study. After a while, he unslung his game bag, and say to herself, says he, These yer rabbits gwine to waste. I'll just about leave my game here, and I'll go back and get that other rabbit, and I'll make folks believe that I'm old man hunter from Huntsville, says he. And with that, he dropped his game and loped back up the road after the other rabbit. But when he got out of sight, old Br'er Rabbit, he snatched up Br'er Fox's game and put out for home. Next time he see Br'er Fox, he holler out, "'What you killed the other day, Br'er Fox?' says he. Then Br'er Fox, he sort of comb his flank with his tongue and holler back, "'I caught a handful of hard sense, Br'er Rabbit,' says he. Then old Br'er Rabbit, he laugh, he did, and up and respond, says he, If I'd a knowed you was after that, Br'er Fox, I'd a loaned you some of mine, says he. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Chapter 16 Old Mr. Rabbit, he's a good fisherman. Brer Rabbit and Brer Fox was like some chillin' what I knows of, said Uncle Remus, regarding the little boy who had come to hear another story with an affectation of great solemnity. Both of em always was after one another, in prankin' and a pesterin' round. But Br'er Rabbit did have some peace, cause Br'er Fox done got skittish about puttin' the clamps on Br'er Rabbit. One day, when Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Fox and Br'er Coon and Br'er Bar and a whole lot of em was clearin' up a new ground for to plant our roastin' ear patch, the sun gun to get sort of hot, and Br'er Rabbit he got tired, but he didn't let on, cause he feared the balance of him would call him lazy, and he keep on toting off trash and piling up brush, twill by and by he holler out that he got a briar in his hand, and then he take and slip off and hunt for a cool place for the rest. After a while he come across a well with a bucket hanging in it. Oh, dat look cool, said Br'er Rabbit, says he. And cool I spec she is. I just about get in dar and take a nap. And with dat he jump, 
he did, and, and no sooner fix himself than the bucket gun to go down. "'Wasn't the rabbit scared, Uncle Remus?' asked the little boy. "'Honey, they ain't been no wusser scared beast since the world begin than this year same Br'er Rabbit. He fairly had an agur. He know where he come from, but he don't know where he going. Directly he feel the bucket hit the water, and dar she saw it. But Br'er Rabbit he keep mighty still, cause he done her what minute gwine to be his next. He just lay dar and shook and shiver. Br'er Fox always got one eye on Br'er Rabbit, and when he slip off from the new ground, Br'er Fox he sneak after him. He know Br'er Rabbit was after some project or another, and he took and crope off, he did, and watch him. Br'er Fox see Br'er Rabbit come to the well and stop, and then he see him jump in the bucket, and then, lo and behold, he see him go down out of sight. Br'er Fox was the most astonished fox that you ever laid eyes on. He sot dar in the bushes, in study, in study, but he don't make no head nor tails to this kind of business. Then he say to himself, says he, Well, if this don't bang my times, says he, then Joe's dead and Sal's a widder. Right down dar and dat well, Br'er Rabbit keep his money hid, and if tain't dat, then he gone and skivered a gold mine, and if tain't dat, then I'm a going to see what's in dar, says he. Br'er Fox crope up a little nigher, he did, and listen, but he don't hear no fuss, and he keep on getting nigher, and yet he don't hear nothing. By and by, he get up close and peep down, and he don't see nothing, and he don't hear nothing. All this time Br'er Rabbit mighty nigh skeered out in his skin, and he feared fur to move, cause the bucket might keel over and spill him out in the water. While he was saying his prayers over like a train or cars coming, old Br'er Fox holler out, Hey, yo, Br'er Rabbit, what you visiting down dar? says he. Who, me? Oh, I'm just fishing, Br'er Fox, says Br'er Rabbit, says he. I just say to myself that I'd sort of surprise you all with a mess of fishes for dinner, and so here I is, and dar's the fishes. I'm a fishing for suckers, Br'er Fox, says Br'er Rabbit, says he. Is de many um down there, Br'er Rabbit, says Br'er Fox, says he. Oh, lots of em, Br'er Fox, schools and schools of em. The water is naturally live with em. Come on down and help me haul em out, Br'er Fox, said Br'er Rabbit, says he. How am I gwine to get down, Br'er Rabbit? Jump into the bucket, Br'er Fox. He'll fetch you down all safe and sound. Br'er Rabbit talked so happy and talked so sweet that Br'er Fox he jump in the bucket, he did, and as he went down, cause his weight pulled Br'er Rabbit up. When he passed one another on the halfway growl, Br'er Rabbit, he sing out, Goodbye, Br'er Fox, take care of your clothes, for this is the way the world goes. Some goes up and some goes down. You get to the bottom all safe and sound. When Br'er Rabbit got out, he galloped off and told the folks what the well belonged to her, that Br'er Fox was down in there muddying up their drinking water, and then he galloped back to the well and holler down to Br'er Fox. Here come a man with a great big gun. When he haul you up, you jump and run. Oh, what then, Uncle Remus? asked the little boy as the old man paused. In just about half an hour, honey, both of them was back in the new ground, working just like they never hear to know well, seppin' that every now and then Br'er Rabbit bust out and laugh. And old Bear Fox, he'd get a speller to dry grins. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Chapter 17. Mr. Rabbit Nibbles Up the Butter. The animals and the creatures, said Uncle Remus, shaking his coffee around in the bottom of his tin cup, in order to gather up all the sugar. They kept on getting more and more familiars with one another, till so by and by. Twasn't long for Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Fox, and Br'er Possum got to sort of bunchin' their perwishins together in the same shanty. After a while the roof sort of gunter leak, and one day Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Fox and Br'er Possum, they assemble for to see if they can't kinder patch her up. They had a big day's work in front of em, and they fotched a dinner with em. They lumped the vittles up in one pile, and the butter what Br'er Fox brung, they goes and puts in the spring house for to keep cool, and then they went to work, and twa'n't long for Br'er Rabbit's stomach begun to sort of growl and pester him. That butter Br'er Fox sought heavy on his mind, and his mouth water every time he member about it. Presently he say to himself that he bleeds to have a nip at that dip butter, and then he lay his plans, he did. First news you know, while they was all working along. Br'er Rabbit raise his head quick, and fling his ears forward, and holler out, Here I is, what you want with me? And off he put like something was after him. He sallied round, old Br'er Rabbit did, and after he make sure that nobody ain't follerin' him, enter the spring house he bounces and dar he stays twill he get a bait or butter. Then he saunter on back and go to work. "'Where you been?' said Br'er Fox, says he. "'I hear my chillins callin' me,' said Br'er Rabbit, says he, "'and I had to go see what they want. My old woman done got em tuck mighty sick,' says he. They work on twill by and by the butter tastes so good that old Br'er Rabbit wants some more. Then he raise up his head, he did, and holler out, "Hey yo, hold on, I'm coming!" And off he put. This time he stay right smart while, and when he get back, Br'er Fox ax him where he been. "I been to see my old woman, and she's a sinkin," says he. Directly Br'er Rabbit hear him callin' him again, and off he goes. And this time, bless your soul, he gets the butter out so clean that he can see himself in the bottom of the bucket. He scrape it clean and lick it dry, and then he go back to work lookin' more summer than a nigger what the patrollers had a holt on. "'How's your old woman this time?' says Br'er Fox, says he. "'I'm obliged to you, Br'er Fox,' says Br'er Rabbit, says he. "'But I'm afeard she's done gone by now.' And that sort of make Br'er Fox and Br'er Possum feelin' moanin' with Br'er Rabbit. By and by, when dinner time come, they all got out to vittles, but Br'er Rabbit keep on lookin' lonesome, and Br'er Fox and Br'er Possum they sort of rustle round for to see if they can't make Br'er Rabbit feel sort of splimmy. What's that, Uncle Remus? asked the little boy. Sort of splimmy splammy, honey, sort of like he in a crowd, sort of like his old woman ain't dead as she might be. You know how folks does when it gets where a people's a moanin. The little boy didn't know, fortunately for him, and Uncle Remus went on. Br'er Fox and Br'er Possum rustled round, they did, getting out the vittles. And by and by Br'er Fox he say, says he, Br'er Possum, you run down to the spring and fetch the butter, and I'll sell round ear and set the table, says he. Br'er Possum, he lope off after the butter, and directly here he come loping back with his ears a tremblin' and his tongue a hangin' out. Br'er Fox, he holler out, "'What the matter now, Br'er Possum?' says he. "'You all better run here, folks,' says Br'er Possum, says he. "'The last drop of dat butter done gone!' "'Where's she gone?' said Br'er Fox, says he. "'Look like she dry up,' said Br'er Possum, says he. Then Br'er Rabbit, he looked sort of solemn, he did, and he up and say, says he, 
I speck that butter melt in somebody mouth, says he. Then they went down to the spring with Brer Possum, and show sure enough the butter done gone. Whilst they was sputin' over dat wonderment, Brer Rabbit say he see tracks all round dar, and he point out that if they all go to sleep he can catch the chap which stole the butter. Then they all lie down, and Brer Fox and Brer Possum they soon dropped off to sleep. But Brer Rabbit he stay awake, and when the time come he raise up easy and smear Brer Possum mouth with the butter on his paws, and then he run off and nibble up the best of the dinner what they left laying out. And then he come back and wake up Brer Fox, and show him the butter on Brer Possum mouth. Then they wake up Brer Possum and tell him about it. But of course Brer Possum's the denying it to the last. Brer Fox, though, he's a kinder lawyer, and he argified this way, that Brer Possum was the first one at the butter, and the first one fur to miss it, and more'n dat, there hang the signs on his mouth. Brer Possum see that they got him jammed up in the corner, and then he up and say that the way fur to catch the man what stole the butter is to build a big brush heap and set her afire, and all hands try to jump over, and the one what fall in, then he the chap which stole the butter. Brer Rabbit and Brer Fox, they is both agreed, they did, and they whirl in, they build that brush heap, and they build her high, and they build her wide, and then they touch her off. When she got to blazing up good, Brer Rabbit, he took the first turn. He sort of stepped back, look round, and giggle, and over he went more samer than a bird flying. Then come Brer Fox. He got back a little further, and spit on his hands, and lit out and made the jump, and he come so nigh getting in that the end of his tail caught fire. Ain't you never seen no fox, honey? inquired Uncle Remus in a tone that implied both conciliation and information. The little boy thought probably he had, but he wouldn't commit himself. Well, then, continued the old man, next time you see one of em, you look right close and see if the end of his tail ain't white. It's just like I tell you. They bars the scar that brush heap down to this day. They are marked. That's what they is. They are marked. And what about Brother Possum? asked the little boy. Old Brer Possum, he took a running start, he did, and he come lumbering along, and he lit kerblam right in the middle of that fire, and that was the last of old Brer Possum. But Uncle Remus, Brother Possum didn't steal the butter after all, said the little boy, who was not at all satisfied with such summary injustice. That what make I say what I does, honey. In this world, lots of folks has got to suffer for the other folks' sins. Look like it's mighty wrong, but it's that way. Tribulations seem like she's a waiting round the corner fur to catch one and all of us, honey. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Chapter 18 Mr. Rabbit Finds His Match at Last It looked like to me that I let on the other night that in dim days when the creatures was sauntering round same like folks, "'None of em was brash enough for to catch up with Br'er Rabbit,' remarked Uncle Remus reflectively. "'Yes,' replied the little boy. "'That's what you said.' "'Well, then,' continued the old man with unction, "'there's where my membrance get out, "'cause Br'er Rabbit did get cotched up with, "'and it cool him off like pouring spring water "'on one of these year biggity fasces.' "'How was that, Uncle Remus?' asked the little boy. 
One day, when Brer Rabbit was going lippity clippitin down de road, he meet up wid old Brer Terrapin, and atter de pass de time of day wid one another, Brer Rabbit, he allowed dat he was much obliged to Brer Terrapin for de hand he took in de rumpus that they had down at Miss Meadows's. "'When he dropped off of the water-shelf on the fox's head,' suggested the little boy. "'That's the same time, honey. Then Brer Terrapin loud at Brer Fox run mighty fast that day, but dat if he'd had been after him instead of Brer Rabbit, he'd have caught him. Brer Rabbit say he could have caught him himself, but he didn't care about leaving de ladies.' They keep on talkin', they did, twill by and by. They got a disputin' about which was the swiftest. Brer Rabbit, he say he can outrun Brer Terrapin, and Brer Terrapin, he just vowed that he can outrun Brer Rabbit. And up and down they had it, twill first news you know, Brer Terrapin say he got a fifty-dollar bill in the chink of the chimbley at home and dat Bill done told him that he could beat Brer Rabbit in a fire race. Then Brer Rabbit say he got a fifty-dollar bill, what say that he can leave Brer Terrapin so fur behind, that he could sow barley as he went along, and he'd be ripe enough for to cut by the time Brer Terrapin passed that way. Anyhow, they make the bet, and he put up the money, and old Brer Tucky Buzzard, he was summoned for to be the judge and the stakeholder, and twa'n't long for all the arrangements was made. The race was a five-mile heat, and the ground was measured off, and at the end of every mile a post was stuck up. Brer Rabbit was to run down the big road, and Brer Terrapin, he say he galloped through the woods. Folks told him he could get long faster in the row, but old Brer Terrapin, he know what he doin'. Miss Meadows and the gals, and most all the neighbors, got wind of the fun, and when the day was sot, they determined fur to be on hand. Brer Rabbit, he train himself every day, and he skip over the ground just as gaily as a June cricket. Old Brer Terrapin, he lay low in the swamp. He had a wife and three chillins, old Brer Terrapin did, and they was all the very spittin' image of the old man. Anybody what know one from the other got to take a spyglass, and then they're liable for to get fooled. That's the way Martyr stand will day of the race, and on that day old Brer Terrapin and his old woman and his three chillins, they got up for sun-up, and went to the place. The old woman, she took her stand nigh the first mile-post she did, and the chillins nigh the others, up to the last, and there old Brer Terrapin, he took his stand. By and by, here come the folks. Judge Buzzard, he come, and Miss Meadows and the gals, they come. And then here come Brer Rabbit with ribbons tied round his neck and streaming from his ears. The folks all went to the other end of the track for to see how they come out. When the time come, Judge Buzzard strut round and pull out his watch and holler out, "'Gents, is you ready?' Brer Rabbit, he say, "'Yes,' and old Miss Terrapin holler, "'Go!' from the edge of the woods. Brer Rabbit, he lit out on the race, and old Miss Terrapin, she put out for home. Judge Buzzard, he riz and skimmed long for to see that the race was run far. When Brer Rabbit got to the first mile post, one of the Terrapin chillins crawl out of the woods, he did, and make for the place. Brer Rabbit, he holler out, "'Where's you, Brer Terrapin?' Here I come a bulging, says the parapin, says he. Brer Rabbit so glad he's ahead that he put out harder than ever, and the terrapin 
he make for home. When he come to the next post, another terrapin crawl out of the woods. "'Where is you, Brer Terrapin?' says Brer Rabbit, says he. "'Here I come a bilin', says the terrapin, says he. Brer Rabbit, he lit out, he did, and come to the next post, and there was another terrapin. Then he come to the next, and there was a terrapin. Then he had one more mile for the run, and he feel like he gettin' bullust. By and by, old Brer Terrapin look way off down the road, and he see Judge Buzzard sailin' long, and he know it's time for him to be up. So he scramble out of the woods, and roll across the ditch, and shuffle through the crowd of folks, and get to the mile posts, and crawl behind it. By and by, first news you know, here comes Brer Rabbit. He look round, he don't see Brer Terrapin, and then he squall out, Give me the money, Brer Buzzard, give me the money. Then Miss Meadows and the gals, they holler and laugh fit to kill of themselves. And old Brer Terrapin, he raise up from behind the post and says, says he, If you give me time fur to catch my breath, gents and ladies, one and all, I speck I'll finger dat money myself, says he. And sure enough, Brer Terrapin tied a purse round his neck and skedaddle off home. But Uncle Remus, said the little boy dolefully, that was cheating. Course, honey, the creature's gun to cheat, and the folks tuck it up, and it keep on spreadin'. It might a catchin', and you mind yo eye, honey, that somebody don't cheat you for your hair get gray as dis old niggers. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Chapter 19 The Fate of Mr. Jack Sparrow. You'll trample on that bark twill it won't be fitten fur to fling away, let low make hoss collars outen, said Uncle Remus, as the little boy came running into his cabin out of the rain. All over the floor long strips of wahoo bark were spread, and these the old man was weaving into horse collars. I'll sit down, Uncle Remus, said the little boy. Well, then, you better, honey, responded the old man. "'Cause I despises for to have my wahoo trampled on. "'If twas shucks now, it might be different, "'but I'm a-gettin' too old for to be projectin' longer shuck collars.' "'For a few minutes the old man went on with his work, "'but with a solemn air altogether unusual. "'Once or twice he sighed deeply, "'and the sighs ended in a prolonged groan "'that seemed to the little boy to be the result of the most unspeakable mental agony. He knew by experience that he had done something which failed to meet the approval of Uncle Remus, and he tried to remember what it was, so as to frame an excuse, but his memory failed him. He could think of nothing he had done calculated to stir Uncle Remus's grief. He was not exactly seized with remorse, but he was very uneasy. Presently Uncle Remus looked at him in a sad and hopeless way, and asked, "'What dat long rigmarole you been telling Miss Sally about your little brer this morning?' "'Which, Uncle Remus?' asked the little boy, blushing guiltily. "'That just what I's asking of you now. I hear Miss Sally say she's a-going to stripe his jacket, and then I knowed you been telling on him. Well, Uncle Remus, he was pulling up your onions, and then he went and flung a rock at me," said the child plaintively. "Let me tell you this," said the old man, laying down the section of horse collar he had been plaiting, and looking hard at the little boy. 
Let me tell you dis, dat there ain't no way for to make tattlers and tailbearers turn out good. No, they ain't. I've been mixin' up with folks now gwine on eighty year, and I ain't see no tattler come to no good in. Dat I ain't. And if old man Methuselah was livin' clean twill yet, he'd up and tell you the same. Show as you a sittin' there. You remember what come of the bird what went a tattlin' round bout Br'er Rabbit? The little boy didn't remember, but he was very anxious to know, and he also wanted to know what kind of a bird it was that so disgraced itself. It was one of these year uppity little jack sparrows, I speck, said the old man. They was all as bothering longer other people's business, and they keeps at it down to dis day, peckin' year, peckin' dar, scratchin' out yonder. One day, after he'd been fooled by old Br'er Terrapin, Br'er Rabbit was sittin' down in de woods, studyin' how he was goin' to get even. He feel mighty lonesome, and he feel mighty bad, Br'er Rabbit did. Tain't put down in detail, but I spect he cussed and rared round considerable. Leastways, he was settin' out there by himself, and dare he sought, and study, and study, to a by and by, he jump out and holler out, Well, doggone my cats if I can't gallop round old Br'er Fox! and I'm going to do it. I'll show Miss Meadows and the gals that I'm a boss of Br'er Fox, says he. Jack Sparrow up in the tree. He hear Br'er Rabbit, he did, and he sing out, I'm going to tell Br'er Fox, I'm going to tell Br'er Fox, chicka bitty wind a blowing acorns falling, I'm going to tell Br'er Fox. Uncle Remus accompanied the speech of the bird with a peculiar whistling sound in his throat that was a marvellous invitation of a sparrow's chirp, and the little boy clapped his hands with delight, and insisted on a repetition. This kind of terrified Br'er Rabbit, and he scarcely know what he gwine do. But by and by he studied to himself that the man would see Br'er Fox first was bound to have the intern, and then he go hopping off towards home. He didn't get fur when who should he meet but Br'er Fox, and then Br'er Rabbit he open up. What this twixt you and me, Br'er Fox? said Br'er Rabbit, says he. I hear tell you going to send me to destruction and nab my family and destroy my shanty, says he. Then Br'er Fox he get mighty mad. Who been telling you all dis? says he. Br'er Rabbit make like he didn't want to tell, but Br'er Fox he insist and insist, till at last Br'er Rabbit he up and tell Br'er Fox that he hear Jack Sparrow say all this. Course, said Br'er Rabbit, says he, when Br'er Jack Sparrow tell me that I flew up, I did, and I used some language what I mighty glad to want no ladies round no wires, so they could hear me go on, says he. Br'er Fox, he sort of gap, he did, and say he speck he better be saunterin' on. But bless your soul, honey, Br'er Fox ain't saunter fur, for old Jack Sparrow flip down on a persimmon bush by the side of the road and holler out, Br'er Fox, oh Br'er Fox, Br'er Fox. Br'er Fox, he just sort of canter along, he did, and make like he don't hear him. Then Jack Sparrow up and sing out again, Br'er Fox! Oh, Br'er Fox! Hold on, Br'er Fox! I got some news for you. Wait, Br'er Fox! It'll astonish you. Br'er Fox, he make he make like he don't see Jack Sparrow, and neither do he hear him. But by and by he lay down by the road and sort of stretch himself like he fix him for the nap. The tattling Jack Sparrow, he flew long, and kept on calling Br'er Fox, but Br'er Fox, he ain't saying nothing. Then little Jack Sparrow, he hopped down on the ground and fluttered round amongst the trash. This sort of distract Br'er Fox's attention, and look at the tattling bird, 
and the bird he keep on a callin', I got something for to tell you, Brer Fox. Get on my tail, little Jack Sparrow, said Brer Fox, says he, cause I'm deaf in one ear, and I can't hear out of the udder. Get on my tail, says he. Then the little bird he up and hop on Brer Fox's tail. Get on my back, little Jack Sparrow, cause I'm deaf in one ear, and I, I can't hear out of the udder. Then the little bird hop on his back. Hop on my head, little Jack Sparrow, cause I'm deaf in both ears. And hop up the little bird. Hop on my tooth, little Jack Sparrow, cause I'm deaf in one ear, and I can't hear out of the udder. The tattling little bird, he hop on Brer Fox's tooth, and den here uncle remus paused opened wide his mouth and closed it again in a way that told the whole story did the fox eat the bird all all up asked the little boy jedge bar come along next day replied uncle remus and he find some fetters and from dat word went round at old man squinch out and caught another What's his name? End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Chapter 20. How Mr. Rabbit Saved His Meat One time, said Uncle Remus, wetting his knife slowly and thoughtfully on the palm of his hand, and gazing reflectively in the fire. One time, Brer Wolf. Why, Uncle Remus, the little boy broke in. I thought you said the rabbit scalded the wolf to death a long time ago. The old man was fairly caught, and he knew it but this made little difference to him. A frown gathered on his usually serene brow as he turned his gaze upon the child, a frown in which both scorn and indignation were visible. Then all at once he seemed to regain control of himself. The frown was chased away by a look of Christian resignation. "'Dare now, what did I tell you?' he exclaimed as if addressing a witness concealed under the bed. Ain't I ton told you so? Bless gracious! If chillins ain't gettin' so, day knows more'n old folks, and they'll dispute you longer and dispute longer, exceptin' your ma call em, which I spec won't be long for she will, and then I'll sit here by the chimney corner and get some peace of mind. When all Miss was livin', continued the old man, still addressing some imaginary person. It is more than any of her chillins a dare to do to come disputin' long of me, and Mars John'll tell you the same any day you ax him. Well, Uncle Remus, you know you said the rabbit poured hot water on the wolf and killed him, said the little boy. The old man pretended not to hear. He was engaged in searching among some scraps of leather under his chair, and kept on talking to the imaginary person. Finally, he found and drew forth a nicely plated whip-thong, with a red snapper all waxed and knotted. "'I was fixin' up a whip for a little chap,' he continued with a sigh. "'But, bless gracious, fore I can get her done, the little chap done growed up twill he knew more'n I does.' Child's eyes filled with tears, and his lips began to quiver, but he said nothing whereupon Uncle Remus immediately melted. "'I declare to goodness,' he said, reaching out and taking the little boy tenderly by the hand, "'if you ain't the very spittin' image of Ole Miss when I brung her to the last news of the war. It's just like scaring up a ghost what you ain't feared of.' Then there was a pause, the old man patting the little child's hand caressingly. "'You ain't mad, is you, honey?' Uncle Remus asked finally. "'Cause if you is, 
I'm gwine out here and butt my head against the dough jam. But the little boy wasn't mad. Uncle Remus had conquered him, and he had conquered Uncle Remus in pretty much the same way before. But it was some time before Uncle Remus could go on with the story. He had to be coaxed. At last, however, he settled himself back in the chair and began. "'Course, honey, it might have been old Brer Wolf, or it might have been ne'er Brer Wolf. It might have been fore he got caught up with. It might have been afterwards. Is the tale were going to me dis dat away, I get it unto you. One time, Brer Wolf was coming long home from a fishing frolic. He sauntered along the road, he did, with his string of fish cross his shoulder, when first news you know, old Miss Partridge, she hop out of the bushes and flutter long right at Brer Wolf's nose. Brer Wolf, he say to himself that old Miss Partridge tryin' fur to toll him away from her nest, and with that he lays fish down and put out into the bushes where old Miss Partridge come from. And about that time, Brer Rabbit, he happened along. There was the fishes. And there was Brer Rabbit, and when dat the case, what you spect a sort of independent man like Brer Rabbit going to do? I could tell you this: the dim fishes ain't stay where Brer Wolf put em at, and when Brer Wolf come back, they was gone. Brer Wolf, he sot down and scratch his head, he did, and study and study and then hit sort of rush into his mind that Brer Rabbit been long there, and then Brer Wolf, he put out for Brer Rabbit's house, and when he get there, he hail him. Brer Rabbit, he dunno know nothing at all about no fishes. Brer Wolf, he up and say he bleased to believe that Brer Rabbit got them fishes. Brer Rabbit denied up and down. But Brer Wolf stand to it that Brer Rabbit got them fishes. Brer Rabbit, he say that if Brer Wolf believe he got the fishes, then he give Brer Wolf leave fur to kill the best cow he got. Brer Wolf, he took Brer Rabbit at his word and go off to the pasture and drive up the cattle and kill Brer Rabbit's best cow. Brer Rabbit. He hate mighty bad for to lose his cow, but he lays plans, and he tell his chillins that he gwine to have dat beef yit. Brer Wolf, he been tuck up by the patrol this fall now, and he might have scared of him, and fust news you know, here come Brer Rabbit hollering and telling Brer Wolf that the patrollers are coming. You run and hide, Brer Wolf, says Brer Rabbit, says he. And I'll stay here and take care of the cow till you get back, says he. Soon as Brer Wolf hear talk of patrollers, he scramble off into the underbrush like he'd been shot out of the gun. And he wa'n't more'n gone for Brer Rabbit. He whirl in and skint the cow and salt the hide down, and then he tuck and cut up the carcass and stow it away in the smokehouse. And then he took and stick the end of the cow tail in the ground. After he gone and done all this, then Brer Rabbit he squall out for Brer Wolf. Run here, Brer Wolf, run here. Your cow gone in the ground. Run here. When old Brer Wolf got there, which he come her scootin', there was Brer Rabbit holdin' on to the cow tail, fur to keep it from going in the ground. Brer Wolf, he cotch holt, and they give a pull or two, and up come de tail. Then Brer Rabbit, he wink his off eye, and say, says he, There! The tail done pull out, and the cow gone, says he. But Brer Wolf, he weren't the man fur to give it up dat away, and he got him a spade, and a pickaxe, and a shovel, and he dig and dig for dat cow, twid dickin' was past all endurance. And old Brer Rabbit, he sot up dar in his front porch, and he smoked a cigar. Every time old Brer Wolf stuck the pickaxe in the clay, Brer Rabbit, he giggled to his chillins. He diggy, 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 but no meat there. 
he dicky 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 been no meat there cause all the time de cow was layin' pile up in his smokehouse and him and his chillins was eatin' fry beef and innards every time de mouth water now den honey you take dis here whip continued the old man twining the leather thong around the little boy's neck and scamper up to the big house and tell miss sally for to give you some of it next time she finds your tracks in the sugar barrel End of chapter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this recording is by mark smith of simpsonville south carolina uncle remus by joel chandler harris chapter 21 mr rabbit meets his match again there was another man that sort of played shop on Br'er Rabbit, said Uncle Remus, as, by some mysterious process, he twisted a hog's bristle into the end of a piece of thread, an operation which the little boy watched with great interest. In dim days, continued the old man, the creatures carried on matters same like folks. They went into farming, and I expect if the truth was to come out, they kept store, and had the camp meeting times, and the barbecues when the weather was agreeable. Uncle Remus evidently thought that the little boy wouldn't like to hear of any further discomfiture of Br'er Rabbit, who had come to be sort of a hero, and he was not mistaken. "'I thought the terrapin was the only one that fooled the rabbit,' said the little boy dismally. "'It's just like I tell you, honey.' There ain't no smart man, cept that there's a smarter one. If old Br'er Rabbit hadn't er got caught up with, the neighbors would take him for a hunt, and in dem times they burnt witches for you could squint your eyeballs. They did that. Who fooled the rabbit this time? the little boy asked. When Uncle Remus had the bristle mm, sot in the thread, he proceeded with the story. One time Br'er Rabbit and old Br'er Buzzard cluded they'd sort of go shares and crap together. It was a mighty good year, and the truck turned out monstrous well. But by and by, when the time come for dividing it, it come to light that old Br'er Buzzard ain't got nothing. The crap was all gone, and they want nothing for to show for it. Br'er Rabbit he make like he was in a wuss fixin' Br'er Buzzard, and he mope round, he did, like he feared they gwine to sell him out. Br'er Buzzard, he ain't say nothin', but he keep up a monstrous thinkin', and one day he come long and holler and tell Br'er Rabbit that he done find rich gold mine just cross the river. You come and go longer with me, Br'er Rabbit says brer tucky buzzard says he i'll scratch and you can grabble and tween the two of us we'll make short work of that gold mine says he brer rabbit he was high up for the job but he study and study he did how he going to get cross the water cause every time he get his foot wet all the family cotch coal then he up and asked brer buzzard how he going to do Br'er Buzzard he up and say that he'd carry Br'er Rabbit cross. And with dat old Br'er Buzzard, he squat down, he did, and spread his wings, and Br'er Rabbit, he mounted, and up they riz. There was a pause. What did the Buzzard do then? asked the little boy. They riz, continued Uncle Remus, and when they lit, they lit in the top of the highest sort of pine, and the pine what they lit in was growing on the island, and the island was in the middle of the river, with the deep water running all round. They ain't more than lit for Br'er Rabbit he know which way the wind was blowing, and by the time old Br'er Buzzard got himself balanced on a limb, Br'er Rabbit, he up and say, says he, Whilst we are restin' here, Br'er Buzzard, and bein's you been so good, I got something for to tell you. 
says he. I got a gold mine of my own, one what I make myself, and I spec we better go back to mine for we bought a longer yon, says he. Then old Brer Buzzard, he laugh, he did, twill he shake, and Brer Rabbit, he sing out, Hold on, Brer Buzzard, don't flop your wings when you laugh, cause then if you does, something'll drop from up here, and my gold mine won't do you no good, and neither will yon do me no good. But fore they got down from dar, Brer Rabbit done tore all bout the crap, and he had a promise for to provide fair and square. So Brer Buzzard, he carry him back, and Brer Rabbit, he walk weak in the knees for a month afterwards. End of tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Chapter 22 A Story About the Little Rabbits Find em where you will, and when you may, remarked Uncle Remus with emphasis. Good chillins always get took care on. There was old Brer Rabbit's chillins. They minded their daddy and mammy from the day's end to the day's end. When old man Rabbit say scoot, they scooted. And when old Miss Rabbit say scat, they scatted. They did that. And they kept the clothes clean. And they ain't had no smut on the nose, neither. Involuntarily, the hand of the little boy went up to his face, and he scrubbed the end of his nose with his coat sleeve. "'They was good chillins,' continued the old man heartily, "'and if they hadn't a been, there was one time when they wouldn't have been no little rabbits, near one, that's what.' "'What time was that, Uncle Remus?' the little boy asked. "'The time when Br'er Fox drapped in it, Brer Rabbit's house, and didn't find nobody there exceptin' the little rabbits. Old Brer Rabbit, he was off somewheres raidin' in a collared patch, and old Miss Rabbit, she was tendin' on a quiltin' in the neighborhood, and whilst the little rabbits was playin' hide and switch, in dropped Brer Fox. The little rabbits was so fat that they fairly make his mouth water, but he remembered about Brer Wolf and he's scared for to gobble em up, exceptin' he got some excuse. The little rabbits, they mighty skittish, and they sort of huddled theirself up to get her and watch Brer Fox's motions. Brer Fox, he sot there and study what sort of excuse he going to make up. By and by, he see a great big stalk of sugar cane standin' up in the corner, and he clear up his throat and talk biggity. Here! Yeah. You young rabs there, sail round here and break me off a piece of that there sweetening tree, says he, and then he cough. The little rabbits, they got out the sugar cane, they did, and they wrestle with it, and sweat over it, but twa'n't no use, they couldn't break it. Brer Fox, he make like he ain't watchin', but he keep on hollerin', Hurry up there, rabs, I'm a-waitin' on ya. And the little rabbits, they hustle round and wrestle with it, but they couldn't break it. By and by, they hear little birds singing on the top of the house, and the song what the little birds sing was this year. Take your toofies and gnaw it. Take your toofies and saw it. Saw it and yoke it, and then you can broke it. Then the little rabbits, they get mighty glad, and they gnawed the cane, most fo old Brer Fox get his legs uncrossed, and when they carried in the cane, Brer Fox, he sot there and study how he going to make some mo excuse for nabbing em. And by and by he get up and get down to sifter what was hanging on the wall, and holler out, Come here, Rabs, take this year sifter and run down to the spring and fetch me some fresh water. The little rabbits, they run down to the spring, and try to dip up the water with the sifter, but of course it all run out, and it keep on running out, 
Twill by and by de little rabbit sot down and begun to cry. Den de little bird sittin up in de tree he begin fer to sing, and dis year's de song while he sing. Sift her whole water same as a tray. If you fill it up with moss and dob it with clay, de fox get madder de longer you stay. Fill it with moss and dob it with clay. Up they jump, the little rabbits did, and they fixed the sifter so it won't leak, and then they carried the water back to old Br'er Fox. Then Br'er Fox, he get mighty mad, and point out a great big stick of wood, and tell the little rabbits fur to put that on the fire. The little chaps, they got round the wood, they did, and they lift at it so hard twill they could see their own sins, but the wood ain't budge. Then they hear the little bird singin', and this year's the song what he sang. Spit in your hands, and tuck it, and toll it, and get behind it, and push it, and pull it. Spit in your hands, and rear back, and roll it. And just about the time they got the wood on the fire, their daddy, he come skippin' in, and the little bird he flew away. Brer Fox, he seed his game was up, and twa'n't long fore we make excuse and start for to go. You better stay and take a snack with me, Brer Fox, says Brer Rabbit, says he. Since Brer Wolf done quite comin' and settin' up with me, I gettin' so I feels right lonesome these long nights, says he. But Brer Fox, he button up his coat collar tight and put out for home. And dat what you better do, honey, cause I see Miss Sally's shadder sailin' backwards and forwards fo the winder, and the fust news you know, she'll be spectin' of you. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Chapter 23 Mr. Rabbit and Mr. Bear There was one season, said Uncle Remus, pulling thoughtfully at his whiskers, when Br'er Fox say to hisself that he spec he better whirl in and plant a goober patch, and in dem days, mon, it was tetch and go. De word what moan out of his mouth, fo de ground was broke up, and de goobers was planted. Old Br'er Rabbit, he sought off and watched the motions he did, and he sort of shet one eye and sing to his chillins. Tie ye dungly, hide em pee, I pick em pee, hit crow in de ground, hit crow so free, tie ye dem goober pee. Show sure enough, when the goobers begun to ripen up, every time Br'er Fox go down to his patch, he find where somebody been grabbling amongst the vines, and he get mighty mad. He sort of speck who de somebody is, but old Br'er Rabbit he cover his tracks so cute that Br'er Fox don't know how to catch him. By and by, one day Br'er Fox take a walk all round de ground pea patch, and twa'n't long fore he find a crack in de fence where de rail done been rubbed right smooth, and right dar he sot him a trap. He took and bend down a hickory sapling growing in the fence corner, and tie one end of a plow line on the top, and in the other end he fix a loop knot, and that he fastened with a trigger right in the crack. Next morning, when old Br'er Rabbit come slipping long and crope through the crack, the loop knot caught him behind the foe legs, and the sapling flewed up. And dar he was, twixt the heavens and the earth. Dar he swung, and he feared he gwine ter fall, and he feared he wa'n't gonna fall. While he was a fixin' up a tail for Br'er Fox, he hear a lumberin' down de road, and presently here come old Br'er Bar amblin' long from where he'd been takin' a bee tree. 
Brer Rabbit, he hail him. Howdy, Brer Bar. Brer Bar, he look round, and by and by he see Brer Rabbit swinging from de sapling, and he holler out, Hey, yo, Brer Rabbit, how you come on this morning? Much obliged, I'm middling, Brer Bar, says Brer Rabbit, says he. Then Brer Bar, he asks Brer Rabbit, what he doin' up dar in de elements? And Brer Rabbit, he up and say he makin' dollar a minute. Brer Bar, he say, how? Brer Rabbit say he keepin' crows out of Brer Fox's ground pea patch. Then he asks Brer Bar if he don't want to make dollar a minute, cause he got a big family of chillins fur to take care of. And then he makes such nice scared crow. Brer Bar loud it he take the job, and then Brer Rabbit show him how to bend down de sapling, and twan't long fo' Brer Bar was swingin' up dar in Brer Rabbit's place. Then Brer Rabbit he put out for Brer Fox's house, and when he got dar he sing out, Brer Fox, oh Brer Fox, come out here, Brer Fox, and I'll show you the man what been stealin' your goobas. Brer Fox, he grab up his walking stick, and both of em went running back down to the goober patch, and when they got dar, sure enough, there was old Brer Bar. Oh, yes, you is got chisin ye, says Brer Fox, and before Brer Bar can explain, Brer Rabbit, he jump up and down, and holler out, Hit him in the mouth, Brer Fox, hit him in the mouth. And Brer Fox, he draw back with the walking cane, and blip, he took him. And every time Brer Bar tried to explain, Brer Fox shower down on him. While all this is going on, Brer Rabbit, he slip off and get in the mud hole, and just laugh till his eyes be sticking out, cause he knowed that Brer Bar be coming after him. Show sure enough, by and by, here come Brer Bar down the road, and when he get to the mud hole, he say, Howdy, Brer Frog, is you seed Brer Rabbit go by here? He just gone by, says Brer Rabbit, and old man Bar took off down the road like a skeered mule, and Brer Rabbit, he come out and dry hisself in his sun, and go home to his family same as any other man. The bear didn't catch the rabbit, then, inquired the little boy, sleepily. Jump up from dar, honey, exclaimed Uncle Remus by way of reply. I ain't got no time for to be settin' here proppin' your eyelids open. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Chapter 24 Mr. Bear Catches Old Mr. Bullfrog Well, Uncle Remus, said the little boy, counting to see if he hadn't lost a marble somewhere, the bear didn't catch the rabbit after all, did he? Now you're talking, honey replied the old man, his earnest face breaking up into little eddies of smiles. Now you're talking show. Tain't been pruned into no brer bar fur to cotch brer rabbit. <laughs> it's sort of like settin' a mule fur to trap a humming bird. But brer bar, he took and got himself into some mo trouble, which it looked like it mighty easy. If folks could make the living longer getting into trouble continued the old man, looking curiously at the little boy. Old Miss Favors wouldn't be bothering your ma for to borrow a cup full of sugar every now and then, and it looked like to me that I knows a nigger that wouldn't be squat round yer making these yer fish baskets. How did the bear get into more trouble, Uncle Remus? asked the little boy. Natural, honey. Brer Bar. He took a notion that old Brer Bullfrog was the man what fooled him, and he said that he'd come up with him if it was a year afterwards. But twa'n't no year, and twa'n't no month, and more'n that, 
It wa'n't scarcely a week, when by and by, one day Brer Bar was gwine home from de taking of a bee tree, and lo and beholds, who should he see but old Brer Bullfrog setting out on de edge of de mud muddle fast asleep. Brer Bar drop his axe, he did, and crope up, and retch out with his paw, and scoop old Brer Bullfrog in just dis away. Here the old man used his hand ladle fashion by way of illustration. He scoop him in, and dar he was. When Brer Bar got his clampers on him good, he sat down and talk at him. Howdy, Brer Bullfrog, howdy, and how your family? <laughs> I hope they are well, Brer Bullfrog, cause this day you got some business with me what'll last you a mighty long time. Brer Bullfrog, he dunno what to say. He dunno what's up. He don't say nothing. Old Bear Bar, he keep running on. You're the man what took and fool me about Brer Rabbit the other day. You had your fun, Brer Bullfrog, and now I get mine. Then Brer Bullfrog, he began to get scared, he did, and he up and say, what I been doing, Brer Bar? How I been fooling you? Then Brer Bar laugh and make like he dunno, but he keep on talking. Oh no, Brer Bullfrog, you ain't the man what stick your head up out of the water and tell me Brer Rabbit done gone on by. Oh no, you ain't the man. I'm bound you ain't. About that time you was at home with your family, where you always is. I dunno where you was, but I knows where you is, Brer Bullfrog, and it's you and me for it. After the sun goes down this day, you don't fool no more folks going along this road. Course, Brer Bullfrog dunno what Brer Bar driving at, but he knows something how to be done. And dat mighty soon, cause Brer Bar begun to snap his jaws together and foam at the mouth, and Brer Bullfrog holler out, Oh, pray, Brer Bar, let me off this time, and I won't never do so no more. Oh, pray, Brer Bar, do let me off this time, and I'll show you the fattest bee tree in the woods. Oh, Brer Bar, he chomp his toofies and foam at the mouth. Bear Bullfrog, he just up and squall. Oh, pray, Bear Bar, I won't never do so no more. Oh, pray, Bear Bar, let me out this time. But old Bear Bar say he gwine to make way with him, and then he sot and study. Old Bear Bar did. How he gwine to squinch Bear Bullfrog? He know he can't drown him, but he ain't got no fire for to burn him, and he get mighty pestered. By and by. Old Brer Bullfrog, he sort of stop his crying and his boo-hooing, and he up and say, If you're going to kill me, Brer Bar, carry me out there to that big flat rock out there on the edge of the mill pond where I can see my family, and after I see him, then you can take your axe and squish me. This looks so fair and square that Brer Bar he agree. And he take the old Brer Bullfrog by one of his behind legs and sling his axe on his shoulder, and off he put for the big flat rock. When he get dar, he lay Brer Bullfrog down on the rock, and Brer Bullfrog make like he looking round for his folks. Then Brer Bar, he draw a long breath and pick up his axe. Then he spit in his hands and draw back and come down on the rock. Pow! Did he kill the frog, Uncle Remus? asked the little boy, as the old man paused to scoop up a thimbleful of glowing embers in his pipe. Indeed, and dat he didn't, honey. Twixt the time when Bear Bar raise up with his axe, and when he come down with it, old Bear Bullfrog, he lipped up and dove down into the mill pond. Kerblink, kerblunk! And when he was way out in the pond, he riz a singin', and dish ears the song what he sing. 
Ingle go jang, my joy, my joy. Ingle go jang, my joy. I'm right at home, my joy, my joy. Ingle go jang, my joy. That's a mighty funny song, said the little boy. Funny now, I speck, said the old man. Which weren't funny in dem days, and wouldn't be funny now if folks knowed much about the wool-frog language as the Euster. That's what. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Chapter 25. How Mr. Rabbit Lost His Fine Bushy Tail. One time, said Uncle Remus, sighing heavily and settling himself back in his seat with an air of melancholy resignation. One time, Br'er Rabbit was going long down the road, shaking his big bushy tail, and feeling just as scrumptious as a bee martin with a fresh bug. Here the old man paused and glanced at the little boy, but it was evident that the youngster had become so accustomed to the marvellous developments of Uncle Remus's stories that the extraordinary statement made no unusual impression upon him. Therefore the old man began again, and this time in a louder and more insinuating tone. One time old man Rabbit, he was going long down the road, shaking his long bushy tail and feeling mighty biggity. This was effective. "'Great goodness, Uncle Remus!' exclaimed the little boy in open-eyed wonder. "'Everybody knows that rabbits haven't got long bushy tails!' The old man shifted his position in his chair, and allowed his venerable head to drop forward until his whole appearance was suggestive of the deepest dejection, and this was intensified by a groan that seemed to be the result of great mental agony. Finally he spoke, but not as addressing himself to the little boy. I notices that dem folks what makes a great admiration bout what they knows is just the folks which you can't put no dependence in when occasion come up. You're one of em now, and he done come and excuse me in allowin' that rabbits has got long bushy tails, which goodness knows if I'd a dreamt it, I'd a whirl in and undreamt it. Well, Uncle Remus, you said rabbits had long bushy tails, replied the little boy. Now you know you did. If I ain't forget it off in my mind, I say that old Br'er Rabbit was gwine down the big road shaking his long bushy tail. Dat what I say, and dat I stands by. The little boy looked puzzled, but he didn't say anything. After a while the old man continued. Now, den, if dat's greed to her, I'm going on. And if tain't greed to her, den I'm gwine to pick up my cane and look after my own interest. I got work lying round here dat's just naturally getting moldy. The little boy still remained quiet, and Uncle Remus proceeded. One day, Br'er Rabbit was going down the road shaking his long, bushy tail, when who should he strike up with but old Br'er Fox, gwine ambling along with a big string of fish. When he passed the time of day with one another, Br'er Rabbit, he opened up the confab, he did, and he asked Br'er Fox where he get that nice string of fish, and Br'er Fox, he up and respond that he caught him. Br'er Rabbit, he say, whereabouts? And Br'er Fox, he say, down at the baptizing creek. And Br'er Rabbit, he ax how. Cause in dem days, they was monstrous fonder minners. And Br'er Fox, he sot down on de log, he did. And he up and tell Br'er Rabbit that all he got to do for to get a big mess or minners is to go to the creek after sundown and drap his tail in de water, 
and set dar till daylight, and then draw up a whole armful of fishes, and dem what he don't want, he can fling back. Right dar's where Br'er Rabbit drap his water million, cause he took and sot out that night and went a-fishin. De weather was sort of cold, and Br'er Rabbit, he got him a bottle or dram in put out fur de creek, and when he got dar, he pick out a good place, and he sort of squat down, he did, and let his tail hang in de water. He sot dar, and he sot dar, and he drunk his dram, and he think he gwine freeze, but by and by day come, and dar he was. He make a pull, and he feel like he comin' in two, and he fetch another jerk, and lo and behold, where was his tail? There was a long pause. Did it come off, Uncle Remus? asked the little boy presently. She did dat, replied the old man with unction. She did dat, and dat what make all these year Bobdale rabbits what you see hoppin' and scattlin' through the woods. "'Are they all that way, just because the old rabbit lost his tail in the creek?' asked the little boy. "'That's it, honey,' replied the old man. "'That's what they tells me. Looks like they bleeds to take after de pa.'" End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Chapter 26 Mr. Terrapin Shows His Strength Brer Terrapin was the outness man, says Uncle Remus, rubbing his hands together contemplatively and chuckling to himself in a very significant manner. He was the outness man of the whole gang. He was dad. The little boy sat perfectly quiet, betraying no impatience when Uncle Remus paused to hunt, first in one pocket and then in another, for enough crumbs of tobacco to replenish his pipe. Presently the old man proceeded. One night Miss Meadows and the gals they begun a candy pullin', and so many of de neighbors came in in response to de invite that they had to put the lasses in de wash pot and bile the fire in de yard. Bear Bar, he hoped Miss Meadows bring de wood. Bear Fox, he mend de fire. Bear Wolf, he kept de dogs off. Bear Rabbit. He greased the bottom of the plates for to keep the candy from sticking, and Brer Terrapin, he clum up in a cheer and say he'd watch and see that the molasses don't bile over. They was all there, and they weren't cutting up no Dido's nutter, cause Miss Meadows she done put a foot down she did, and say that when they come to her place, they had to hang up a flag of truce at the front gate and a bye bye. Well, then, whiles they was all a settin' dar, and the lasses was a bilin and a blubberin, they got to runnin on talkin mighty biggity. Brer Rabbit, he say he de swiftest, but Brer Terrapin, he rock long into cheer and watch de lasses. Brer Fox, he say he de sharpest, but Brer Terrapin, he rock long. Brer Wolf, he say he the most savages, but Brer Terrapin, he rock and he rock long. Brer Bar, he say the most strongest, but Brer Terrapin, he rock and he just keep on rocking. By and by, he sort of shut one eye and say, says he, it look like apparently that the whole hard shell ain't no worse alongside this year crowd. Yet here I is, and I'm de same man what show Brer Rabbit that he ain't the swiftest, and I'm de same man what can show Brer Bar that he ain't the strongest, says he. Then they all laugh and holler, 
cause it looked like Brer Bar more stronger than a steer. By and by Miss Meadows, she up and axed, she did, how we goin' to do it. "'Give me a good strong rope,' says Brer Terrapin, says he, "'and let me get in a puddle of water, "'and then let Brer Bar see if he can pull me out,' says he. "'Then they all laugh again. "'Brer Bar, he ups and says, says he, "'We ain't got no rope,' says he. "'No,' says Brer Terrapin, says he, "'and neither is you got to strength says he, and then Brer Terrapin, he rock and rock long, and watched the molasses a boilin' and a blubberin'. After a while, Miss Meadows, she up and say, she did, that she'd take and loaned the young men her bed cord, and whilst the candy was a coolin' in the plates, take it all go to the branch, and see Brer Terrapin carry out his project. Brer Terrapin, continued Uncle Remus, in a tone at once confidential and argumentative. "'Wert much bigger more the palm of my hand, and look mighty funny fur to hear him bragging about how he can outpull Brer Bar, but they got the bed cord after a while, and then they all put out fur the branch. When Brer Terrapin find the place he water, he took one end of the bed cord and give the other end to Brer Bar.' "'Now, then, ladies and gents,' says Brer Terrapin, says he, "'you all go with Brer Bar up dar in the woods, and I'll stay here. "'And when you can hear me holler, "'then's the time for Brer Bar for to see if he can haul in the slack of the rope. "'You all take care of that there end,' says he, "'and I'll take care of this year end,' says he. Then they all put out and left Brer Terrapin at the branch, and when they got good and gone, he dove down into the water, he did, and tied a big core hard and fast to one of these year big clay roots, and then he riz up and give a whoop. Brer Bar, he ropped the big core round his hand and wink at the gals, and with that he give a big juck. But Brer Terrapin ain't budge. Then he take both hands and give a big pull. But all the same, Brer Terrapin ain't budge. Then he turn round, he did, and put the rope across his shoulders and try to walk off with Brer Terrapin. But Brer Terrapin look like he don't feel like walking. Then Brer Wolf, he put in and holp Brer Bar pull. But just like he didn't, and then they all hope em, and bless gracious, whilst it was all a pullin, Brer Terrapin he holler and ax em why they don't take up the slack. Then when Brer Terrapin feel em quit pullin, he dove down, he did, and untied the rope, and by the time they got to the branch, Brer Terrapin he was settin up on the edge of the water just as natural as the next un. And he up and say, says he, That last pull you done was a mighty stiffen, and a little more than you'd have me, says he. You're a monster stout, Brer Bar, says he, and you pulls like a yoke of steers, but I sort of had to purchase on you, says he. Then Brer Bar, being as his mouth gun to water after the sweetening, he up and say he specked the candy's ripe, and off they put after it. It's a wonder, said the little boy, after a while, that the rope didn't break. Break who? exclaimed Uncle Remus, with a touch of indignation in his tone. Break who? In dem days, Miss Meadows's bed corps could have hilt a mule. This put an end to whatever doubts the child might have entertained. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Chapter 27 Why Mr. Possum Has No Hair on His Tail. 
"'It looked like to me,' said Uncle Remus, frowning, as the little boy came hopping and skipping into the old man's cabin, "'Did I see a young un bout your size, playing and making free with dem our chillins or old Miss Favors yesterday? And when I see dat, I drap my axe, and I come in here and sot flat down right where you are sitting now, and I say to myself that it's bout time for old Remus for to hang up and quit. That's just exactly what I say. "'Well, Uncle Remus, they called me,' said the little boy, in a penitent tone. "'They come and called me, and said they had a pistol and some powder over there.' "'There now!' exclaimed the old man indignantly. "'There now! What I been saying! It's just a born blessing that you weren't brung home on a litter with both eyeballs hanging out, and one ear clean gone. That's what tis. It's just a born blessing.' It hoped me up mightily the other day when I hear Miss Sally laying down the law about you and dem favors, chillins. Yet, lo and behold, the first news I knows you is hand and glove with him. It's nuff for to fetch old Miss right up out of dat burying ground from down there in Putman County, and what your grandma wouldn't a stood, me and your ma ain't gwine to stand nutter. And the next time I hear about such a come off as this, right then and there, I'm bound to lay the case for Miss Sally. Them's favorses want no count for the war, and they want no count in doing the war, and they ain't no count afterwards. And whilst my head's hot, you ain't going to go mixing up yourself with the riff raff of creation. The little boy made no further attempt to justify his conduct. He was a very wise little boy, and he knew that, in Uncle Remus's eyes, he'd been guilty of a flagrant violation of the family code. Therefore, instead of attempting to justify himself, he pleaded guilty and promised that he would never do so any more. After this there was a long period of silence broken only by the vigorous style in which Uncle Remus puffed away at his pipe. This was the invariable result. Whenever the old man had occasion to reprimand the little boy, and the occasions were frequent, he would relapse into a dignified but stubborn silence. Presently the youngster drew forth from his pocket a long piece of candle. The sharp eyes of the old man saw it at once. "'Don't you come a-tellin' me that Miss Sally gun you that?' he exclaimed. "'Cause she didn't. And I lay you had to be monster sly for you got a chance for to snatch up that piece of kennel. "'Well, Uncle Remus,' the little boy explained, "'it was lying there all by itself, and I just thought I'd fetch it out to you.' "'That's so, honey,' said Uncle Remus, greatly mollified. "'That's so.' "'Cause by now some of dem yother niggers had a gone and had her lit up. "'They are mighty biggity, dem house niggers is, "'but I notices that they don't let nothin' pass. "'They goes long with their hands and the mouth open, "'and what one don't catch, the other one do.' "'There was another pause, and finally the little boy said, "'Uncle Remus?' You know you promised today to tell me why the possum has no hair on his tail. Law, honey, ain't you done and forgot that often your mind yet? It looked like to me, continued the old man, leisurely refilling his pipe, that she sort of run like this. One time old Br'er Possum, he get so hungry, he did, that he bleeds fur to have a mess of persimmons. He monstrous lazy man, old Br'er Possum was, for by and by his stomach begun to growl and holler at him so that he had to rack round and hunt up something. And whiles he was rackin' round, who should he meet up with but Br'er Rabbit? And they was hail fellers, cause Br'er Possum he ain't been botherin' Br'er Rabbit like them other creatures. They sot down by the side of the big road, and there they jabber and confab 
mongst one another. Twill by and by, old Brer Possum, he take and tell Brer Rabbit he most pesh out, and Brer Rabbit, he lip up in the air, he did, and smack his hands together, and say that he knew right where Brer Possum can get a bait of persimmons. Then Brer Possum, he say war, and Brer Rabbit, he say which twas over at Brer Bar's persimmon orchard. Did the bear have a persimmon orchard, Uncle Remus? the little boy asked. Co, sonny, cause in dem days Brer Bar was a bee hunter. He make his living findin' bee trees, and de way he find em, he plant em some persimmon trees, which de bees did come and suck de persimmons, and den old Brer Bar, he'd watch em where they go, and den he'd be mighty apt fur to come up with em. No matter about dat, de persimmon patch was there just like I tell ya, and old Brer Possum mouth begun to water, soon's he hear talk of em. And most full Brer Rabbit done tellin' him de news, Brer Possum, he put out, he did, and twa'n't long fore he was perch up in de highest tree in Brer Bar's persimmon patch. But Brer Rabbit, he done determinin' for to see some fun, and whiles all this was gwine on, he run round to Brer Bar's house, and holler and tell him which there was somebody destroyin' his persimmons and Brer Bar, he hustle off fur to catch him. Every now and then, Brer Possum think he year Brer Bar comin', but he keep on saying, says he, I'll just get one persimmon more, and then I'll go. One persimmon more, and then I'll go. Last, he hear Brer Bar comin' round show sure enough, which was the same old tune. One persimmon more, and then I'll go. And just about that time Brer Bar busted into the patch, and give the tree a shake, and Brer Possum, he drapped out longer de other ripe persimmons, and time he touched the ground he get his foots together, and he lit out fur the fence same as a race hoss, crossed that patch him, and Brer Bar had it, and Brer Bar gan every jump. Twill time Brer Possum make the fence, Brer Bar grab him by the tail. Brer Possum, he went out tween the rails and gin a powerful chuck and pull his tail out twixt Brer Bar's tushes. And lo and behold, Brer Bar holds so tight, Brer Possum pulls so hard, that all the har come off in Brer Bar's mouth, which, if Brer Rabbit hadn't er happen up with a gut of water, Brer Bar got to strangle. From that day to this, said Uncle Remus, knocking the ashes carefully out of his pipe, Brer Possum ain't had no har on his tail, and neither do his chillins. End of tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Chapter 28 The End of Mr. Bear The next time the little boy sought Uncle Remus out, he found the old man unusually cheerful and good-humored. His rheumatism had ceased to trouble him, and he was even disposed to be boisterous. He was singing when the little boy got near the cabin, and the child paused on the outside to listen to the vigorous but mellow voice of the old man as it rose and fell, with the burden of the curiously plaintive song, a senseless affair so far as the words were concerned, but sung to a melody almost thrilling in its sweetness. Hammer down my walking cane, hey, my lily, go down the road. Your true lover gone down the lane. Hey, my lily, go down the road. The quick ear of Uncle Remus, however, had detected the presence of the little boy, and he allowed his song to run into a recitation of nonsense, of which the following, if it be rapidly spoken, will give a faint idea. Old Mr. Jackson, finest confraction, fell down stars for to get satisfaction. 
Big Bill Frey, he ruled a day. Everything he called for come one, two, by three. One long one day met Johnny Hooby. Ax him grind nine yards of steel for me. Told me which he couldn't. Then I heist him over Hickerson Dickerson's barn doors, knock him ninety nine miles under water. When he rise, he rise in pike straddle on a hand spike, and I left him dar smokin' er the hornpipe. Juba Rita Seda Breda, Aunt Kate at the gate, I want to eat, she fry the meat and give me skin, which I fling it back again. Juba All this rattled off at a rapid rate and with apparent seriousness was calculated to puzzle the little boy, and he slipped into his accustomed seat with an expression of awed bewilderment upon his face. "'It's all just dat away, honey,' continued the old man, with the air of one who had just given an important piece of information. "'And when you've been casin' shatters long as de old nigger, then you'll find out who's which, and which is who.' The little boy made no response. He was in thorough sympathy with all the whims and humours of the old man, and his capacity for enjoying them was large enough to include even those he could not understand. Uncle Remus was finishing an axe-handle, and upon these occasions it was his custom to allow the child to hold one end while he applied sandpaper to the other. These relations were pretty soon established, to the mutual satisfaction of the parties most interested and the old man continued his remarks, but this time not at random. "'When I see dis year swellhead folks, like dat woman what come and tell your ma about you chunkin' at her chillins, which your ma make Mars John strop you, it make my mind run back to old Brer Bar. Old Brer Bar, he got the swell-headedness hisself, and if there was any shwinkin', Hit shwunk too late for to help old Brer Bar. Mm, leastways, that's what they tells me, and I ain't never heard it disputed. Was the bear's head sure enough swelled, Uncle Remus? Now you're talking, honey, exclaimed the old man. Goodness, what made it swell? This was Uncle Remus's cue. Applying the sandpaper to the axe helve with gentle vigor, he began. One time, when Br'er Rabbit was gwine lopin' home from a frolic what they'd been havin' up at Miss Meadows's, who should he happen up wid but old Br'er Bar? Course, after what done passed twixt em, there wa'n't no good feelings tween Br'er Rabbit and old Br'er Bar. But Br'er Rabbit, he want to save his manners, and so he holler out, Hey, old Br'er Bar, how you come on? I ain't seed you in a coon's age. How all down at your house? How Miss Brune and Miss Brindle? Who was that, Uncle Remus? The little boy interrupted. Miss Brune and Miss Brindle? Miss Brune was Br'er Bar's old woman, and Miss Brindle was his gal. Dat what they call him in dem days. So, den Br'er Rabbit, he axed him howdy, he did, and Br'er Bar, he spawned that he was mighty poorly, and dey amble long, dey did, sort of familiar like. But Br'er Rabbit, he keep one eye on Br'er Bar, and Br'er Bar, he study how he gwine nab Br'er Rabbit. Last, Br'er Rabbit, he up and say, says he, Br'er Bar, I speck I got some business cut out for you, says he. What dat, Br'er Rabbit, says Br'er Bar, says he. Whiles I was cleaning up my new ground day fo yesterday, says Br'er Rabbit, says he, I come cross one of these year old time bee trees. Hit start holler at the bottom, and stay holler plumb to the top, and de honey's just naturally oozing out. And if you'll just drop your engagements and go along with me, says Br'er Rabbit, says he, You'll get a bait that'll last you and your family to the middle of next month, says he. Br'er Bar say he much oblige, and he believe he'll go long, and with that he put out for Br'er Rabbit's new ground, which twan't so mighty fur. Leastways, they got dar after a while. Oh, Br'er Bar, he lowed that he can smell the honey. Br'er Rabbit, 
he low dat he can see de honeycomb. Brer Bar, he low dat he can hear de bees a zoomin'. They stand round and talk biggity, they did, twill by and by. Brer Rabbit, he up and say, says he, You do the climbing, Brer Bar, and I'll do the rushin' round. You climb up to the hole, and I'll take this yer pine pole and shove the honey up to where you can get her, says he. Old Brer Bar, he spit on his hands and skint up the tree and jam his head in the hole. And sure enough, Brer Rabbit, he grabbed the pine pole, and the way he stir up them bees was sinful. That's what it was. It was sinful. And the bees, they swarmed on old Brer Bar's head. Twill fo he could take it out of the hole, it was done swell up bigger than that there dinner pot. And dar he swung, and old Brer Rabbit, he danced round and sing, Trees stand mighty high, but honey mighty sweet. Watch them bees with stingers on their feet. But dar old Brer Bar hung, and if his head ain't shwunk, I speck he hangin' there yet. That's what I speck. End of tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Chapter 29. Mr. Fox Gets Into Serious Business. It turn out one time, said Uncle Remus, grinding some crumbs of tobacco between the palms of his hands, preparatory to enjoying his usual smoke after supper. It turn out one time did Brer Rabbit make so free with the man's collared patch that the man he took and sought a trap for old Br'er Rabbit. "'Which man was that, Uncle Remus?' asked the little boy. "'Just a man, honey. That's all. That's all I knows. This one of these year mans what you see trollopin' round every day. Nobody ain't never year what his name is, and if they did, they kept the news mighty close for me. If this year man is believed fur to have a name, then I'm done, cause you had to go further to me. If you believe to know more than I does, then you'll had to hunt up some of these year niggers what sprung up since I commenced for to shed my hair. Well, I just thought, Uncle Remus, said the little boy, in a tone remarkable for self-deprecation, that the man had a name. To be sure, replied the old man, with unction, puffing away at his pipe course. Dat what make I say what a does. Dis year man might a had a name, then again he mightn't. He might a been named Slipshop Sam. He might a been named Old One-Eye Riley, which if twas ain't been handed round to me. But dis year man, he in the tale, and what we gonna do with him? That's the point. "'Cause when I get to huntin' round mong my members at a dis year Mr. What you may call him's name, she ain't dar. Now then, let's just call him Mr. Man and let him go with that. The silence of the little boy gave consent. One time, said Uncle Remus, carefully taking up the thread of the story where it had been dropped. It turned out that Br'er Rabbit been making so free with Mr. Man's greens and truck, that Mr. Man, he took and sought a trap for old Br'er Rabbit. And Br'er Rabbit, he's so greedy that he took and walk right spang in it, for he know hisself. Well, it wa'n't long for here come Mr. Man, bruising round, and he ain't no sooner see old Br'er Rabbit than he smack his hands together and holler out, you a nice fella, you is. You been gobbling up my green truck, and now you trying for to tote off my trap. You a mighty nice chap, that's what you is. But now that I got ya, I just bout settle with you for the old and the new. And with that, 
Mr. Man, he go off, he did, down in de bushes atter a handful of switches. Old Brer Rabbit, he ain't seein' nothin', but he feelin' mighty lonesome, and he sot there lookin' like every minute was gwine to be the next. And whiles Mr. Man was off preparing his brush broom, who should come paradin' along but Brer Fox? Brer Fox make a great admiration, he did, bout to fix what he find Brer Rabbit in. But Brer Rabbit, he make like he fit to kill himself laughing, and he up and tell Brer Fox, he did, that Miss Meadows' folks want him to go down to the house and attendance on a wedding, and he low which he couldn't and they low how he could, and then by and by they take and tie him dar whilst they go after the preacher. So he be dar when they come back. And mowin' dat, Brer Rabbit up and tell Brer Fox to his chillin's mighty low with the fever, and he needs fer to go after some pills fer him. And he asks Brer Fox fer to take his place and go down to Miss Meadows's and have a nice time with the gals. Brer Fox he in for dem kind of pranks, and twa'n't no time for Brer Rabbit had old Brer Fox harness up in his place, and then he make like he got to make haste and get the pills for dem sick chillins. Brer Rabbit wa'n't more'n out of sight, for here come Mr. Man with a handful of hickories, and when he see Brer Fox tied up dar, he look like he astonished. Hey yo, says Mr. Man, says he. You done change color, and you done got bigger, and your tail done grown out. What kind of what's his name is you anyhow? says he. Brer Fox, he stay still, and Mr. Man, he talk on. It's mighty big luck, says he, if when I catch the chap what nibble my greens, likewise I catch the fellow what gnaw my goose, says he, and with that. He lit in the Brer Fox with the hickories, and the way he play rap jacket was a caution to the neighborhood. Brer Fox, he juke and he jump, and he squeal and he squall, but Mr. Man, he shower down on him, he did, like fighting a red wasp nest. The little boy laughed, and Uncle Remus supplemented this endorsement of his descriptive powers with a most infectious chuckle. <laughs> by and by, continued the old man, the switches, they got frazzle out. Mr. Man, he put out out some more, and when he done got fairly out of hearing, Brer Rabbit, he showed up, he did, cause he just been hiding out in the bushes listen at the racket. He low hip mighty funny that Miss Meadows ain't come along, cause he done been down to the doctor house, and that's further than the preacher yet. Brer Rabbit make like he hurryin' on home. But Brer Fox, he open up, he did, and he say, "'I thank you fer to turn me loose, Brer Rabbit, and I'll be obliged,' says he, "'cause you done tie me up so tight that it make my head swim, and I don't speck I'd last fer to get to Miss Meadows's,' says he. Brer Rabbit, he sot down sort of careless like and begin fer to scratch one ear like a man studying bout something. "'That's so, Brer Fox,' says he. "'You does look sort of stove up. "'Look like something been uncombing your hers,' says he. "'Brer Fox ain't saying nothing, "'but Brer Rabbit, he keep on talking. "'There ain't no bad feelings twixt us, is they, Brer Fox? "'Cause if they is, "'I ain't got no time for to be tearing round here.' "'Brer Fox say, "'Which he don't have no unfriendliness.' And with that, Brer Rabbit cut Brer Fox loose just in time for to hear Mr. Man whistling up his dogs, and one went one way, and the other went another. That the end of the tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Chapter 30 How Mr. Rabbit Succeeded in Raising a Dust 
"'In dem times,' said Uncle Remus, gazing admiringly at himself in a fragment of looking-glass, "'Brer Rabbit, and Brer Fox, and Brer Coon, and dem other creatures go coatin' and sparklin' round de neighborhood more same with dem folks. "'Twa'n't no, lemme a hoss, no, fetch me my buggy. But they just up and lit out and tote their cell. There's old Brer Fox. He just wheel round and fetch his flank one swipe with his tongue, and he be comb up. And Brer Rabbit, he just spit on his hands and twist it round amongst the roots of his ears, and his hair be roach. They was that flirtatious, continued the old man, closing one eye at his image in the glass, that Miss Meadows and the gals don't see no peace from one weekend to the other. Tuesday was same as Sunday, and Friday was same as Tuesday, and it come down to dat pass that when Miss Meadows would have chicken fixins for dinner, in a drop Brer Fox and Brer Possum, and when she'd have fried greens, in it'd pop old Brer Rabbit. Twill last Miss Meadows, she took and tell the gals that she be dat blame if she gwan or keep no tavern. So they fix it up monk the cells, Miss Meadows and the gals did, that the next time the gents call, they give em a game. The gents, they was a coatin', but Miss Meadows, she don't want to marry none of em, and neither does the gals, and likewise they don't want to have em pesterin' round. Lass, one Tuesday, Miss Meadows, she told em that if they come down to her house the next Saturday evening, the whole caboodle of em go down the road a piece, where there was a big flint rock, and the man what it could take a sludge hammer and knock the dust out of dat rock, he was the man what it get the pick of the gals. They all say they gwine do it, but old Br'er Rabbit. He crope off where there was a cool place under some jimson weeds, and dar he sot, workin' his mind how he gwine to get dust out of dat rock. By and by, while he was a settin' dar, up he jump and crack his heels together and sing out, make a bow to the buzzard and den to the crow, takes a limber toe gentleman for to jump Jim Crow, and with that he put out for Brer Coon's house and borry his slippers. When Saturday evening come, they was all there. Miss Meadows and the gals, they was there, and Br'er Coon, and Br'er Fox, and Br'er Possum, and Br'er Terrypin, they was there. Where was the rabbit? the little boy asked. You can put your depends old Br'er Rabbit, the old man replied, with a chuckle. He was there, but he shuffled up kinder late. Cause when Miss Meadows and the balance of em done gone down to the place, Br'er Rabbit, he crope round to the ash hopper, and fill Br'er Coon's slippers full of ashes, and then he took and put em on and march off. He got there after a while, and soon as Miss Meadows and the gals seed him, they's up and giggle, and make a great admiration, cause Br'er Rabbit got on slippers. Br'er Fox, he's so smart, he holler out, he did, and say he lay Br'er Rabbit got the ground itch. But Br'er Rabbit, he sort of shet one eye, he did, and say, says he, I been so used to riding horseback, as these here ladies knows, that I'm getting sort of tender-footed. And they don't hear much more from Br'er Fox that day. Cause he member how Br'er Rabbit done bent and rid him, and hit as just about as much as Miss Meadows and the gals could do for to keep the snickers from getting up a disturbance amongst the congregation. But never mind that. Old Br'er Rabbit, he was dar, and he's so brash that little mole, and he'd a grab up the sludge hammer and open up the racket for anybody give the word. But Br'er Fox, he shoved Br'er Rabbit out of the way and pick up the sludge himself. Now then, continued the old man, with pretty much the air of one who had been the master of similar ceremonies, the progance was this year. Every gent was to have three licks at the rock, 
and de gent which fetched de dust, he were de one which gwine to take de pick of de gals. Old Brer Fox, he grabbed de sludge hammer, he did, and he come down on de rock. Blim! No dust ain't come. Then he draw back, and down he come again. Blam! No dust ain't come. Then he spit in his hand, and give a big swing, and down she come, kerblap! And yet no dust ain't flewed. Then Brer Possum, he make trial. And Brer Coon, and all the balance of em except Brer Terrypin, and he allowed that he got a crick in his neck. Then Brer Rabbit, he grab hold of the sludge, and he lipped up in de ar and come down in de rock all at the same time. Pow! And de ashes, they flewed up so they did, that Brer Fox, he took and had a sneezing spell, and Miss Meadows and the gals, they up and cough. Three times Brer Rabbit jump up and crack his heels together and come down with his sledgehammer. Kablam! And every time he jump up, he holler out, Stand further, ladies. Here come the dust. And sure enough, the dust come. Leastways, continued Uncle Remus, Brer Rabbit got one of the gals, and they had a wedding and a big affair. Which of the girls did the rabbit marry? asked the little boy, dubiously. "'I did hear tell of her name,' replied the old man, with a great affectation of interest. "'But look like I done and forget it out of my mind. "'If I don't disremember,' he continued, "'it was Miss Molly Cottontail, "'and I speck we better let it go at that.'" End of tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Chapter 31 A Plantation Witch. The next time the little boy got permission to call upon Uncle Remus, the old man was sitting in his door, with his elbows on his knees and his face buried in his hands, and he appeared to be in great trouble. "'What's the matter, Uncle Remus?' the youngster asked. "'Nuff the matter, honey. More than there's any call for. If they ain't some queer goings on round dis place, I ain't named Remus.' The serious tone of the old man caused the little boy to open his eyes. The moon, just at its full, cast long, vague, wavering shadows in front of the cabin. A colony of tree-frogs somewhere in the distance were treating their neighbors to a serenade, but to the little boy it sounded like a chorus of lost and long-forgotten whistlers. The sound was wherever the imagination chose to locate it, to the right, to the left, in the air, on the ground, far away or near at hand, but always dim and always indistinct. Something in Uncle Remus's tone exactly fitted all these surroundings, and the child nestled closer to the old man. "'Yes, sir,' continued Uncle Remus, with an ominous sigh and a mysterious shake of his head. <sighs> If they ain't some queer goings on in dis year neighborhood, that I'm the bald headedest creature twixt this and next January was a year ago, which I knows I ain't. That's what. What is it, Uncle Remus? I know Mars John been driving Charlie sort of hard today, and I say to myself that I'd drop round about dusk and fling another year of corn in the trough and kind of give him a touching up with a courier comb, and bless gracious. I ain't been in de lot more'n a minute fore I seed something was wrong with the horse, and show sure enough there was his mane full of witch stirrups. Full of what, Uncle Remus? Full of witch stirrups, honey. Ain't you seed no witch stirrups? Well, when you see two strands of hair tried together in a horse's mane, there you see a witch stirrup, and more'n dat, 
dat hoss done been rid by em do you reckon they have been riding charlie inquired the little boy course honey to be sure they is what else they been doing did you ever see a witch uncle remus dat ain't neither here nor dere when i see a coon track in de branch i know de coon been long dere the argument seemed unanswerable, and the little boy asked, in a confidential tone, "'Uncle Remus, what are witches like?' "'Dey comes different,' responded the cautious old darky. "'Dey comes in de conjures folks. Squinch owl holler every time he see a witch, and when you hear the dog howling in the middle of the night, one of em's mighty apt to be prowling round.' Conjuring folks can tell a witch the minute they lays their eyes on it, but them what ain't conjuring, it's mighty hard to tell when they see one, cause they might come in the appearance of a cow and all kind of creatures. I ain't been used to no conjuring myself, but I've been living long enough for to know when you meets up with a big black cat in the middle of the road with yaller eyeballs. There's your witch fresh from the old boy. And furthermore, I know that tain't found into no dogs for to catch the rabbit what use in a burying ground. They're the most ungodliest creatures what you ever laid eyes on, continued Uncle Remus with unction. Down there in Putman County, your Uncle James, he make like he gwine to catch one of them there graveyard rabbits. Sure enough, out he goes, and the dogs ain't no more'n got to the place for up jumped the old rabbit right among em. And after running round a time or two, she skipped right up to Mars Jeems, and Mars Jeems, he just put the gun barrel right on her and lam loose. It tore it up the ground all round, and the dogs, they rush up, but there wa not no rabbit there. And by and by, Mars Jeems, he see the dogs tucking their tails tween their legs, and he look up, and there was the rabbit capering round on a tombstone, and with that Mars Jeems say he sort of feel like the time done come when your grandma was specting none of em home, and he call off the dogs and put out. But them was hunts. Which is is these ere kind of folks what can trap their body and change into a cat and a wolf and all kind of creatures? Papa says there ain't any witches. The little boy interrupted. Mars John ain't lived long as I is," said Uncle Remus by way of comment. "He ain't been bruising round all hours of the night and day. I know the nigger witch's brer was a witch." "'Cause he up and told me how he took and cured him, "'and he cured him good, man.' "'How was that?' inquired the little boy. "'It seem like,' continued Uncle Remus, "'that witch folks has got a slit in the back of the neck, "'and when they want to change theirself, "'they just pull the hide over the head "'same as if it was a shirt, and there they is. "'Do they get out of their skins?' asked the little boy in an awed tone. "'To be sure, honey. You see your pa pull his shut off? Well, dat just exactly the way day does. But dis year nigger what I telling you about, he cured his bread the very first pass he made at him. It got so that folks in the settlement didn't have no peace. The chillins had wake up in the mornings with the hair all tangled up, and with scratches on em, like they been through a briar patch. Twill by and by, one day the nigger he, he lowed that he'd set up that night and keep one eye on his brer. Showin' sure off that night, just as the chickens was crowin' for twelve, up jumped the brer and pulled his skin off and sail out of the house in the shape of a bat. And what does the nigger do but grab up the hide and turn it wrong side outwards? and sprinkle it with salt. Then he lay down and watched for to see what the news was going to be. Just for the day here come a big black cat in the door, and the nigger get up he did and druv her away. 
By and by, here come a big black dog snuffin' round, and de nigger up with a chunk and lammed him in de side of de head. Then a squinch owl lit on de comb of de house, and the nigger jammed the shovel in de fire and make him flew away. Last, here come a great big black wolf with his eyes shining like fire coals. He grabbed the hide and rush out. Twa'n't long fold a nigger year as brer hollering and squallin', and he took a light, he did, and went out. And there was his brer just a wallerin' on the ground and squirmin' round, cause the salt on the skin was stingin' worse than if he got his breeches lined with yaller jackets. By next morning he got so he could sort of shuffle along, but he gave up conjun, and if there was any more witches in dat settlement, they kept mighty close, and dat nigger he ain't skint himself no more, not enduring my remembrance. The result of this was that Uncle Remus had to take the little boy by the hand and go with him to the big house, which the old man was not loath to do, and when the child went to bed, he lay awake a long time, expecting an unseemly visitation from some mysterious source. It soothed him, however, to hear the strong, musical voice of his sable patron, not very far away, tenderly contending with a lusty tune, and to this accompaniment the little boy dropped asleep. "'It's eighteen hundred forty and eight. Christ done made that crooked way straight, and I don't want to stay here no longer. "'It's eighteen hundred and forty and nine. Christ done turned that water into wine, and I don't want to stay here no longer. End of the tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Chapter 32 Jackie My Lantern Upon his next visit to Uncle Remus, the little boy was exceedingly anxious to know more about witches, but the old man prudently refrained from exciting the youngster's imagination any further in that direction. Uncle Remus had a board across his lap, and, armed with a mallet and a shoe-knife, was engaged in making shoe pegs. "'While as I was crossing de branch just now,' he said, endeavouring to change the subject, "'I come up with a Jackie my lantern, and she was burning worse than a bunch of lightning bugs, man. I know she was a-fixin' for to lead me into that quagmire down in de swamp, and I steered clear in her. Yes, sir, I did that. You ain't never seen no Jackie my lanterns, is you, honey?' The little boy never had but he had heard of them, and he wanted to know what they were, and thereupon Uncle Remus proceeded to tell him. "'One time,' said the old darky, transferring his spectacles from his nose to the top of his head, and leaning his elbows upon his pegboard, "'there was a blacksmith man, and dis year blacksmith man he took and stuck closer by his dram than he did by his bellows.' Monday morning he git on a spree, and all dat week he'd be on a spree, and the next Monday morning he'd take a fresh start. By and by, one day, after de blacksmith been spreein' round and cussin' mightily, he hear a sort of rustlin' fuss at the door, and in walked de bad man. Who, Uncle Remus? the little boy asked. De bad man, honey. The old boy hisself, right fresh from de religion what you hear Miss Sally readin bout. He done hide his horns, and his tail, and his hoof, and he come dress up like white folks. He took off his hat and he bow, and then he tell de blacksmith who he is, and dat he done come after him. Then de blacksmith, he begun to cry and beg, and he beg so hard, and he cry so hard, that the bad man say make a trade with him. At the end of one year, the spirit of the blacksmith was to be hisn, 
an' in durin' of dat time de blacksmif must put in his hottest licks in de interests of de bad man, an' den he put a spell on de cheer de blacksmif was settin' in, an' on his sludge hammer. De man would sot in de cheer couldn't git up less'n de blacksmif let him, an' de man would pick up de sludge it had ter keep on knockin' wid it twill de blacksmif say quit, an' den he'd give money plenty, an' off he put. De blacksmith, he sail in fer to have his fun, and he have so much dat he clean forgot about his contract. But by and by, one day, he looked down de road, and dar he see de bad man comin', and den he knew de year was out. When de bad man got in de door, de blacksmith was poundin' way at a horseshoe, but he wa'n't so busy dat he didn't ax him in. De madman sort of do like he ain't got no time for to tarry, but de blacksmith say he got some little jobs that he needs to finish up, and then he asked de bad man for to set down a minute, and de bad man he took and sot down, and he sot in dat cheer what he done conjured on, course there he was. Then de blacksmith, he gun to poke fun at de bad man, and he asked him, don't he want a dram? and won't he hitch his cheer up a little nigher to fire? And de bad man, he beg and he beg, but twa'n't doin' no good, cause de blacksmith lowed dat he gwine to keep him in there twill he promised dat he'd let him off one year more. And sure enough, de bad man promised dat if de blacksmith let him up, he'd give him another showin'. So den de blacksmith give de wood, and de bad man saunter off down de big road, Settin' traps and layin' his progins for to catch more sinners. The next year, he passed same like the other one. At the appointed time, here come the old boy after the blacksmith. But still, the blacksmith had some jobs and he needs to finish up. And he asked the bad man for to take hold of the sludge and he help him out. And the bad man, he lowed it rare and be disperlite. He don't care if he do hit her a biff or two, and with that he grab up the sludge, and there he was again, cause he done conjured the sludge so that whomsoever tuck her up can't put her down lest the blacksmith say the wood. The palaver there they did, twill by and by the bad man he up and let him off another year. Well then, that year passed same as the other one, month in, month out. That man was rolling in dram, and by and by here come the bad man. The blacksmith cry and he holler and he rip round and tear his hair, but hit just like he didn't, cause the bad man grab him up and cram him in a bag and tote him off. Whilst they was going along, they come up with a passel of folks what are havin' a one of these here Fourth of July barbecues, and the old boy. He lowed that maybe he can get some more game, and what do we do but join in with him? He lines in, and he talks politics same like the other folks. Twill by and by dinner time come round, and they ax him up, which agreed with his stomach, and he posited his bag underneath the table alongside the other bags what the hungry folks had brung. No sooner did the blacksmith get back on the ground then he begun to work his way out of the bag. He crope out, he did, and then he took and changed the bag. He took and tuck another bag and lay it down where dis year bag was, and then he crope out of the crowd and lay low in the underbrush. Last, when the time come for to go, the old boy up with his bag and slung her on his shoulder, and off he put for the bad place. When he got dar, he took and dropped the bag off in his back and call up the imps, and they just come squallin' and a-caperin', which I spect they must been hungry. Leastways, they just swarmed round, hollerin' out, "'Daddy, what you brung? Daddy, what you brung?' So then they open up the bag, and lo and behold, out jump a big bulldog, and the way he shook them little imps was a caution." and he kept on gnawing em twill the old boy opened the gate and turned him out. And, and what became of the blacksmith? 
the little boy asked, as Uncle Remus paused to snuff the candle with his fingers. "'I'm driving her round, honey. After a long time, the blacksmith he took and die, and when he go to the good place, the man at the gate don't know who he is, and he can't get squeezed in. Then he go down to the bad place and knock. The old boy, he look out he did he knowed the blacksmith the minute he laid eyes on him but he shake his head and say says he you had excuse me brer blacksmith cause i done had experience longer you you'll had to go somewheres else if you want to raise any racket says he and with that he shut the door and they do say continued uncle remus with unction that since that day de blacksmith been sort of hovering round twixt the heavens and the earth in dark nights he shine out so folks call him jacky my lantern that's what they tells me it may be wrong and may be right but that's what i years end of tale this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Chapter 33 Why the Negro is Black One night, while the little boy was watching Uncle Remus twisting and waxing some shoe thread, he made what appeared to him to be a very curious discovery. He discovered that the palms of the old man's hands were as white as his own, and the fact was such a source of wonder that he at last made it the subject of remark. The response of Uncle Remus led to the earnest recital of a piece of unwritten history that must prove interesting to ethnologists. "'To be sure the palm of my hand's white, honey,' he quietly remarked. "'And when it come to that, there was a time when all the white folks was black.' blacker than me cause i done been yer so long that i been sort of bleach out the little boy laughed he thought uncle remus was making him the victim of one of his jokes but the youngster was never more mistaken the old man was serious nevertheless he failed to rebuke the ill-timed mirth of the child appearing to be altogether engrossed in his work after a while he resumed yes yeah, sir folks to know what been yet let alone what gwanter be niggers is niggers now but the time was when we was all niggers together when was that uncle remus way back yonder in dim times we was all on us black we is all niggers together and cordin to all the counts what i hears folks is gettin long about as well in dem days as they is now but after a while the news come that there was a pond of water somewheres in the neighborhood, which if they get into it they be wash off nice and white, and then one of em he find the place, and make a plunge into the pond, and come out white as a town gal. And then, bless gracious, when the folks seed it, they make a break for the pond, and then what was the surplus they got in first and they come out white and then what was the next soupless they got in next and they come out merlatters and they was such a crowd of em that they mighty nigh used the water up which dem the others come along the most they could do was to paddle round with the foots and dabble in it with the hands dem was the niggers and down to this day they ain't no white about a nigger except in the palms of his hands and soles of the foots the little boy seemed to be very much interested in this new account of the origin of races, and he made some further inquiries, which elicited from Uncle Remus the following additional particulars. The Injun and the Chinee got to be counted long with my daughters, and I ain't seen no Chinee that I knows of, but they tells me they are sort of twixt a brown and a brindle. They are all my ladders. "'But Mama says the Chinese have straight hair,' the little boy suggested. 
"'Cole, sonny,' the old man unhesitatingly responded, "'dem what get to de pond time enough for to get the head in de water, "'de water hit unkink de hair. "'Hit needs to be dat away. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Chapter 34 The Sad Fate of Mr. Fox. Now, den, said Uncle Remus, with unusual gravity, as soon as the little boy, by taking his seat, announced that he was ready for the evening's entertainment to begin. Now, den, this year tale what I'm a goin' fer to give you is the last row of stumps, sure. This year's where old Brer Fox loses breath, and he ain't find it no more down to this day. Did he kill himself, Uncle Remus? the little boy asked with a curious air of concern. "'Hold on there, honey!' the old man exclaimed with a great affectation of alarm. "'Hold on there! Wait! Give me room! I don't want to tell you no story. If you keep shoving me forward, I might get some of the facts mixed up among the cells. You gotta give me room, and you gotta give me time.' The little boy had no other premature questions to ask, and after a pause, Uncle Remus resumed. "'Well, then, one day Brer Rabbit go to Brer Fox's house, he did, and he put up mighty poor mouth. He say his old woman sick, and his chillin's cold, and the fire done gone out. Brer Fox, he feel bad bout this, and he took and supply Brer Rabbit with a chunk of fire. Brer Rabbit see Brer Fox cooking some nice beef, and his mouth begun to water. But he take the fire, he did, and he put out towards home. But presently here it came back, and he say the fire done gone out. Brer Fox lowed that he want to invite to dinner, but he don't say nothing, and by and by Brer Rabbit he up and say, says he, Brer Fox, where you get so much nice beef? says he. And then Brer Fox, he up and spawned, says he, "'You can come to my house tomorrow if your folks ain't too sick, "'and I can show you where you can get plenty beef more nice than this year,' says he. "'Well, sure enough, the next day fotch Brer Rabbit, and Brer Fox say, says he, "'There's a man down yonder by Miss Meadows's, what got a heap of fine cattle, "'and he got a cow named Bouquet,' says he. And you just go and say bouquet, and she'll open her mouth, and you can jump in and get just as much meat as you can tote, says Brer Fox, says he. Well, I'll go long, says Brer Rabbit, says he, and you can jump in fuss, and then I'll come follerin' after, says he. With that, they put out, and they went promenadin' round mong the cattle, they did, to a by-and-by they struck up with the one they was after. Brer Fox, he up he did, and holler bouquet, and the cow flung her mouth wide open. Sure enough, in they jump, and when they got there, Brer Fox, he say, says he, You can cut most anywheres, Brer Rabbit, but don't cut round the hazlet, says he. Then Brer Rabbit, he holler back, he did, I'm a-gettin' me out a roastin' piece, says he. Roastin', bacon, fryin', says Brer Fox, says he. Don't get too nigh to Hazlitt, though, says he. They cut, and they coughed, and they coughed, and they cut, and whilst they was cutting and carving, in slashing way, Brer Rabbit, he took and hacked into the Hazlitt, and with that, down fell the cow dead. Now, den, says Brer Fox, we are gone sure, says he. What we going do? says Brer Rabbit, says he. I get to Maul, says Brer Fox, and you'll jump into Gall, says he. Next morning, here come the man what the cow belonged to, and he asks who killed Bouquet. Nobody don't say nothing. 
Den de man say he'll cut her open and see, and den he whirl in and twa'n't no time for he had her entrails spread out. Brer Rabbit, he crope out of de gall and say, says he, Mr. Man, oh, Mr. Man, I, I'll tell you who kill your cow. You look in the mall and there you'll find him, says he. With that, the man took a stick and lay him down on the mall so hard that he killed Brer Fox stone dead. When Brer Rabbit see Brer Fox was laid out for good, he make like he mighty sorry, and he up and axed the man for Brer Fox's head. Man say he ain't keerin, and then Brer Rabbit took and brung it to Brer Fox's house. There he see old Miss Fox, and he tell her dat he done fotch her some nice beef what her old man sought her and she ain't got her look at it twill she go to eat it. Brer Fox son was named Toby, and Brer Rabbit tell Toby fur to keep still whilst his mammy cooked the nice beef what his dad beside him. Toby he was mighty hungry, and he look in the pot he did whilst the cooking was going on, and dar he see his daddy's head, and with that he sot up a howl and told his mammy. Miss Fox, she get mighty mad when she find she cookin' her old man head, and she call up the dogs, she did, and sicked em on Brer Rabbit. And old Miss Fox and Toby and the dogs, they pushed Brer Rabbit so close that he had to take a holler tree. Miss Fox, she tell Toby for to stay there and mind Brer Rabbit while she goes and gets the axe, and when she gone, Brer Rabbit he told Toby if he go to the branch and get him a drink of water, then he'd give him a dollar. Toby, he put out, he did, and bring some water in his hat. But by the time he got back, Brer Rabbit done out and gone. Old Miss Fox, she cut and cut, to down come the tree, but no Brer Rabbit dare. Then she laid the blame on Toby, and she say she gonna lash him. And Toby, he put out and run and the old woman after him. By and by, he come up with Br'er Rabbit, and sot down for to tell him how twas, and whilst he was a settin' there, here comes old Miss Fox a slippin' up, and grabbin' both. Then she tell him what she gwine do. Br'er Rabbit she gwine to kill, and Toby she gwine to lamb if it's the last act. Then Br'er Rabbit says, says he, If you please, ma'am, Miss Fox, Lay me on the grindstone and ground off my nose so I can't smell no more when I'm dead. Miss Fox, she took this to be a good idea, and she fotched both of em to the grindstone and set em up on it so that she could grind off Br'er Rabbit's nose. Then Br'er Rabbit, he up and say, says he, If you please, ma'am, Miss Fox, Toby he can turn the handle whilst you go after some water for to wet the grindstone, says he. Course, as soon as Br'er Rabbit see Miss Fox go after the water, he jump down and put out, and this time he get clean away. And was that the last of the rabbit, too, Uncle Remus? The little boy asked with something like a sigh. Don't push me too close, honey, responded the old man. Don't shove me up in no corner. I don't want to tell you no stories. Some say that Br'er Rabbit's old woman died from eating some pison weed, and that Br'er Rabbit married old Miss Fox, and some say not. Some tells one tale, and some tells another. Some say that from that time forward the rabbits and the foxes make friends and stay so. Some say they kept on quarreling. It looked like it's mixed. Let them tell you what knows. Dat what I years, you gets it straight like I yet it. There was a long pause, which was finally broken by the old man. It's kin de rules for you to be noddin' off, honey. By and by you'll drop off and I'll have to tote you up to the big house. I hear dat baby cryin', and by and by Miss Sally'll fly up and be a hollerin' at you. Oh, uh, I wasn't asleep, the little boy replied. I was just thinking. Well, that's different, said the old man. 
"'If you climb up on my back,' he continued, speaking softly, "'I speck I ain't too old for to be your hoss from year to de house. Many and many's de time dat I toted your Uncle James dat away, and Mars James was heavier sot than what you is. End of tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris This section is a collection of plantation proverbs, all one-liners showing the wisdom and the knowledge of the folks who live on the plantation. Listen closely. Big possum climb little tree. Dem what eats can say grace. Old man know all died last year. Better de gravy than no grease at all. Dram ain't good till you get it. Lazy folks' stomachs don't get tired. Rheumatiz don't help at the log rolling. Mole don't see what his neighbor doing. Save the pace and mark for Sunday. Don't rain every time the pig squeal. Crow and corn can't grow in the same field. Tattling woman can't make the bread rise. Rails split full breakfast or seasoned before dinner. Dem what knows too much sleeps under de hash hopper. If you want to see your own sins, clean up a new ground. Hog don't know which part of em will season the turnip salad. It's a blessing the white sow don't shake the plum tree. Winter grapes sour, whether you can reach em or not. Mighty poor bee that don't make no more honey than he want. Questions on mule's foot's done gone out of fashion. Pigs don't know what a pen's for. Possum's tail, good as a paw. Dogs don't bite at the front gate. Colt in the barley patch kick high. Jaber don't rob his own nest. Pullet can't roost too high for the owl. Meat fried for day won't last for night. Stump water won't cure the gripes. The howling dog knows what he sees. Blind horse don't fall when he follows the bit. Hungry nigger won't wear his maul out. Don't fling away the empty wallet. Black snake know the way to the hen nest. Looks won't do for to split rails with. Setting hens don't hanker after fresh eggs. Tater vines growing while you sleep. It take two birds for to make a nest. If you needs to eat dirt, eat clean dirt. Terry Penn walk fast enough for to go visiting. Empty smokehouse makes the pullet holler. When coon take water, he fixin' for the fight. 
corn makes more at the mill than it does in the crib. Good luck say, open your mouth and shut your eyes. Nigger that gets hurt working ought to show the scars. Fiddlin' nigger says it's a long ways to the dance. Rooster makes more racket than the hen what lay the egg. Meller Mushmillion hollers at you from over the fence. Nigger with a pocket hanker better be looked at. Rain Crow don't sing no tune, but you can bend on him. One-eyed mule can't be handled on the blind side. Moon may shine, but a lighter'd knot's mighty handy. Liquor talks mighty loud when it get loose from the jug. The proudness of a man don't count when his head's cold. Hungry rooster don't cackle when he find a womb. Some niggers mighty smart, but they can't drive the pigeons to roost. You may know the way, but better keep your eyes on the seven stairs. All the buzzards in the settlement'll come to the gray mule's funeral. You can hide the fire, but what you going to do with smoke? Tomorrow may be the carriage driver's day for plowing. It's a mighty deaf nigger that don't hear the dinner horn. It takes a bee for to get the sweetness out of the whorehound blossom. Hans don't bother longer harness folks, but you better go round the graveyard. The pig that runs off with the year of corn gets little more than the cob. Sleepin' in the fence corner don't fetch Christmas in the kitchen. The spring house may freeze, but the niggers'll keep the shuck pen warm. Twixt the bug and the bee martin, tain't hard to tell which gwine to get cotch. Don't dispute with the squinch owl, jam the shovel in the fire. You'd see more of the mink if he knowed where the yard dog sleeps. Troubles is seasonin'. Persimmons ain't good twill the day the frost bit. Watch out when you're getting all you want. Fattening hogs ain't in luck. And that's the end of these here proverbs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. This is Volume Two, Section One, entitled His Songs. The first one is called Revival Hymn. Oh, where shall we go when the great day comes, with the blowing of the trumpets and the banging of the drums? How many poor sinners be cotched out late, and find no latch for the golden gate? No use for the wait till tomorrow. The sun mustn't set on your sorrow. Sin's as sharp as a bamboo briar. O oh Lord, fetch the moaners up higher. When the nations of the earth is a standin' all round, who's a gwine to be chosen for to wear the glory crown? Who's a gwine for to stand stiff-necked and bold and answer to the name at the callin' of the roll? You better come now if you're comin'. Old Satan is loose and a bummin'. The wheels of destruction is a hummin'. 
Oh, come along, sinner, if you're coming. De song of salvation is a mighty sweet song, and de paradise wind blow fur and blow strong. In Abraham's bosom it's safe and it's wide, and right there's the place where the sinners ought to hide. Oh, you needn't to be a stoppin' and a lookin'. If you fool with old Satan, you'll get took in. You'll hang on the edge and get shook in if you keep on a stoppin' and a lookin'. The time is right now, and dish year's the place. Let the sun of salvation shine square in your face. Fight the battles of the Lord, fight soon and fight late, and you'll always find a latch fur the golden gate. No use fur to wait twill tomorrow. The sun mustn't set on your sorrow. Sin's as sharp as a bamboo briar. Ax the Lord for to fetch you up higher. End of the hymn. Hymn number two, Camp Meeting Song. Oh, the world is round, and the world is wide. Lord, remember these chillin' in the morning. It's a mighty long ways up the mountain side, and there ain't no place for them sinners for to hide, and there ain't no place where sin can abide when the Lord shall come in the morning. Look up and look round, fling your burden on the ground, it's a gettin' mighty close on the morning. Smooth away sin's frown, rich up and get the crown, what the Lord will fetch in the morning. The hand of redemption, it's hilt out to you. Lord, remember dem sinners in the morning. It's a mighty patient hand, but the days is but few. When Satan, he'll come a demanding of his due, and the stiff necked sinners will be smoting all through. Oh, you better get ready for the morning. Look up and set your face towards the green hills of grace. For the sun rises up in the morning. Oh, you better change your base. It's your soul's last race for the glory that's a coming in the morning. The farmer gets ready when the land's all plowed for to sow dem seeds in the morning. The spirit may be puny and the flesh may be proud, but you better cut loose from the scoffing crowd and jine those Christians what's a crying out loud for the Lord for to come in the morning. Shout loud and shout long, let the echoes answer strong when the sun rises up in the morning. Oh, you allus will be wrong twill you choose to belong to the master what's a coming in the morning. End of the hymn. Hymn number three, Corn Shucking Song. Oh, the first news you know, the day'll be a breakin'. Hey yo, hi yo, up and down the bango. And the fire be a burnin' and the ash cake a bakin'. Hey yo, hi yo, up and down the bango. And the horn'll be a hollerin' and the boss'll be a wakin'. Hey yo, hi yo, up and down the bango. Better get up, nigger, and give yourself a shakin'. hi -o, Miss Cindy Ann. Oh, honey, when you see them ripe stars a-fallin', hey -o, hi -o, up and down the bango. Oh, honey, when you hear the rain-crows callin', hey -o, hi -o, up and down the bango. Oh, honey, when you hear that red calf bawlin', hey -o, hi -o, up and down the bango. Then the day times a creepin' and a crawlin'. Hi o Miss Cindy Ann. For the law sellin' yard is a huntin' for the mornin'. Hi o get long, go away. And she'll catch up with us for we ever get this corn in. Oh, go away, Cindy Ann. Oh, honey, when you hear that tin horn a tootin'. Hey o hi o up and down the bango. Oh, honey, when you hear that squinch owl a hootin, hey yo, hi yo, up and down the bango. Oh, honey, when you hear them little pigs a rootin, hey yo, hi yo, 
up and down de bango. Right then she's a comin' and a skippin' and a scootin'. Hi o Miss Cindy Ann. Oh, honey, when you hear dat roan mule wicker. Hey o, hi o, up and down de bango. When you see Mr. Moon turnin' pale and gettin' sicker. Hey o, hi o, up and down de bango. Den it's time for to handle dat corn a little quicker. Hey o, hi o, up and down de bango. If you want to get a smell of old Marster's jug of liquor, hey o, Miss Cindy Ann. For the lost lellin' yard is a huntin' for the mornin'. Hi o, get long, go away. And she'll catch up with dust for we ever get this corn in. Oh, go away, Cindy Ann. You niggers cross there, you better stop your dancing. Hey o, hi o, up and down the bango. No use fur to come a flingin on your shants in. Hey o, hi o, up and down the bango. No use fur to come a flingin o your cants in. Hey o, hi o, up and down the bango. Cause there ain't no time for your patin nor your prancin. Hi o, Miss Cindy Ann. Mr. Rabbit see de fox, and he sass em and a jaws em. Hey o, hi o, up and down de bango. Mr. Fox catch de rabbit, and he scratch em and he claws em. Hey o, hi o, up and down de bango. And he tire off de hide, and he jaws em and he gnaws em. Hey o, hi o, up and down de bango. Same like gal chawin sweet gum and rosum. Hi o, Miss Cindy Ann. For the lost Ellen Yard is a huntin for the mornin. Hi o, git long, go way. And she'll catch up with us for we ever get this corn in. Oh, go away, Cindy Ann. Oh, work on, boys, give those shucks a mighty ringin. Hey o, hi o, up and down de bango. For the boss come around a dangin and a dingin. Hey o, hi o, up and down de bango. Get up, move around, set them big hands to swingin. Hey o, hi o, up and down de bango. Get up and shout loud, let the white folks hear you singin. Hi o, Miss Cindy Ann. For the lost Ellen Yard is a huntin for the mornin. Hi o, get long, go way. And she'll catch up with us for we ever get this corn in. Oh, go away, Cindy Ann. End of the song. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. We're in Volume 2, doing his songs. This is Number 4, the Plowhand Song from Jasper County of 1860. Nigger mighty happy when layin by corn, dat sun's a slantin. Nigger mighty happy when he hear de dinner horn, dat sun's a slantin. But he more happy still when de night draws on, dat sun's a slantin. Dat sun's a slantin just as shows your born, and it's rise up, Primus, fetch another yell. Dat old dun cow's just a shakin up de bell, and de frog's tunin up fo de do dun fell. Good night, Mr. Kildee. I wish you mighty well. Miss Kildee, I wish you mighty well. I wish you mighty well. De corn'll be ready against dumplin' day. Dat sun's a slantin'. But nigger got a watch and stick and stay. Dat sun's a slantin'. Same as de bee martin watchin' of de jay. Dat sun's a slantin'. Dat sun's a slantin and a slippin away. Then it's rise up, Primus, and gin it turn strong. De cow's gwine home with a ding dang dong, slingin another tatch of de old time song. Good night, Mister Whippoorwill. Don't stay long, Mister Whippoorwill. Don't stay long. Don't stay long. Song number five. Christmas Play Song 
from Myrick Place, Putnam County, 1858. Hi, my rinktum, black gal sweet, same like good as what the white folks eat. Ho, my Riley, don't you take and tell her name, and then if something happen, you won't catch the blame. Hi, my rinktum, better take and hide your plum. Joey don't holler every time he find a worm. Then it's hi, my rinktum, don't get no other man. Then it's ho, my Riley, fetch out Miss Dilsey Ann. Ho, my Riley, yaller gal fine. She may be yon, but she oughter be mine. Hi, my rinktum, let me get by and see what you mean by the cut of dat eye. Ho, oh, my Riley, better shut dat door. The white folks will believe that we're tearing up the floor. Then it's ho, oh, my Riley, come a-sifting up to me, and it's hi, my rinktum, just the way to twist your knee. Hi, my rinktum, ain't the ease getting red? The squint shall shiver like he want to go to bed. Ho, oh, my Riley, but the gals and the boys just now get and say can sort of make a noise. Hi, my rinktum, let the yellow gal alone. Niggas don't hanker after sody and the pone. Then it's hi, my rinktum, better try another plan. And it's ho, my Riley, trot out Miss Dilsey Ann. Ho, my Riley, in the happy Christmas time, the niggas shake the clothes a hunting for a dime. Hi, my rinktum, and then they shake the feet. They grease their self with the good ham meat. Ho, my Riley, they eat and they cram, and by and by old miss'll be sendin' out the dram. Then it's ho, my Riley, you hear dat, Sam? And it's hi, my rinktum, she be sendin' out the dram. Song number six, Plantation Play Song, from Putnam County, 1856. It's getting mighty late when the guinea hens squall, and you better dance now if you're going to dance at all. For by this time tomorrow night you can't hardly crawl, cause you'll have to take the hoe again, and likewise the maul. Don't you hear that bay colt a kicking in his stall? Stop your humping up your shoulders, though. That'll never do. Hop light, ladies. Oh, Miss Lou, it takes a heap of scroogin' for to get you through. Hop light, ladies. Oh, Miss Lou. If you niggers don't watch, you'll sing another tune, for the sun'll rise and catch you if you don't be mighty soon. And the stars is getting paler. And old gray coon is a-settin' in the grapevine, a-watchin' for the moon. When a feller comes a-knockin', just holler, oh, shoo! Hop light, ladies, oh, Miss Lou! Oh, swing dat, yaller gal, do, boys, do! Hop light, ladies, oh, Miss Lou! Oh, turn me loose, let me loan, go away now! What you speck a come a-dancin' fur? If I don't know how. These the very kind of foots is what kicks up a row. Can't you jump into the middle and make your gal a bow? Look at that merlotter man a follerin' up Sue. Hop light, ladies. Oh, Miss Lou, the boys ain't a goin' when you cry boo hoo. Hop light, ladies. Oh, Miss Lou. Song number seven is called Transcriptions, and there are two parts to it. Plant one is a plantation chant. It's eighteen hundred forty and four. Christ done open up that heavenly door, and I don't want to stay here no longer. It's eighteen hundred forty and five. Christ done made that dead man alive, and I don't want to stay here no longer. You ask me to run home, little children, run home, dat sun done roll, and I don't want to stay here no longer. It's eighteen hundred forty and six, Christ has got us a place done fix, and I don't want to stay here no longer. It's eighteen hundred forty and seven, Christ done sot a table in heaven, and I don't want to stay here no longer. You ask me to run home, little children, run home, dat sun done roll, and I don't want to stay here 
no longer. Hits eighteen hundred forty and eight. Christ done made that crooked way straight, and I don't want to stay here no longer. It's eighteen hundred forty and nine. Christ done turned that water into wine, and I don't want to stay here no longer. You ask me to run home, little children. Run home, that sun done roll, and I don't want to stay here no longer. It's eighteen hundred forty and ten. Christ is the Mona's only as friend, and I don't want to stay here no longer. It's eighteen hundred forty and eleven. Christ to be at the door when we all get to heaven, and I don't want to stay here no longer. You ask me to run home, little children. Run home, that sun done roll. And I don't want to stay here no longer. Part two: A Plantation Serenade. De old bee make de honeycomb, de young bee make de honey, de niggers make de cotton and de corn, and de white folks gets de money. De raccoon he is a curious man; he never walk twill dark. And nothing never disturbs his mind till he hear old Bringer bark. De raccoon totes a bushy tail. De possum totes no hair. Mister Rabbit he comes skipping by. He ain't got none to spare. Monday morning, break of day, a white folks got me gwine. But Saturday night, when the sun goes down, dat yaller girl's in my mind. Fifteen pound a meat a week, whiskey for to sell. Oh, how can a young man stay at home when dem gals they look so well? Met a possum in de road. Prayer possum, where you gwine? I thank my stars. I bless my life. I'm a hunting for de muscadine. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris, Volume Two: His Songs, Song Number Seven: The Big Bethel Church. The Big Bethel Church. De big Bethel Church done put old Satan behind 'em. If a sinner get loose from any other church, de big Bethel Church will find 'em. It's good to be dere and it's sweet to be dere with de sisterin all around you, a shakin dem shackles or mussy in love wherewith de Lord is bound you. It's sweet to be dere and listen to de hymns and hear de moaners a shoutin. They done reach the place where there ain't no room for any more weepin' and doubtin'. It's good to be dere when de sin is all jine wid de brotherin' in dere singin', and it look like Gabriel goin' to rack up and blow and set in heaven bells to ringin'. Oh, de big Bethel church, de big Bethel church, done put all Satan behind 'em. If a sinner get loose from any other church. The big Bethel Church will find 'em. This is the final song, number nine. Time goes by turns. There's a powerful wrestle twixt the good and the bad, and the bad's got to all under holt. But when the wuss come, she come ironclad. And you had to hold your breath for the jolt, but the toad is the last good gets the knee lock, and he drops to the ground kerflop. Good had the unturn, and he stand like a rock, and he bleeds for the bee on top. The dry weather breaks with a big thunderclap, for there ain't no drought what can last, but the season what whoops up the cotton crop. Likewise, they freshens up the grass. 
De rain fall so soft in de long dark night Twel you had to hold your hand for a sign But de drizzle what sets de tater slips right Is de makin' of de maypop vine in the mellerous ground the clay root'll catch and hold to the tongue of the plow and a pine pole gate at the garden patch never keep out the old brindle cow one and all on us knows who's a pullin at the bits like the lead mule that guides by the rain and yit somehow or another the bestest of us gets mighty sick of the tuggin at the chain Hump yourself to the load and forget the distress For dem what stands by for the scoff For the harder the pullin', the longer the rest And the bigger the feed in the trough End of the tale, end of the volume This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris Volume 3 A Story of the War When Miss Theodosia Huntington of Burlington, Vermont, concluded to come south in 1870, she was moved by three considerations. In the first place, her brother, John Huntington, had become a citizen of Georgia, having astonished his acquaintances by marrying a young lady, the male members of whose family had achieved considerable distinction in the Confederate Army. In the second place, she was anxious to explore a region which she had almost unconsciously pictured to herself as remote and semi-barbarous, and in the third place, her friends had persuaded her that to some extent she was an invalid. It was in vain that she argued with herself as to the propriety of undertaking the journey alone and unprotected, and she finally put an end to inward and outward doubts by informing herself and her friends, including John Huntington, her brother, who was practicing law in Atlanta, that she had decided to visit the South. When, therefore, on the 12th of October, 1870, the date is duly recorded in one of Miss Theodosia's letters, she alighted from the cars in Atlanta in the midst of a great crowd. She fully expected to find her brother waiting to receive her. The bells of several locomotives were ringing, a number of trains were moving in and out, and the porters and baggage men were screaming and brawling to such an extent that for several moments Miss Huntington was considerably confused, so much so that she paused in the hope that her brother would suddenly appear and rescue her from the smoke and dust, and din. At that moment some one touched her on the arm, and she heard a strong, half-confident, half-apologetic voice exclaim, "'Ain't this year, Miss Doshi?' Turning, Miss Theodosia saw at her side a tall, gray-haired negro. Elaborating the incident afterward to her friends, she was pleased to say that the appearance of the old man was somewhat picturesque. He stood towering above her his hat in one hand, a carriage-whip in the other, and an expectant smile lighting up his rugged face. She remembered a name her brother had often used in his letters, and, with a woman's tact, she held out her hand, and said, "'Is this Uncle Remus?' "'Law, Miss Doshi, how you know the old nigger? I knowed you by the favor, but how you know me?' And then, without waiting for a reply, Miss Sally, she's sick in bed, and Mars John, he bleeds to go in the country, and they took and sought me. I knowed you the minute I laid eyes on you. Time I seed you, I say to myself, I laid there's Miss Doshi, and sure enough, there you was. You ain't going up your checks, is you? Cause I get the trunk sought up by the express wagon. The next moment Uncle Remus was elbowing his way unceremoniously through the crowd, and in a very short time, seated in the carriage driven by the old man, Miss Huntington was whirling through the streets of Atlanta in the direction of her brother's home. She took advantage of the opportunity to study the old negro's face closely, 
her natural curiosity considerably sharpened by a knowledge of the fact that Uncle Remus had played an important part in her brother's history. The result of her observation must have been satisfactory, for presently she laughed and said, "'Uncle Remus, you haven't told me how you knew me in that great crowd.' The old man chuckled, and gave the horses a gentle rap with the whip. "'Who, me? I knowed you by the favor. Dat boy Mars John's is, is the very spittin' an image of you. I'd a knowed you in New Orleans, let alone down there in the car shed.' This was Miss Theodosia's introduction to Uncle Remus. One Sunday afternoon, a few weeks after her arrival, the family were assembled in the piazza, enjoying the mild weather. Mr. Huntington was reading a newspaper, his wife was crooning softly as she rocked the baby to sleep, and the little boy was endeavoring to show his Aunt Dozia the outlines of Kennesaw Mountain through the purple haze that hung like a wonderfully fashioned curtain in the sky and almost obliterated the horizon. While they were thus engaged, Uncle Remus came round the corner of the house talking to himself. "'They're too lazy to work,' he was saying, "'and they specs honest folks for to stand up and sport em. I'm going down to Putman County where Ma's Jeems is. That's what I'm a-going to do.' "'What's the matter now, Uncle Remus?' inquired Mr. Huntington, folding up his newspaper. "'Nothin' tall, Mars John, exceptin' these year sunshine niggers. They begs my tobacco, and borrows my tools, and steals my vittles, and it's done come to dat pass that I gotta pack up and go. I'm a-gwine down to Putman, dat's what.' Uncle Remus was accustomed to make this threat several times a day, but upon this occasion it seemed to remind Mr. Huntington of something. "'Very well,' he said. I'll come around and help you pack up, but before you go, I want you to tell Sister here how you went to war and fought for the Union. Remus was a famous warrior, he continued, turning to Miss Theodosia. He volunteered for one day, and commanded an army of one. You know the story, but you've never heard Remus's version. Uncle Remus shuffled around in an awkward, embarrassed way, scratched his head, and looked uncomfortable. Miss Doshy ain't got no time for to set there and hear the old nigger run on. Oh, yes, I have, Uncle Remus, exclaimed the young lady. Plenty of time. The upshot of it was that, after many ridiculous protests, Uncle Remus sat down on the steps and proceeded to tell his story of the war. Miss Theodosia listened with great interest, but throughout it all she observed, and she was painfully conscious of the fact, as she afterward admitted, that Uncle Remus spoke from the standpoint of a Southerner, and with the air of one who expected his hearers to thoroughly sympathize with him. "'Course,' said Uncle Remus, addressing himself to Miss Theodosia, "'you ain't been to Putman, and you don't know where the Brad Slaughter Place and Harmony Grove is, but Mars John and Miss Sally, they been there a time or two, and they knows how de land lays. Well, den, it was right long and dare where Mars James lived, and where he lived now. When de war come long, he was livin' dere longer old Miss and Miss Sally. Old Miss was his ma, and Miss Sally dare was his sister. De war come just like I tell you, and Mars sort of rock along same as they allers did. It didn't strike me that there was any war going on, but if I hadn't sort of missed the neighbors, and seed folks going out of the way for to ax the news, I'd allowed to myself that the war was way off among some other country. But all this time the fuss was going on, and Mars Jeems, he was just itching for to put in. Ole Miss and Miss Sally, they took on so he didn't get off the first year. But by and by, news come down at times was gettin' pretty hot, and Mars Jeems he got up, he did, and say he gotta go, and go he did. He got a overseer for to look after the place, and he went and joined the army. And he was a fighter, too, Mars Jeems was. Many's and many's the time, continued the old man reflectively, that I had a taken brush that boy on account of his busin' and beatin' dem other boys. 
he went off there for to fight, and he fit. Ole Miss used to call me up Sunday and read what the papers say about Mars Jeems, and it hope her up mightily. I can see it just like it was yesterday. Remus, says she, dis year's what the papers say about my baby. And then she read out twill she couldn't read for crying. It went on this way year in and year out, and them was lonesome times, shows your bone, Miss Doshy. Lonesome times, show. Sure. It got hotter and hotter in the war, and lonesomer and more lonesomer at home. And by and by, long come the conscription man, and he just everlastingly scoop up Mars Jeems' overseer. When this come about, old Miss, she sawed after me and says, says she, Remus, I ain't got nobody for to look after the place but you, says she, and then I up and say, says I, Mistress, you can just pin on the old nigger. I was old then, Miss Dosha, let alone what I is now, and you better believe I bossed them hands. I had them niggers up in the field long for day, and the way they did work was a caution. If they didn't earn their vittles dat season, then I ain't named Remus. But they was tuck kiran. They had plenty of clothes, plenty of grub, and they was the fattest niggers in the settlement. By and by, one day, old Miss, she called me up and say the Yankees done gone and took Atlante, dis year very town. Then presently I hear there was a marching on down towards Putman, and lo and beholds, one day the first news I knowed, Mars James he rid up with a whole gang of men. He just stopped long enough for to change horses and snatch a muffle of something to eat. But fore he rid off, he call up and say, says he, Daddy, all old Mrs. Chillins call me Daddy. Daddy, he say, pears like there's gwine to be mighty rough times round here. The Yankees, they are done got to Madison and Monticello, and twon't be many days fore to get down here. Tain't likely they'll pester mother nor sister, but Daddy, if the worst come to the worst, I spec you to take care of em says he. Then I say, says I, How long you been know me, Mars Jeems? says I. Since I was a baby, says he. Well then, Mars Jeems, says I, you know twa'n't no use for to ax me to take care of old Miss and Miss Sally. Then he took and squoze my hand, and jump on the filly I've been saving for him, and rid off. One time he turned around, looked like he want to say something, but he just wave his hand, so he gallop on. I know den the trouble was brewing. Nigger that knows he's gwine to get thump can sort of fix hisself, and I tuck and fix up like the wall was gwine to come right in at the front gate. I took and got all the cattle and horses together, and driv em to the four mile place and I took all the corn and fodder and wheat, and put em in a crib out there in the woods, and I built me a pen in the swamp, and there I put the hogs. Then, when I fix all this, I put on my Sunday clothes and ground my axe. Two whole days I ground that axe. The grindstone was inside of the gate and close to the big house, and there I took my stand. By and by, one day, here come the Yankees. Two of em come fuss, and den the whole face of the earth swam with em. The first glimpse I caught of em, I took my axe and marched into old Miss settin' room. She done had the sideboard moved in there, and I wish I may drap if it weren't fairly blazin' with silver. Silver cups and silver saucers, silver plates and silver dishes, silver mugs and silver pitchers. Look like to me they was fixin' for a wedding. There sot old Miss just as prim and as proud as if she owned a whole county. This kind of hoped me up, cause I done seed old Miss look that away once before when the overseer struck me in the face with a whip. I sot down by the fire with my axe tween my knees. 
There we sot whilst the Yankees ransacked the place. Miss Sally there, she got sort of restless, but old Miss don't scarcely bat her eyes. By and by, we hear steps on the piazza, and here come a couple of young fellows with strops on their shoulders, and the sods a dragon on the floor, and the spurs a rattling. I won't say I was skeered, said Uncle Remus, as though endeavoring to recall something he failed to remember. I won't say I was skeered, cause I wasn't, but I was took with a mighty funny feeling in the neighborhood of my gizzard. They was mighty perlite, dem young chaps was, but old Miss, she never turned her head, and Miss Sally, she looked straight at the fire. By and by one of em see me, and he say, says he, Hello, old man, what you doin' in here? says he. Well, boss, says I, I been cuttin' some wood for old Miss, and I just stop for to warm my hands a little, says I. It is cold, that's a fact, says he. With that, I got up and took my stand behind old Miss and Miss Sally, and the man would speak, he went up and warm his hands. First thing you know, he raise up sudden and say, says he, what that on your axe? That's the fire shining on it, says I. It look like blood, says he, and then he laughed. But bless your soul, dat man wouldn't laugh that day if he'd know the workings of Remus's mind. But they didn't bother nobody nor touch nothing, and by and by they all put out. Well, the Yankees they kept passing all the morning, and it looked like to me they was a string of em ten mile long. Then they commenced getting thinner and thinner, and then after a while we hear skirmishing in the neighborhood of Armour's Ferry, and old Miss Low how dat was Wheeler's men making pursuit. Mars Jeems was with dem Wheeler fellers, and I knowed if they was dat close I wasn't doing no good sitting round the hose toasting my shins at the fire. So I just took Mars Jeems's rifle from behind the door and put out to look after my stock. Seem like I ain't never seen no raw day like that, neither before nor since. There wa'n't no rain, but the wet just sifted down. Mighty raw day. The leaves on the ground was so wet they don't make no fuss, and I got in the woods, and whenever I hear the Yankees going by, I just stop in my tracks and let him pass. I was standing that way in the edge of the woods, looking out across the clearing when, piff, out come a little bunch of blue smoke from the top of one of them lonesome looking pines, and then pow. Says I to myself, says I, honey, you are right on my route, and I'll just see what kind of bird you got roosting in you. And whiles I was a looking out boost the smoke, piff, and then bang, with that I just drapped back into the woods and, and sort of skeerted round so's to get the tree twixt me and the road. I slid up putty close, and what do you spect I see? Just as sho as you're sitting there listening, they was a live Yankee up there in that tree, and he was a loadin' and a shootin' at the boys just as cool as a cowcumber in the dew, and he had his hoss hitch out in the bushes, cause I hear the creature trompling round. He had a spyglass up dar, and whiles I was a watchin' of him, he raise up and look through her, and then he lay her down and fix his gun for to shoot. I had good eyes in dem days, if I ain't got em now, and way up the big road I see Mars Jeems a comin'. It was too fur for to see his face, but I knowed him by the filly what I raised for him, and she was a prancin' like a school gal. I knowed dat man was gwine to shoot Mars Jeems if he could, and dat was more'n I could stand. Many's and many's the time did I nuss that boy, and hilt him in dese arms, and toted him on dis back, and when I see dat Yankee lay dat gun cross a limb, and take aim at Mars Jeems, I up with my old rifle, and shut my eyes, and let the man have all she had. Do you mean to say, exclaimed Miss Theodosia indignantly, that you shot the Union soldier when you knew he was fighting for your freedom? 
course i know about all dat responded uncle remus and it sort of made cold chills run up my back but when i see dat man take aim and mars jeems gwine home for de old miss and miss sally i just disremembered all about freedom and lammed loose and den after dat me and miss sally took a nuster man right straight along he lost one arm in dat tree business but me and miss sally we nuss him and we nuss him twill he done got well just about dat time i quit nussin him but miss sally she kep on she kep on continued uncle remus pointing to mr huntington and now dere he is but you cost him an arm exclaimed miss theodosia i give him dan said uncle remus pointing to mrs huntington and i give him these holding up his own brawny arms and if dem ain't enough for any man then i done lost the way end of the tale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith, of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus, by Joel Chandler Harris. Volume 4. Entitled His Sayings. The first one is entitled, James Robertson's Last Illness. A Jonesboro Negro, while waiting for the train to go out, met up with Uncle Remus. After the usual time of day had been passed between the two, the former inquired about an acquaintance. "'How's Jim's Robertson?' he said. "'Ain't you year about Jim?' asked Uncle Remus. "'Dat I ain't,' responded the other. "'I ain't hear talk of Jim since he cut loose from the chain gang. "'Dat what a axe. He, he ain't down with the biliousness, is he?' not that i knows of responded uncle remus gravely he ain't sick he ain't been sick he just took and say he was going to ride dat ere roan mule of mars jones's the other sunday and de mule she up and do like she got another engagement i done been fooled with dat mule before and i took and told jim dat he better not get tangled up with her but jim he up and loud that he was a hoss doctor and with dat he axed me for a chaw to back her and den he got the bridle and took and cotched the mule and got on her well continued uncle remus looking uneasily around i spec you better go get your ticket they tells me dis yer train goes a callyhootin hold on there uncle remus you ain't tell me about jim exclaimed the jonesboro negro i done tell you all i knows child Jim, he tuck and light on de mule, and de mule, she up and hump herself, and den dey was a scuffle, and when de dust blow away, dere lay de nigger on de ground, and de mule, she stood eatin at de trough with one or Jim's galusses wrop round her behind leg. Den afterwards, de coroner, he come round, he tuck and give it out that Jim died sort of accidental-like. It's just like I tell you. The nigger weren't sick a minute. So long, by and by, you won't catch your train. I got to be knocking long. Number two, Uncle Remus's church experience. The deacon of a colored church met Uncle Remus recently, and after some uninteresting remarks about the weather, asked, "How dis you don't come down to church no more, brother Remus?" We've been a having some mighty refreshing times lately. It's been a long time since I've been down there, Brer Rastus, and it'll be longer. I done got my dose. You ain't done gone and unjoined, is you, Brother Remus? Not exactly, Brer Rastus. I just took and drawed out. De members is a blame sight too mutual for to suit my doctrines. How was that, Brer Remus? Well, I tell you, Brer Rastus, when I went to dat church, I went just as umble as de next one. I went there for to sing, and for to pray, and for to worship, and I most generally always had a stray shimplaster, which de old woman says she won't sot out there to dem colored folks cross the water. 
Hit went on dis away twel bimeby, one day, de fust news I knowed, there was a row got up in de Amen corner. Brer Dick, he announced that dey weren't enough money in de box, and Brer Sim said if dey weren't, he speck Brer Dick knowed where it disappeared to, and then Brer Dick lowed dat he won't stand no probusness, and with dat he haul off and took Brer Sim under de jaw ker blap and then they clinched and drapped on the floor and fought under the branches and among the women. About that time, Sis Tempy, she lipped up in the air and sing out that she gone and trample on the old boy. She kept on lipping up and slinging out her hands till by and by blip she took Sis Becky in the mouth. And then Sis Becky riz and fetch a grab at Sis Tempy. And I clare to gracious, if it didn't appear to me that she got a pounder wool, after dat, the revivin' sort of head up like. Both of em had kin mong the mourners, and if you ever see scufflin' and scramblin', hit was then and dare. Brer James Henry, he mounted Brer Plato, and rid him over de railin', and den de preacher, he start down from de pulpit, and just as he was skippin' on to de platform, a hymn book caught him in de burr of de year and I'd be blessed if it didn't sound like a bung-shelled busted. Just then, Brer Jesse, he riz up in his seat, sort of careless-like, and went down into his britches after his razor, and right then I knowed sho sure enough trouble was begun. Sis Dilse, she seated herself, and she tuck and let off one of dem hallelujah hollers, and then I disremember what come to pass. I get sort of old, Brer Rastus, it seemed like the dust sort of shut out the panorama. Furthermore, my limbs got to aching, and more especially when I hear Brer Sim and Brer Dick a snorting and a scuffling under the benches, like they was sort of making their way to my pew. So I kind of hump myself and scramble out, and the first man what I seed was a policeman, and he had a nigger arrested, and the forgiven name of that nigger was Remus didn't rest you, did he, Brer Remus? It's just like I tell you, Brer Rastus, and I had to get Mars John for to go into my bones for me. It ain't no use for to sing out church to me, Brer Rastus. I done been and got my dose. When I goes to war, I want to know what I'm a-doin'. I don't want to get hemmed up among no women and preachers. I wants elbow room, and I'm bleeds to have it. Just give me elbow room. But, Brer Remus, you ain't... I might drop in, Brer Rastus. Then again, I mightn't. But when you see me saunter in the door with my specs on, you can just say to the congregation, sort of familiar like, here come old man Remus with his hoss pistol, and if there's much of a scuffle round you this evening, you're going to hear from him. That's me, and that's what you can tell him. So long. Remember me to Sis Abby. Saying number three, Uncle Remus and the Savannah Darkey. The notable difference existing between the Negroes in the interior of the cotton states and those on the seaboard, a difference that extends to habits and opinions as well as to dialect, has given rise to certain ineradicable prejudices which are quick to display themselves whenever an opportunity offers. These prejudices were forcibly, as well as ludicrously, illustrated in Atlanta recently. A gentleman from Savannah had been spending the summer in the mountains of North Georgia, and found it convenient to take along a body-servant. This body-servant was a very fine specimen of the average coast negro, sleek, well-conditioned, and consequential, disposed to regard with undisguised contempt everything and everybody not indigenous to the rice-growing region, and he paraded around the streets with quite a curious and critical air. Espying Uncle Remus languidly sunning himself on a corner, the savannah darkey approached. "'Mawnin', sah!' "'I'm sort of up and about,' responded Uncle Remus, carelessly and calmly. How is you standin' it? Thank you, you. My help most so-so. He more hot than in the mountain. Seems so like man must get needed to shade. I ain't if I see no rice bud in dis parts. 
"'In dis which?' inquired Uncle, with a sudden affectation of interest. "'In dis parts, in dis country, de plenty in Savannah.' "'Plenty where?' "'De plenty in Savannah. I ain't if I see no crab and no osher, no swimp, and no stan ran. I like some rice bud now.' "'You are talking about these year sparrows, which they are all head, and leaven of makes one mouthful. I spec, suggested Uncle Remus. Well, they are year, he continued, but this ain't no climate where the rice bird flies into your pockets, and gets out the money and makes the change to self. And the oysters don't shuck off the shells and run o' you in the street. And no more does the simp hold themselves and drop in your mouth. But they are here, though. The scads'll fetch em. Hit poor country for true, commented the Savannah Negro. He no likes Sawanee. Down there, we set and eat the shade and eat the rice bud, and the crab, and the swim tree time of day, and the buckram man drinking him wine, and smoking him cigar all true to night. Plenty to eat, not much for work. It's mighty nice, I spec, responded Uncle Remus gravely. The nigger that ain't hope up longer high feedin' ain't got no grip. But up here, where folks has got to scramble round and make their own livin', the vittles what's cumulated without any sweatin' most always generally belongs to some other man by rights. One hoe cake and a rasher of middlin' meat lasts me from Sunday to Sunday, and I'm in a mighty big streak of luck when I gets that. The Savannah Negro here gave utterance to a loud, contemptuous laugh, and began to fumble somewhat ostentatiously with a big brass watch-chain. "'But I speck I struck up with a paying job last Tuesday,' continued Uncle Remus, in a hopeful tone. "'Where you gwan do?' "'Oh, I'm a-waitin' on a culled gentleman from Savannah, one of these year high-livers you been tellin' bout. "'How dat?' I loaned him two dollars, responded Uncle Remus grimly, and I'm a waitin on him for the money. It's one of these yer jobs what lasts a long time. The Savannah Negro went off after his rice birds, while Uncle Remus leaned up against the wall and laughed until he was in an imminent danger of falling down from sheer exhaustion. End of the saying. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. We're working on Volume 4, His Sayings. This one is entitled Turnip Salad as a Text. As Uncle Remus was going down the street recently, he was accosted by several acquaintances. "'Hey, yo,' said one. "'Here comes Uncle Remus. He looks like he's going for to set up a boarding house.' Several others bantered the old man, but he appeared to be in a good humor. He was carrying a huge basket of vegetables. "'How many of you boys,' said he, as he put his basket down, "'is done a hand's turn this day? And yet the week's done commence.' I hear talk of niggers that's got money in de bank, but I lay it ain't none of you fellas. Where you speck you're going to get your dinner, and how you speck you're going to get long? Oh, we sort of knocks round and picks up a livin', responded one. That's what make I say what I does, said Uncle Remus. Folks go bout in de daytime and makes a livin', and you come along when they are restin' their bones and picks it up. I ain't no hand at figures, but I lay I can count up right here in the sand and number up how many days it'll be for you are coupled on to the chain gang. The old man's hollering now, sure, said one of the listeners, gazing with admiration on the venerable old darky. I ain't taking no chances bout vittles. It's proned into me from the first that I got to eat and I knows that I got for the grub for what I gets. It's against the mortal law for niggers for to eat when they don't work, and when you see em apparently fatten on air, 
you can just bet that ruination's going on somewheres. I got mustard and poke salad and lamb's quarter in dat basket, and me and my old woman gwine to sample it. If any you boys get a invite, you come. But if you don't, you better stay away. I got a musket out dar what's used to persuadin' round where dere's a cripple nigger. Don't you forget dat off on your mind. End of the saying. Saying number five, a confession. What's dis year, I see? Great big niggers gwine lopin' round town with cakes and pies for to sell? said Uncle Remus recently, in his most scornful tone. That's what they're doing, responded the young man. That's the way they make a living. Dat what make I say what I does. Dat what keep me grumbling when I goes in colored folks' society. Some niggers ain't going to work nohow, and it's flinging way time for to set any chain gang traps for to catch em. Well, here now, exclaimed the young man in a dramatic tone, what are you giving us now? Isn't it just as honest and just as regular to sell pies as it is to do any other kind of work? Tain't dat, boss, said the old man, seeing that he was about to be cornered. Tain't dat. It's the nastiness of it which gets me. Oh, get out! Das me, boss, up and down. If there's ruination anywhere in the known world, she goes into company of a hungry nigger what's a totin' pies round. Sometimes when I get caught with emptiness in the pit of the stomach, and get to fairly honin' after something what got substance in it, then it look like unto me that I can stand flat-footed and make more clear money eatin' pies than I could if I were to sell the last one twixt this and Christmas. And a nigger what can traipse round with pies and not get in no alleyway and sample em, then I'm bleeds to say, dat nigger out niggers me and my family, so dare now. End of saying. Saying number six, Uncle Remus with the toothache. When Uncle Remus put in an appearance one morning recently, his friends knew he had been in trouble. He had a red cotton handkerchief tied under his chin, and the genial humor that usually makes his aged face its dwelling-place had given way to an expression of grim melancholy. The young men about the office were inclined to chaff him, but his look of sullen resignation remained unchanged. "'What revival did you attend last night?' inquired one. "'What was the color of the mule that did the hammering?' asked another. I was told the old man that a suburban chicken coop would fall on him, remarked someone. A strange pig has been squealing in his ear, suggested someone else. But Uncle Remus remained impassive. He seemed to have lost all interest in what was going on around him, and he sighed heavily as he seated himself on the edge of the trash box in front of the office. Finally someone asked in a sympathetic tone, "'What's the matter, old man? You look like you've been through the mill.' "'Now you're knockin'. I ain't been through the mill since day four yesterday, then day ain't no mills in de land. If one of these year excursion trains had runned over me, I couldn't have been worse off. I've been trompin' round in the low grounds now gwine on seventy-five year, but I ain't seen no such times as dat which I done seen now. Boss, is any of you all ever wrestle with the toothache? Oh, hundreds of times. The toothache isn't anything. Then you just played around the ages. You ain't had the kind what caught me on the underjaw. You might have had a gum bile, but you ain't been bothered with the toothache. I was setting up talking with my old woman, kind of puzzling round for to see what the next meal's vittles was a going to come from. And I feel a little ache, sort of crawling long on my jawbone, kind of feeling his way. But the ache don't stay long. He sort of hankered round like, and then croaked back where he come from. By and by, I feel him coming again, and this time it looked like he come up closer. 
kind of skummishin round for to see how de land lay. Den he went off. Presently I feel him comin', and dis time it looked like he carried the news under Mary, for it feel like there was another one wid him. They crep up, and they crep round, and then they crope off. By and by they come back, and this time they come like they wasn't feared to the surroundings, for they trot right up into the tooth, sort of zamin it like, and then trot all round it, like these yer circuitous hosses. I sought their mighty calm, but I expected that something was going to happen. And it happened, did it? asked someone in the group surrounding the old man. "'Boss, don't you forget it,' responded Uncle Remus fervidly. "'When dey makes gallop back, they gallop for to stay, "'and dey was so mixed up that I couldn't tell one from de other. "'All night long dey racked and dey galloped, "'and when dey got tired of racking and gallopin', "'dey all closed in on de old tooth and thumped it and gouged at it "'twill it appeared unto me they had the jawbone loosened up, and was trying for to fetch it up through the top of my head and out at the back of my neck. And they got worse next day. Mars John, he seed I was distracted, and he told me for to go round here and get something put on it. And the drug man, he lowed that I better have her drawed, and his words wasn't more cold for one of these here watchamac columns, one of these, uh, Dennis man's had wretch for it with a pair of tongs what don't turn loose when they catches a holt. Leastways, they didn't with me. You ought to seed that tooth, boss. It was one of these yer full prong fellas. If she'd a growed wrong end outward, I'd a been a bad nigger long after I joined the church. You hear me, hun? End of saying. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Volume 4 His Sayings. Saying number 7 The Phonograph. Uncle Remus asked a tall, awkward-looking negro, who was one of a crowd surrounding the old man. "'What's dish year what they calls the phonograph? Dish year instrument what can holler round like little chillin' in the back yard?' "'I ain't seen em said Uncle Remus, feeling in his pocket for a fresh chew of tobacco. "'I ain't seen em but I yet talk of em Miss Sally was a readin' in the papers last Tuesday, and she say that it's a mighty big—' "'What you may call em "'A mighty big witch?' asked one of the crowd. "'A mighty big what's-his-name?' answered Uncle Remus cautiously. "'I wasn't up there close to where Miss Sally was a-readin', "'but I kind of gathered in that it was one of these yer what's-his-names "'what you hollers into one year, and it comes out the other. "'It's mighty funny unto me how these folks can go and prognosticate their echoes "'into one of these yer iron boxes, "'and dare it'll stay until the man comes along and turns the handle "'and lets the fuss come piling out. "'By and by they'll get to making show sure enough folks, "'and then there'll be a racket round here. "'They tells me that it goes off like one of these yer torpedoes.' "'You hear that, don't you?' said one or two of the younger negroes. "'That's what they tells me,' continued Uncle Remus. "'That's what they says. "'It's one of these here kind of what's his names "'what sasses back when you hollers at it.' "'What they fix em for, Dan?' asked one of the practical negroes. "'That's what I want to know,' said Uncle Remus contemplatively. "'But that's what Miss Sally was a readin' in the paper.' All you gotta do is holler at the box, and there's your remarks. They goes in, and there they are tookin, and there they hangs on twill you shakes the box, and then they drops out just as fresh as these yer fishes what you get from Savannah, 
and you ain't got time for to look at their gills nitter. End of the saying. Saying number eight. Race improvement. There's a kind of limberness about niggers these days that's mighty curious, remarked Uncle Remus yesterday, as he deposited a pitcher of fresh water upon the exchange table. I notices it in the alleyways and on the street corners. They are rackin' up, mon, these yer colored folks is. What are you trying to give us now? inquired one of the young men in a bilious tone. The old man's mind is wandering, said the society editor, smoothing the wrinkles out of his lavender kids. Uncle Remus laughed. I spect I is a get more frailer than I was for the farming days was over, but I sees with my eyes and I ears with my ear, same as any of these here young bucks what's go gallopin round hutin up devilment. And when I sees the limberness of these here colored people, and when I sees how they are dancin up, then I get sort of hopeful. They are kind of catchin up with me. How is that? Oh, they are moving," responded Uncle Remus. "They are sort of coming round. They are getting so they believe that they ain't no better than the white folks. When freedom come out, the niggers sort of get their humps up, and they stayed that way. Twill by and by they begun for to get hungry, and then they began for to drop into line right smartually. And now," continued the old man emphatically. They are just as palaverous as they was before the war. They are getting on solid ground, man. You think they're improving, then? You are chawing government now, boss. You slap the law onto a nigger a time or two, and larn him that he's got fur to look after his own rations and keep out of other folks' chicken coops, and sort of coax him into the idea that he's got to feed his own chillins. And I be blessed if you ain't got him on rising ground. And more'n dat, when he gets hold of the fact that a nigger can have yaller fever same as white folks, you done got him on de Mona's bench. And den if you come down strong on de point that he ought to stand fast by de folks what help him when he was in trouble, the job's done. When you does that, if you ain't got your hands on a new made nigger. Then my name ain't Remus, and if that name's been changed, I ain't seen her advertised. End of saying. Saying number nine in the role of a tartar. A Charleston negro who was in Atlanta on the fourth of July made a mistake. He saw Uncle Remus edging his way through the crowd and thought he knew him. Howdy, Daddy Ben. The stranger exclaimed, "I think I never see you no more. Where you goin? He hot for true, ain't he?" "Daddy, which?" asked Uncle Remus, straightening himself up with dignity. "Which?" "I know you in Charleston and den in Suwanee. I speck I done grow away from membrance." "You know me in Charleston and den in Savanny?" "He been long time, ain't he, Daddy Ben?" That's what a pesterin' of me. How much you reckon you knowed me? He good while past, but I were pickin' any. He's long time ago. Where you goin', Daddy Ben? What does you season your recollection with for to make it hold on so? Inquired the old man. I don't know. He's stick hisself. I see you comin' long, and I say, hey, dear Daddy Ben. I think I see you no more, but I shake you by the hand. Where you goin'? There no place where we can get wine. Uncle Remus stared at the strange darky curiously for a moment, and then he seized him by the arm. Come here, son, where there ain't no folks, and let me drop some Georgia ointment in dem years o' yon. You're mighty fur ways from home, and you want to be a lookin' out for yourself. First and foremost, you are thumping the wrong water million. You are whistling up the wrong tube. I ain't tromped round the country much. I ain't been to Charleston, and neither is I took in Savannah. 
but you couldn't rig up no game on me dat I wouldn't tumble on to it the minute I laid my eyeballs on you. When it come dat, I'm old man Tumbler from Tumblersville. I is dat. It takes one of dese yer full-blooded white men for to trap my judgment. But when a nigger comes a jabbering round like he got a mouthful of rice straw, he ain't got no more chance alongside of me than a six sparrow with a squinch owl. You gotta travel with a circus for you gets away with me. You better go long, get your carpet sack, and skip this town. You are the freshest nigger what I seen yet. The Charleston Negro passed on just as a policeman came up. Boss, you see dat smart Alec? Yes, what's the matter with him? He's one of dese yer scursion niggers from Charleston. I seed you a standin' over agin the corner yonder, and if dat nigger had drawed his monte cards on me, I was a gwine to holler for you. Would you a come, boss? Why, certainly, Uncle Remus. Dat's what I loud. Little more he had been aboard the wrong wagon. That's what he'd have been. And a saying. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Volume 4. Saying number 10. A case of measles. You've been looking like you were rather under the weather for the past week or two, Uncle Remus, said a gentleman to the old man. You'd be sort of puny too, boss, if you'd have been where I been. Where have you been? Peer to me like everybody done you about that. There ain't no old nigger my age and size that's had no rattling her time than I is. A kind of picnic? Go long, boss. What you speck I be doin' sailin' round at these yer colored picnics? Much more than I wouldn't make bread by workin' for it, let alone followin' up a passel of boys and gals all over curation. Boss, ain't you here about it sure enough? I haven't really. What was the matter? I got struckin' with a sickness and she hit this old nigger a Joe daughter for sure before she turned him loose. What kind of sickness? It looks sort of curious, boss, but old and steady as I is, I took and caught the measles. Oh, get out! You're trying to get up a sensation. It's a natural fact, boss. I declare to gracious if it ain't. They sort of come on with a cold like. Well, at least ways, that's how I commence for to suffer and did her cough got straddled at coal. One of these here coughs, what looks like it goes to the foundation. I kept on lingering round sort of keepin one eye on the rheumatiz, and the other on the distemper, twill by and by I begin for to feel the tress of work give way, and then I just knowed that I was gwine to get a racket. I slipped into bed one Tuesday night, and I never slip out no more for mighty nigh on a month. Next morning the measles done covered me, and den if I didn't get dosted by the old woman like a Chinee, she give me back rations of sassafras tea. I just naturally hankered and got hungry after water, and every time I sing out for water, I got boiling hot sassafras tea. It got so that when I wake up in the morning, the old woman just come along with a kittle of tea and fill me up. They tells me round town that chillins don't get hurted with the measles, which if they don't, I want to be a baby the next time they hits this place. All this year measles business is brand new to me. In old times, for the war, I ain't here tellin' no seventy-five-year-old nigger grapplin' with no measles. They ain't catchin' no more, is they, boss? Oh, no, I suppose not. "'Cause if they is, you can just put my name down with the migration niggers." End of the saying. Saying number 11, The Immigrants When Uncle Remus went down to the passenger depot one morning recently, the first sight that caught his eye was an old negro man, a woman, and two children sitting in the shade near the door of the baggage room. 
one of the children was very young, and the quartet was altogether ragged and forlorn-looking. The sympathies of Uncle Remus were immediately aroused. He approached the group by forced marches, and finally unburdened his curiosity. "'Where's you wandering on ter, pard?' The old negro, who seemed to be rather suspicious, looked at Uncle Remus coolly, and appeared to be considering whether he should make any reply. Finally, however, he stretched himself and said, "'We are gwine down to the neighborhoods of Tallapoosey, and we ain't making no fuss about it, neither.' "'I disremember,' said Uncle Remus thoughtfully, "'where Tallapoosey is.' "'Oh, it's out there, yonder replied the old man, motioning his head as if it were just beyond the iron gates of the depot. "'Hit's down in Alabama. When we get there, maybe we'll go on twelve we gets to Mississippi.' "'Is you got any folks out there?' inquired Uncle Remus. "'None did I knows of. "'And you were taking dis woman and dese chillin out there where they don't know nobody? "'Where's your provisions?' eyeing a chest with a rope around it. Dams are bed clothes, the old negro explained, noticing the glance of Uncle Remus. All de vittles what we got we et for we started. And you spect for to reach there safe and sound? Where's your ticket? Ain't got none. The man says how they pass us through. I give a man a five dollar bill for I left Jonesboro, and he said that settled it. Let me tell you dis said Uncle Remus, straightening up indignantly. You go and rob somebody, and get on the chain gang, and let the woman scratch round and make out her living. But don't you get on them cars. Don't you do it. Your best hope is the chain gang. You can make your living there when you can't make it nowheres else. But don't you get on them cars. If you do, you are gone, nigger. If you ain't got no money for to walk back with, you just better build your nest right here. I'm a-talkin' with the bark on. I done see these yer Arkansas emigrants come lopin' back, and some of em don't have rags enough on em for to hide their nakedness. You leave that box right where she is, and let the woman take one young one, and you take the other one, and then you get in the middle of the big road and pull out for the place where you come from. I'm a-preachin' now those who watched say the quartet didn't take the cars and of the saying saying number 12 as a murderer uncle remus met a police officer recently you ain't here talk of no dead nigger nowhere this morning is you boss asked the old man earnestly no replied the policeman reflectively no i believe not have you heard of any Feels unto me that I come mighty nigh getting some news about that size, and that's what I'm a hunting fur. Because if they are found a stray nigger laying round loose, with his breath gone, then I want to go home and get my breakfast and put on some clean clothes, and deliver myself up to one of these yer justices of the peace, and get a fair trial. Why, have you killed anybody? That's what I'm acquiring into now, but I wouldn't be as astonished if I ain't laid a nigger out somewheres on the suburbs. It's done got so it's agin the law for to bust loose and kill a nigger, ain't it, boss? Well, I should say so. You don't mean to tell me that you have killed a colored man, do you? I speck I is, boss. I speck I done gone and done it this time, sure. It's been sort of growin' on me, and it come to a head this morning, unless my name ain't Remus, and that's what they've been a-callin' me since I was old enough for to scratch myself with my left hand. Well, if you've killed a man, you'll have some fun, sure enough. How was it? It was this way, boss. I was layin' in my bed this mornin', sort of ruminatin' round, when the first news I knowed I hear a fuss among the chickens, and then my bristles riz. I done a had lots of trouble with dem chickens, and when I years one of em squall, my very shoes come untied. So I sort of riz up and retch for my old musket, and then I crope out at the back door, and what do you reckon I seed? I couldn't say. I seed the biggest, blackest nigger that you ever laid eyes on. He shined like the paint on him was fresh. 
he had done grabbed four of my forwardest pullets. I crope up nigh the door, and hollered and axed him how he was a-gittin' on, and then he broke. And as he broke, I jammed a gun into small of his back and banged a loose. He let out a yell like forty yaller cats a-courtin', and then he broke. You ain't seed no nigger hump himself like dat nigger. He tore down de well shelter and four panels of fence, and de ground looked like one of these year hurricanes had lit there and fanned up de yeath. Why, I thought you killed him. He bleeds to be dead, boss. Ain't I put de gun right on him? Seemed like I feel him give way when she went off. Was the gun loaded? That's what my old woman say. She had powder in there, sure. But I disremember whether I put the buckshot in, and whether I left them out. Leastways, I'm going to call on one of these here justices. So long, boss. End of the saying. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Volume 4 His Sayings. Saying number 13 his practical view of things. Brer Remus, is you hearin tell er dees doin's out yere in de other end of town? asked a colored deacon of the church the other day. What doin's is dat, Brer Ab? Dees yer signs and wonders where dat colored lady died day fo' yesterday. Mighty queer goin's on out there, Brer Remus. Show us your born. "'Spirits?' inquired Uncle Remus, sententiously. "'Wuss'n dat, Brer Remus. Some say the judgment day ain't fur off, and the folks is flockin' round the house a-hollerin' and a-shoutin' just like they was in the revival. In the windy glass there you can see the flags a-flyin', and Jacob's ladder's there, and there's writin' on the pane what no man can read. Leastways, there ain't none can read it yet.' What kind of racket is this you give me now, Brer Ab? I done been there, Brer Remus. I done seed with both my eyes. Cut a lady what was in trance done woke up and say they ain't much time for to tarry. She says she meet a angel in the road, and he pointed straight for the morning star and tell her for to prepare. He looked mighty curious, Brer Remus. Come down to that, Brer Ab said Uncle Remus, wiping his spectacles carefully, and readjusting them. "'Come down to dat, and de ain't nothin' dat ain't curious. I ain't no spicious nigger myself, but I despises for to hear dogs a-howlin', and squinch owls havin' to agur out in de woods, and when a bull goes a-bellerin' by de house, then my bones get cold, and my flesh commences for to creep. But when it comes to these yer signs in de air, and these yer spirits in de woods, den I'm out, den I'm done. I is for a fact. I've been livin' yer more'n seventy year, and I yer talk a nigger seein' ghosts all times a night and all times a day, but I ain't never seed none yet, and these yer flags and Jacob Lathers, I ain't seen dem neither. They are there, Brer Remus. It's just like I tell you, Brer Ab, I ain't sputin' about it, but I ain't seen em, and I don't take no chances these days on dat what I don't see, and dat what I sees I got to examine mighty close. Let me tell you this, Brer Ab, don't you let these signs on settle you. When old man Gabriel toot his horn, he ain't going to hang no sign out in the window panes, and when old father Jacob lets down dat ladder of his'n's, You've been mighty apt for to hit a racket. And don't you bother with Judgment Day. Judgment Day's liable for to take care of itself. That's so, Brer Remus. It's bleeds to be so, Brer Ab. It don't bother me. It's done got so that now, when I got a pone of bread, and a rasher of bacon, and enough grease for to make gravy, I ain't caring much whether folks sees ghosts or no. End of saying. 
sang fourteen, that deceitful jug. Uncle Remus was in a good mood one evening recently, when he dropped casually into the editorial room of the Constitution, as has been his custom for the past year or two. He had a bag slung across his shoulder, and in the bag was a jug. The presence of this humble but useful vessel in Uncle Remus's bag was made the occasion for several suggestive jokes at his expense by the members of the staff, but the old man's good humor was proof against all insinuations. "'Dat air jug's been to war, man. It's one of these your old-timers. I got dat jug down there in Putman County when Mars Lysha Ferryman was a young man, and now he's done growed up, and got old and died, and his chillins is growed up, and they can count their grandchillins, and yet there's dat jug just as lively and as liable for the kick-up devilment as what she was when she come from the foundry. "'That's the trouble,' said one of the young men. "'That's the reason we'd like to know what's in it now.' now you're getting on marshy ground replied uncle remus that's the point that's what make me say what it does i've been knowing that jug now gwine on sixty-five year and the jug what's more deceitful than that jug ain't on the top side of the world there she sits continued the old man gazing at it reflectively there she sits just as natural as amber type and yet where's the man what can tell what kind of confab she's a gwine to carry on when dat corn cob is snatched out of her mouth dat jug is mighty deceitful man well it doesn't deceive any of us up here remarked the agricultural editor dryly we've seen jugs before i bound you is boss i bound you is but you ain't seen no deceitful jug like dat there she sits a bellyin out and lookin mighty fat and full, and yet she'd set there a bellyin out if there wasn't nothin but water under that stopper. You knows that she ain't got no eggs in her, no no bacon, no no grits, ner no tomatoes, ner no shellets, and that's about all you does know. Dog my cats if the deceitfulness of that jug don't get away with me, continued Uncle Remus with a chuckle. I was comin' cross the bridge just now, and Brer John Henry seed me with the bag slug on to my back, and the jug in it, and he ups and says, says he, "Hey, yo, Brer Remus, ain't it gettin' late for water millions?" <laughs> it was the deceitfulness of that jug. If Brer John Henry knowed the color of dat water million, I spec he'd snatch me up for the conference. I declare to gracious it dat jug ain't a caution. <laughs> "'I suppose it's full of molasses now,' remarked one of the young men, sarcastically. "'Hear dat!' exclaimed Uncle Remus triumphantly. "'Hear dat! What I tell you? I said dat jug was deceitful, and I sticks to it. I been knowing dat—' "'What has it got in it?' broke in someone. "'Molasses, kerosene, or train oil?' "'Well, I lay she's loaded, boss.' I ain't shook her up since I dropped in, but I lay she's loaded. Yes, said the agricultural editor, and it's the meanest bug juice in town, regular sorghum skimmings. That's neither here nor there, responded Uncle Remus. Poor folks better be fixin' up for Christmas now while rations is cheap. That's me. When I hear Miss Sally goin' about the house whistlin', when I can read my titles clear, and when I see the Martins swarmin' after sundown, and when I hear the Peckerwoods confabbin' together these moonshiny nights in my end of town, and I knows the hot wetters are breakin' up, and I knows it's about time for poor folks for to be rasslin' round and huntin' up their rations. That's me up and down. Well, we are satisfied. Better go and hire a hall, remarked the sporting editor with a yawn. If you are engaged in a talking match, you have won the money. Blanket him, somebody, and take him to the stable. And what's more, continued the old man, scorning to notice the insinuation, though I hear Miss Sally whistlin', and de Peckerwoods a-chatterin', 
I ain't seein' none of these yer loafin' niggers fixin' up for to migrate. They can holler Kansas all round the neighborhood, but seppin' a man come long and spell it with greenbacks, he don't ketch none of these yer town niggers. You hear me? They ain't goin'. Stand him up on the table, said the sporting editor. Give him room. "'Better go down here to the calaboose and get some news for the print,' said Uncle Remus, with a touch of irony in his tone. "'Some new nigger might have broke into jail.' "'You say the darkies are not going to emigrate this year?' inquired the agricultural editor, who is interested in these things. "'Shoo! That day ain't. I done seed and I knows. "'Well, how do you know?' "'How you tell when crow gwine to light?' Niggers been promenadin' by my house all this summer, holdin' their heads up high and the whites of their eyeballs shinin' in the sun. They was too biggity for to look over the garden palms. Long bout den the weather was fetchin' the natural spirits of turkentime out of the pine trees, and the ground was fairly smokin' with the hotness. Now that it's gettin' sort of airish in the mornings, they don't peer like the same niggers. They done got so they'll look over in the yard, and next news you know they'll be trying for to scrape up acquaintance with the dog. When they passes now, they looks at the chicken coop and at the tater patch. When you see niggers getting dat familiar, you can depend on their camping with you to balance the season. Day fore yesterday, I caught one of em looking over my fence at my shoats, and I says, says I, does you want to purchase dem hogs? Oh, no, says he. I was looking at the points. Well, they ain't pointing your way, says I, and furthermore, if you don't bother longer dem hogs, they ain't going to climb out of that pen and attack you, neither, says I. And I bound, continued Uncle Remus, driving the corn cob stopper a little tighter in his deceitful jug and gathering up his bag. And I bound it, my old musket'll go off tween me and dat same nigger yet, and he'll be at the bad end, and dis deceitful jug will fuse for to go to the funeral. End of saying. Saying fifteen, the Florida watermelon. Look here, boy," said Uncle Remus yesterday, stopping near the railroad crossing on Whitehall Street and gazing ferociously at a small colored youth. Look here, boy, I'll lay you out flat if you come flinging your watermillion rhymes under my foot. You watch if I don't. You can play your pranks on these here white folks, but when you come a cutting up your capers round me, you'll land right in the middle of a spell of sickness. Now you mind what I tell you, and I ain't gwine for to put up with none of your sassiness neither, let alone flinging watermillion rhymes where I can get mixed up with em. I done had enough water millions yesterday and the day before. How was that, Uncle Remus? asked a gentleman standing near. It was sort of like this, boss. Last Tuesday, Mars John, he fotch home two of these yer Florida water millions, and him and Miss Sally sought down for to eat em. Mars John and Miss Sally ain't got nothin' that's too good for me, and the first news I knowed Miss Sally was a hollerin' for Remus. I done smelt the water million on de air, but I ain't got no better sense than for to go when I years white folks a hollerin. I learnt dat when I wa'n't so high. Leastways, I galloped up to the back porch, and there sot the water millions just as natural as if they'd been raised on de old spivey place in Putman County. Then Miss Sally, she cut me off a slash, one of these yer ungodly slashes big as your hat, and I sot down on the steps and wrapped myself round the whole blessed chunk, except in the rhyme. Uncle Remus paused and laid his hand upon his stomach as if feeling for something. "'Well, old man, what then?' "'That's what I'm a-gittin' at, boss,' said Uncle Remus, smiling a feeble smile. I sauntered round about a half-hour, and then I began for to feel sort of squeamish. Sort of like I done been and swallowed about four pounds off of the rough end of the scantlin. Looked like to me that I was going to be sick, and then it looked like I wasn't. By and by, 
a little pain showed his head, and sort of meandered round like he was a looking for a good place for to catch holt. And then a great big pain jump up and take after the little one, and chase him round and round, and he must catch him, cause by and by the big pain retched down and grabbed his left leg, and haul him up, and then he retched down and grabbed the other one and pull him up, and then the wall begun, show sure enough. For mighty nigh near four hours they kept up that racket, and just as soon as little pain had jump up, the big one would light on to it and gobble it up, and then the big one would go sailing round hunting for more. <sighs> Some folks is mighty curious, though. Next morning I hear Miss Sally a laughing and singing and a whistling, just like there wa not no water means raised in Florida. But somebody had better pen this year nigger boy up when I'm on the town, I can tell you dat. End of saying. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Volume 4. His Sayings. Saying number 16. Uncle Remus preaches to a convert. They tells me you done joined the church, said Uncle Remus to Pegleg Charlie. Yes, yeah, sir, responded Charlie, gravely. That's so. Well, I'm mighty glad of that, remarked Uncle Remus with unction. It bout time that I was spectin' for to hear you in the chain gang, and stood of that hits the church. Well, they ain't no tellin' these days where a nigger's gwine to land. Yes, responded Charlie, straightening himself up and speaking in a dignified tone. Yes, I'm fixin' to do better. I'm preparin' for to shake worldliness. I'm done quit sociatin' with these white town boys. They've been a goin' back on me too rapidly here lately, and now I am a goin' back on them. Well, if you done had the experience of it, I'm mighty glad. If you got religion, you better hold on to it till the last day in the mornin'. It's mighty good for to carry round with you in the daytime and likewise in the night time. It'll pay you more than politics, and if you stands up like you oughter, it'll last longer than a bone fellum. But you want to have one of these year old time grips, and you just gotta shut your eyes and swing on like one of these year bull terrier dogs. Oh, I'm going to stick, Uncle Remus. You can put your money on that. These town boys. Can't play no more of their games on me. I'm fixed. Can't you lend me a dime, Uncle Remus, to buy me a pie? I'm dat hungry dat my stomach is getting ready to go in moanin'. Uncle Remus eyed Charlie curiously a moment, while the latter looked quietly at his timber toe. Finally, the old man sighed and spoke. How long has you been in the church, son? Mighty near a week, replied Charlie. Well, let me tell you this now, before you go any further. You ain't been in there long enough for to go round taking up contributions. Wait until you get sort of season-like, and then I'll hunt round in my clothes and see if I can't run out a thrip or two for you. But don't you levy taxes too early. Charlie laughed, and said he would let the old man off, if he would treat to a watermelon. End of saying. Saying 17. As to Education As Uncle Remus came up Whitehall Street recently, he met a little colored boy carrying a slate and a number of books. Some words passed between them, but their exact purport will probably never be known. They were unpleasant for the attention of a wandering policeman was called to the matter by hearing the old man bawl out, "'Don't you come foolin' longer me, nigger. You are flippin' the sass at the wrong color. 
You can go round here and sass these white people, and maybe they'll stand it, but when you come a-slingin' your jaw at a man that was gray when the farmin' days get out, you better go and get your hide greased. What's the matter, old man? asked a sympathizing policeman. Nothing, boss, exceptin' I ain't going to have no nigger chillin' a hoopin' and a hollerin' at me when I'm goin' along the streets. Oh, well, school children, you know how they are. That's what make I say what I does. They better be home pickin' up chips. What a nigger gwine to learn out of books? I can take a barrel stave and fling more sense into a nigger in one minute than all the schoolhouses twixt this and the state of Michigan. Don't talk, honey. With one barrel stave I can fairly lift the veil of ignorance. Then you don't believe in education? It's the ruination of this country. Look at my gal. The old woman sauntered to school last year, and now we dasn't hardly ax her for to carry the washin' home. She done gone beyond her business. I ain't learnt nothin' in books, and yet I can count all the money I gets. No use talkin', boss. Put a spellin' book in a nigger's hands, and right then and there you loses a plow hand. I done had the experience of it. End of saying. Saying number 18. A Temperance Reformer. Here come Uncle Remus, said a well-dressed negro, who was standing on the sidewalk near James's bank recently, talking to a crowd of barbers. Here come Uncle Remus. I bound he'll sign it. You'll fling your money away if you bet on it, responded Uncle Remus. I ain't turning nothing loose on church scriptions. I wants money right now for to get a pint of meal. Tain't that. And I ain't helping for to bury nobody. Much as I can do for to keep the breath in my own body. Tain't that, neither. And I ain't put my hand to no recommends. I'm feared for to say a polite word about myself, and I just know I ain't going round flattering up these other niggers. And tain't that responded the darky, who held a paper in his hand. We are getting up a good temperance lodge, and we like to get your name. Eh, eh, honey, I done seen too much of this nigger temperance. They stand up mighty square until their dues commence to cramp em, and they don't stand a racket worth a done. No longer than yesterday I seed one of the head men of these here temperance societies Totin' water for a bar room. He had the water in the bucket, but they ain't tellin' how much red liquor he was a totin'. Go long, child. Join your society and be good to yourself. I'm a gettin' too old. Give me three or four drams endurin' the day, and I'm mighty nigh as good a temperance man as the next un. I got to scuffle for something to eat. End of saying. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Uncle Remus by Joel Chandler Harris. Volume 4 His Sayings. Saying number 19. As a Weather Prophet. Uncle Remus was enlightening a crowd of negroes at the car shed yesterday. "'There ain't nothin,' said the old man, shaking his head pensively, "'that ain't got no change wrote on it. There ain't nothin that ain't spotted before it begins for the commence. We all experiences that providence what lifts us up from one place and sets us down in the other. It's continually a movin' and a movin'. "'That's so. You're talking now,' came from several of his hearers. "'I hear Miss Sally reading this morning,' continued the old man, "'that a man was coming down here for to take care of the weather. One of these here bureau men's which goes around a putting up and pulling down.' "'What he gwine do round here?' asked one. "'He's a gwine to regulate the weather. 
replied Uncle Remus sententiously. He's a gwine to fix it up so that there won't be so much worriment among the white folks about the kind of weather what falls to their lot. He's gwine dish em up, suggested one of the older ones, like man dish out sugar. No, answered Uncle Remus, mopping his benign features with a very large and very red bandana. He's gwine to fix em better than dat. He's gwine to fix em up so you can have any kind of wedded what you want without toting her home. How's dat? asked someone. It's a dis way, said the old man thoughtfully. In course you knows what kind of weather you want. Well then, when the man comes along, which Miss Sally say he will, you just got to go up dar, pick out your weather, and there'll be a clock set for to suit your case. And when you get home, there'll be your weather a settin' out in the yard waitin' for you. I wish you was here now, the old man continued. I'd take a pair of frosts in mine, if I cotch cold for it. That's me. There were various exclamations of assent, and the old man went on his way singing, Don't you grieve out of me. End of saying. Saying number 20. The Old Man's Troubles. What makes you look so lonesome, Br'er Remus? asked a well-dressed negro as the old man came shuffling down the street by james's corner yesterday you are mighty right i am lonesome brer john henry when an old nigger like me has got to paddle a canoe and do the fishin at the same time and when you bleeds to catch the fish and dasn't turn the paddle loose for to bait the hook then i tell you brer john you are right where the mink had the goslin Mars John and Miss Sally, they done been gone down under Putman County for to see their kinfolks mighty nigh four days, and you better believe I done been had to scratch round mighty lively for to make the rations run out even. I was at your house last night, Br'er Remus, remarked Br'er John Henry, but I couldn't rouse you out of bed. It was the unseasonableness of the hour, I expect, said Uncle Remus dryly. Pears unto me that you all church deacons settin up mighty late these cold nights. You be slippin round after hours some time or another, and you'll slip bodaciously into the calaboose. You mind what I tell you. It's mighty cold weather, said Br'er John Henry, evidently wishing to change the subject. Coal! exclaimed Uncle Remus. It got past coal on the quarter stretch. You ought to come to my house night fall last. Then you'd have found me live and kicking. How's that? Well, I tell you, Br'er John Henry, the coal was so coal, and the kiver was so light, that I thunk I'd make a raid on Mars John's shingle pile, and out I goes and totes in a whole armful. Then I gets under the cover and tells my old woman for to lay em on to me like she was roofing a house. By and by she crawls in, and the shingles what she put on her side for the cover weird, they all drap off on the floor. Then I gets up and piles em on again, and when I gets in bed, my shingles drap off, and that's the way it was the whole blessed night. First it was me up, and then the old woman and it just kept us powerful warm too that kind of exercise <laughs> oh you ought to drop round about that time brer john henry you'd a yeard show enough cussin you don't tell me brer remus my old woman say the old boy wouldn't have found a riper nigger if he were to scour the country from virginia to alabama and a saying saying number twenty one the fourth of july uncle remus made his appearance recently with his right arm in a sling and his head bandaged to that extent that it looked like the stick made to accompany the centennial bass drum the old man evidently expected an attack all around for he was unusually quiet and fumbled in his pockets in an embarrassed manner he was not mistaken the agricultural editor was the first to open fire 
"'Well, you old villain, what have you been up to now?' "'It is really singular,' remarked a commencement orator, "'that not even an ordinary holiday, a holiday, it seems to me, that ought to arouse all the latent instincts of patriotism in the bosom of American citizens, can occur without embroiling some of our most valuable citizens. It is really singular, to me, that such a day should be devoted by a certain class of our population to broils and fisticuffs." This fine moral sentiment, which was altogether an impromptu utterance, and which was delivered with the air of one who addresses a vast but invisible audience of young ladies in white dresses and blue sashes, seemed to add to the embarrassment of Uncle Remus, and at the same time to make an explanation necessary. "'There ain't none of you young white men never had no occasion for to strike up with one of these yer mobile niggers,' asked Uncle Remus. "'Cause if you is, then you knows whereabouts the devilment come in. "'Show me a mobile nigger,' continued the old man. And I'll show you a nigger that's marked for the chain gang. It may be the fourth or the fifth of July, or it may be the twelfth of January. But when a mobile nigger gets in my neighborhood, right then and there trouble sails in and engages boat for the season. I expect I'm as fond of these United States as the next man what knows that the borough is busted up. But long as Remus can stand on his hind legs, no mobile nigger can't flip into this town longer no West Point inspection and boss round among the colored folks. That's me up and down, and I bound there's a nigger somewheres on the road this blessed day that's got this put away in his amendments. How did he happen to get you down and maul you in this startling manner? asked the commencement orator, with a tone of exaggerated sympathy in his voice. "'Maul who?' exclaimed Uncle Remus indignantly. "'Maul who? Boss, the nigger that mauled me ain't boned yet, and they a got to have another war for one is boned.' "'Well, what was the trouble?' "'It was sort of this way, boss. I was standing down there by Mars John Jeems's bank.' chat with sis tempy which i ain't seed her before now goin on seven year and watchin the folks trompin by when one of these yer slick lookin niggers with a bee gum hat and a brass watch as big as a head of a beer barrel come along and brush up agin me just like so there was two of em and they went long gigglin and laughin like a nestle of yellow hammers by and by they come along again, and the smart aleck brush up by me once more. Then I say to myself, I lay I fetch you if you give me another invite. And sure enough, here it come again, and this time he rub a piece of watermelon rhyme under my left ear. What did you do? Me? I'm a mighty long suffering nigger, but he had no more and touch me. For I flung these yer bones in his face. Here Uncle Remus held up his damaged hand triumphantly. I sort of sprained my hand, boss, but dog my cats if I don't believe I spattered the nigger's eyeballs on the ground, and when he riz, his countenance looked fresh like beef hazlet. I look mighty spindlin' and puny now, don't I, boss? inquired the old man with great apparent earnestness. Rather. Well, you just ought to see me get my African up. They used to call me a bad nigger long for the war, and it looks liker to me that I gets worse and worse. Rare John Henry say that I ought to subdue my rashfulness, and I don't dispute it. But turn a mobile nigger loose in this town, fourth of July or no fourth of July, and me and him, one is going to land in jail. It's pruned into me. And that's the last of the sayings in Uncle Remus. End of book.